This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. Members, the first item of business is a motion to affirm a statutory rule, and I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That the rates, regional rates order Northern Ireland 2021 be affirmed. I call the Minister of Finance to move the motion. To move, can call it. Thank you. And the, min- the business committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call the minister to open the debate on the motion. Minister. Uh, the, this annual order is brought about following the Executive's agreement to the 2021-22 Budget, which I outlined to the Assembly in my statement on the 27th of April. Today's order sets the two separate regional rates in the pound figures for 2021-22. One applies to households and the other applies to businesses. In setting the rates, the Executive has to consider the impact on business and household finances and the impact on the level of revenue raised for public services. For the second year in a row, rates are being set in the shadow of COVID-19. The pandemic has had a devastating impact on the economy and on cash flow of businesses. The relatively high level of commercial rates was already a key concern for businesses, many of which are very small and locally managed. That is why last year I provided all business rate payers with an 18% reduction in the non-domestic regional rate. This order keeps that reduction in place for another year. The capacity of many companies to pay rates has been further undermined by the pandemic. COVID created the prospect risk of widespread business closures and, with that, loss of jobs. Last year, I therefore provided the sectors hardest hit by the pandemic with a rates holiday. I have allocated £230 million this year to continue that rates holiday for another year. These measures will help sustain businesses and the jobs they provide. Likewise, the freeze in domestic poundage for the second year in a row will be vital to household ratepayers. We already have relatively low domestic charges, and by maintaining that low charge, we will help household budgets. I have decided again to, de- to again delay the issuing of rate bills to give ratepayers a two-month break in payments. 
This will help many ratepayers whose incomes are still being affected by the effects of the pandemic. Taken together, the domestic and non-domestic regional rates set by today's order account for approximately £690 million to the executive. That is before the effect of the rates holiday is taken into account. This revenue supplements the executive's block grant and facilitates more expenditure on our health service, on roads, schools, infrastructure and other essential public services. The regional rate represents just over a half of a typical rate bill, with the other half made up of the district rates that are set independently by local councils. In total, the rating system is designed to contribute over £1.3 billion to executive and district council funding. My department has also introduced measures to allow more time for councils to set their 2021-22 rates and to allow greater local flexibility to councils in rate setting. It is welcome that councils adopted a similar approach to the executive, keeping their district rates low as, possible, as low as possible, given the need to shelter both homes and businesses from the economic impact of the pandemic. Turning to technical matters, Concorda, the main purpose of the order is to give effect to the poundage decisions already made during the executive's budget process by specifying the regional rate poundage for the 2021-22. Article 1 sets out the title of the order and gives the operational date as the day after it is affirmed by the Assembly. Article 2 provides that the order will apply for the 2021-22 rating year through to the 31st of March 2022. Article 3 specifies 27.9p in the pound as the non-domestic regional poundage to be levied on rateable net annual values and 0.4574p in the pound as the domestic regional rate poundage to be levied on rateable capital values. I look forward to hearing the members' comments and I commend the order to the Assembly. Thank you. And I call the chairperson of the Committee for Finance, Steve Egan, and let me take this opportunity, given your announcement at the weekend, to wish you and your family the very best in the time ahead. Mr. Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for making his uh, remarks as he came through. I can assure this House that I will not be retiring from politics. And despite my sort of sunny demeanour today, I will fully enjoy uh, continuing to sort of hold ministers and the system to account. So, on that point, Minister, may I say that the committee uh, considered the rates, regional rates order at Northern Ireland 2021, and we agree and concur that to be able to provide the necessary stimulus for the Northern Ireland economy to come out, it is very important that we maintain this uh, part of rates holiday and to allow this to happen as well. And freezing the rates as we have done, I think, is also appropriate because we do need to send a strong message across the entirety of Northern Ireland about coming out of COVID and how we are going to manage to do this as well. So, therefore, may I say on behalf of the committee that we are supportive of this order. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Melissa McHugh. Mr. Margaret Concorla, August Bui has fostered this narrative, and Jan Ratchis, August, uh, thanks to our minister as well for his statement. Uh, again, I'd like to support uh, the minister's statement. Um, this is a, an instrument at his disposal uh, in many respects to help to stimulate uh, the economy. Uh, here in the north of Ireland. And, and we all know only too well just how it is it, uh, both in terms of business and in terms of uh, the, uh, the actual householders and that as well, too, how people have actually suffered uh, over this period uh, of the pandemic. Uh, that for some it has been very, very difficult, and I think in particular about the furloughed workers and that as well, too, uh, that were uh, like self employed, they have had great difficulty maybe in meeting bills and maybe and something as basic as putting meat on the table. Uh, and this rates relief, uh, in many respects, is such a help to them, such a help to actually stimulate uh, the local economy and that where it can hopefully encourage uh, all of us, uh, we'll say, to uh, respond to the initiative taken by the minister and other initiatives as well taken by the executive that will be coming to four, we'll say, later on in the year in terms of uh, the voucher scheme and so on, and uh, the, sure, the the start, sorry, the the actual name of the scheme, the the, the job start scheme, uh, that will be there to complement uh, this decision by the minister that will allow uh, the economy once again to sort of emerge from the depressed state that has found itself in, in a sense, and that uh, we look forward to, to, uh, to, to all of that improving in every respect. So once again, Minister Gormila Mahogat, Fahinya de Rajas, and again to the Minister, thank him very much for his statement. Thank you, Gormila And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank 
you, Mr. Speaker. Um, before I begin, um, can I uh, offer my own best wishes and my party's best wishes to the Chairman of the Finance Committee, my, my colleague on there, and, and his family as he um, proceeds, hopefully not to a completely quieter life. Um, he'll have more time to focus on all the important issues we're, we're um, debating in the committee. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, the regional rates order um, uh, that we are approving, and obviously support, my party supports it for 2021-22, uh, is exactly the same as the one that we approved for last year. And I, I do just want to make a couple of remarks on it today because I think it's important, given um, where we are with our economy coming out of COVID, but how important this is um, in terms of our fiscal position going forward. As the Minister said, the poundage levels for both domestic and non-domestic rates are unchanged um, uh, because, as the Finance Minister said, we've chosen uh, to freeze them for a further year running. Um, we agree that this is the right policy response, given the severity of the economic conditions we have faced. Uh, as well as continuing to freeze the rates, the Finance Minister has uh, prolonged a full rates holiday for businesses in a range of sectors most acutely, acutely affected uh, by COVID-19. Obviously, that particularly um, uh, has included the hospitality and tourism sector, um, Ulster University, uh, the Economic Policy Centre there, who have advised the Minister um, have advised that revenues have fallen uh, in the past year by more than three quarters. So that totally unprecedented unprecedented collapse in income uh, it came as, as, a result, as a result of us imposing draconian restrictions, and that is why, in a sense, this rates holiday was an essential. The rates holiday that we are enacting today and the one that we have had over the past year uh, were a completely understandable and justifiable and welcome intervention to deal with that. Um, uh, um, uh, and we hope uh, uh, those easing of restrictions and our um, economy emerging from that continues. Um, but even as the economy uh, returns and all economic forecasters predict growth in 2021, we do not know exactly how that recovery will map out across our economy. Uh, nor do we know, Mr. Speaker, how many jobs will be permanently lost when the furlough scheme uh, uh, is fully wound up later this year. Uh, the most recent data. Uh, published by the UK government shows that there were just under 100,000 uh, workers on furlough in Northern Ireland at the end of, the, of March. Obviously, thankfully, that number will have uh, changed a bit since um, the economy has reopened. But even as the economy reopens, Mr. Speaker, we do not know precisely how many jobs will have been permanently lost and how many businesses will sadly fail, and I am afraid some will fail. Nor do we yet know the longer-term structural shifts that may be taking place in economic activity following the pandemic. And that's not just here, that's around the world. We know, we expect, in fact, we know that fewer office workers will need to be at their desks Monday to Friday from nine to five. But we don't yet know uh, exactly how many fewer uh, people will be uh, there. Or critically, we don't know uh, what the knock-on impact on city centres, which currently uh, will rely on office footfall uh, to sustain retail and hospitality during the working week will be. We do not know any of these things, but we do know that we will still rely on the regional rate as a significant source of revenue for public services here. The Minister said it was um, uh, 1.2 billion, I believe, is the total amount of revenue from rates, and that is across the executive and local government. Uh, from reading the, the budget, it forecasts just under 600 million in revenue uh, from rates income this year, but obviously that is being largely offset by the 230 million uh, that is being spent um, in offering a holiday. It is um, Mr. Speaker, the only major source of revenue at our, when you add together non-domestic and domestic, regional and district rates, it is the only major source of revenue uh, that is devolved uh, to these institutions. As I said, this year forecasts income uh, of just under 800 million. But in actual fact, um, because of the that's from the regional rate, but in actual fact, a little over half of that sum will be raised due to the holiday being extended by the finance minister, and that is a, a holiday that we. Uh, agree with. Um, but, and I say this in as in genuinely and sincerely across, as cross-party way as possible, we are going to have to face up to the, the difficult truth that as we approach fiscal year 22-23, having foregone about 40 per cent or thereabouts, the Minister can correct me if he thinks that number is wrong, of our regional rates income for two full years, there must be some level of risk attached to that revenue from 2022 onwards. Just to be clear, Mr Speaker, over the last two years, in a way that was necessary and essential, and we all agree with, and I'm not in any way casting aspersions on the policy, we have effectively foregone uh, about 40 per cent of the regional rates strand of income, which is one of the main areas, uh, one of the very few areas where we can actually derive an income uh, as an executive. That means we're going to have to think hard uh, about what happens next year. And given we will all, I'm afraid, next year, uh, depending on, um, uh, on, on politics, but we all, uh, if, um, if, if things are, are um, 
uh, goes go to plan, we will be just a few weeks away from a probable election this time next year when the next regional rates order uh, comes. So, not casting aspersions on any of us as politicians, but that those will be tough decisions for politicians of all parties to have to make uh, in, the, in the mouth of an election. And, Mr. Speaker, this is before you add in the fact that the full impact of the Reval 2020 exercise has not yet been experienced by most businesses uh, as a result of the holidays and freezes of the past two years. Uh, and the broad uncertainty facing all tax systems everywhere in the ve- developed world based on commercial property valuation is because, as of right now, we simply do not know what the medium and long term impact of COVID 19 on commercial property values will be. We just do not know how. Fully, so we, we just don't know how uh, completely uh, transformational COVID will be in terms of the way we work, shop, and socialise. All of this is to say, uh, and genuinely say in a sincere cross-party way, that it is urgent that either or both the Fiscal Council or Fiscal Commission, being currently set up by the Minister, take a long, hard look at the operation of um, uh, of our rates system and as they're doing that as part of our broader um, uh, as part of our broader fiscal position uh, as as I and my party have said before it needs to be part of a broader look at our economic performance in conjunction with our fiscal challenges we've had a lot of debate about uh, the fact that a disproportionate amount of the small strand of income that we are able to generate here comes from um, uh, non domestic rates it's really important uh, that as we go forward and as we look at our fiscal options and we look at our economy, that we make sure that it is not operating as a, um, in effect, a, in, a, in an anachronistic way, given the transformation we know we are going to face in terms of how we work, shop and socialise. And given the state of our public services, especially the health service, and, as I have said, the highly limited fiscal tools available to us, we simply cannot drift into this time next year without an urgent and fundamental look at our regional rates model. We cannot afford uh, to risk uh, half a billion pounds, and that's of regional rates income, uh, as the minister said. In terms of regional and district rates, that's over a billion pounds of income for public services, um, because we can't face confronting these challenges, and they are difficult challenges. So, in supporting today's regional rates order, I simply set out uh, that we should all be cognisant of the very profound issues that we are going to face as we come out of COVID uh, and deal with um, unwinding some of these freezes and holidays that we've been all rightly supportive of over the last 15 months. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Pat Cadney. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome the fact that there is a zero increase in the regional rate for another year. The economic uncertainty that has been caused by the pandemic uh, may have had some light at the end of the tunnel. We have seen footage across the news of long queues for businesses. Uh, that have been able to reopen, and it is something that has to be welcomed as long as people remain s- safe as they possibly can. As a former business owner, I can empathise with the feelings of uncertainty, of pain, and of fear that has been felt by most of our business community. Throughout the pandemic, and it is right that we should do all we can to support them, Mr. Speaker, in this time of need. I want to thank the Minister and all the officials at work in place within the Department to achieve a zero rate increase. I know the Minister and the Department suggested that the councils make the same decision, and I know some have. I do think clear advice, support and direction was needed to help the councils achieve this zero rate rise. Coming out of this pandemic and out of this unprecedented time of economic turmoil gives us an opportunity to look at how we tax our businesses. Business taxation must be so in a way that supports business owners to be employers, particularly as we have seen the full scale of job losses that are being masked by the furlough scheme. It must not inhibit entrepreneurial ventures and must support those that take a chance, that put their resources into their dream of owning their own business and play such an important and active role in our economy. We have had issues with our economy long before the pandemic or even Brexit. We had to boost our historically low productivity and move away from the low-skilled and low-paying jobs to actually give our citizens a brighter future and brighter prospects at home. Rates and taxation are only one part of the equation, but it is an important area that we do not get right this time. It can hinder what we do in other areas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Andrew Muir. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll be brief in my comments, um, reflecting the custom and practice around this in previous years. And first of all, I would like to echo the comments in relation to Steve Aiken. I wish him best wishes in the future. He'll not be going far, but uh, just wish him best wishes. Um, the Lions Party welcomes this, uh, welcomes the action that's been taken thus far in terms of uh, freezing the regional rate and also the reliefs that have been offered to certain sectors um, and also in the last financial year for the first four months. But as Matthew Tula has outlined, we do face real issues in relation to our um, rating system in Northern Ireland, and we face a real cliff edge at the end of this financial year, moving into 22-23. And as part of that, it really does desperately need an independent review of our rating system, particularly the non-domestic rating system, which is a particular concern. I know that there was a review undertaken by LPS, but there needs to be an independent review, similar to that was conducted in Scotland, to, to in order to to get that um, authority and that respect from the business community and to reflect the issues from, that I have picked up from traders who are now able to reopen thanks to the relaxation of the restrictions, who find it very tough to swallow to see online uh, retailers um, operating from sometimes much smaller premises, uh, paying in proportion to themselves less rates, uh, but yet them on the high street facing significant bills potentially from the next financial year and wanting to see a more fair and equitable playing field to ensure that they can succeed and they can grow as businesses. So we do need that independent review of the non-domestic rating system. That is desperately required. And if we don't get it, what we're going to have is going to have a broken system continuing and some of the changes recommended by LPS potentially enacted, but not attracting that level of respect. We had Reval 2020 last year, and when this place came back in January, that was a big focus. And that dissipated because of the reliefs that were put in place, um, and uh, as continues not to be on the, on the agenda. But can I tell you that if we don't have that review of the rating system, and we go back to the full system from the next financial year, we are going to have serious issues. Hospitality businesses were crying out in relation to the impact of Reval 2020, and to hit them with the impact of that, just as they are trying to get back on their feet in the next financial year, would be wrong. So I would urge the Minister to consider that. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call the Minister of Finance, Conor Murphy, to conclude and wind up the debate on this motion. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I want to thank all the members uh, today who have contributed to the debate. As I have stated, today is 2020-21. Uh, regional rates order gives effect to the decisions that were made as part of the Executive's 21-22 budget, and the wider detail of which was presented to the Assembly on the 27th of April. The Executive's aim continues to be to strike the correct balance between meeting the needs of ratepayers during what will be a challenging long-term economic environment and ensuring that public finances are sufficient to cover the priorities that we have set ourselves uh, beyond the pandemic. And a, a number of members correctly have, uh, in their contributions, uh, highlighted that the economic challenges as opposed to the, the revenue that we need uh, to raise uh, in order to support public services, and that is a balance at any time, but particularly in an uncertain time between the twin effects of Brexit and the pandemic, uh, then those things need to be very, very carefully considered uh, with the information that we have available to us. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the members raised that uh, issue in particular, the, uh, and I think that the Fiscal Commission in, indeed will uh, be very useful this year uh, uh, in particular. Uh, I am sure we could have done with one many years back, uh, as Scotland and Wales have done, but certainly this year with the, those challenges of that support, trying to use what limited resources we have to support business and jobs. Uh, it is not just about business people, it is about the jobs that uh, are created and the families that rely on those businesses, uh, and, and the, the need to try and supplement as best we can uh, public services, which have already been uh, suffering from eight or nine years of, of Tory austerity policy. So I think the Fiscal Commission, indeed, uh, in looking at, uh, at the overall finances and the Fiscal Council itself examining uh, that, that public spend will be very important in the year ahead. Uh, 
the, the, uh, Andrew Moore, uh, he's left now, but he raised the issue of, of the review. Of course, the review, the review isn't conducted by LPS on their own. Uh, it's conducted in, in consultation with all of the business organisations, and I know uh, there were a, a whole range of matters raised which were, uh, were taken on board in terms of the previous review. Uh, there is, as he has said, a, a revaluation exercise and a, a commitment to do those on a more frequent basis, because I think what the difficulties that business experience is when there's such a gap between them, then that the revaluation itself can be uh, quite dramatic. Uh, so the more frequent that revaluation takes place, then the less of, of uh, a, a shift, I suppose, there is in terms of what uh, certain businesses are paying. He has raised the issue for it, as have others, about online. Uh, and of course, there, there is, uh, particularly as I said during the pandemic, when people uh, and retail was closed down, uh, online became more popular. But rates can, only, the, the rates can only take place and can only assess a property on the basis of the size of the property. They can't assess it on the basis of what business it does. So, and actually, the issue that he raises would be a taxation issue. So, if the government in London decide to place more tax on online businesses, then in order to try and create some balance between what high street uh, retailers uh, are being paid in, in terms of property tax, then that's something else. But rates uh, and these issues of, 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 uh, that we're debating today can only really take into account the physical size of a property uh, and apply a tax according to that size. Uh, of course, there are reliefs uh, built in there as well, but uh, I think the issue that he raises is definitely an issue for taxation, and it's something uh, that I think we will continue to talk to Treasury about. So, in conclusion, last concord, I, I trust the members will show the necessary support for the order. I would like to particularly thank the committee chair, and uh, as with others, wish him well on whatever lies ahead for him, uh, and the committee itself. Uh, and the staff in the committee for their work on the order, and I look forward to working with them on the wider rating issues over the remainder of this mandate. Cor Mavis. Thank you. And uh, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the rates, regional rates order NI 2021 be affirmed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't be no. The ayes have it, and the ayes from, there are ayes from all sides of the House, and there are no dissenting voices. I am satisfied that cross-community support has been demonstrated. The motion is agreed. Members, moving on to the next item on the order paper is the second. St Sorry, uh, maybe just need to take a raise for a moment or two. Members, the next item on the order paper is the second stage of the Climate Change Bill. And I call Claire Bailey to move the second stage of the bill. 
Thank you, Speaker. Um, and I beg to move that the second stage of the Climate Change Bill Northern Ireland 2021 be agreed. The second stage of the Climate Change Bill has been moved. The Business Committee has not allocated any time limits on that debate. I, I call on Ms Bailey to open the debate on the bill. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. And just before I begin, I would also like to take this opportunity to wish good luck to Mr Aiken. Um, I'm delighted that he's remaining as an MLA because he's always a very positive person to work with. So I wish you well. Mr Speaker, this bill sets a framework for climate change adaptation and mitigation in Northern Ireland. Since 2008, climate change legislation has been slowly but steadily emerging around the world. While we no longer have the opportunity to be global leaders in bringing forward this legislation, our hope is that this bill will serve to finally enable Northern Ireland to play its part in tackling the biggest issue of our time, climate breakdown. Scientific consensus is that climate change is real, it is a global issue, and it requires a global to local response. The work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is probably the largest and most rigorous examination of a scientific issue in the history of the world. The most recent IPCC report concluded that continued emissions of greenhouse gases will increase the likelihood of severe, pervasive and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems. These impacts include irreparably degrading our natural environment, driving species to extinction, worsening chronic and contagious disease, worsening food and water shortages, increasing the risk of pandemics and aggravating mass displacement. The UN estimates that there could be anywhere between 25 million and 1 billion environmental migrants by 2050. Northern Ireland needs strong climate legislation to ensure that we do our part to tackle the global, social and ecological crises that are inherent to climate breakdown. As global citizens and citizens of a developed country, as politicians and as the generation responsible for leaving behind a livable world for our children and young people, we have a responsibility to act. We cannot continue to lag behind and let others do the hard work for us. Certainly. Reference to what the, the UN has been saying. What does she say to the fact that in 1982, almost 40 years ago, the executive director of the UN Environment Programme said this, by the turn of the century, an environmental catastrophe will witness devastation as complete, as irreversible as any nuclear holocaust. They were wrong then. Why should we believe they are right now? Thank the member for his intervention. Um, and I certainly wouldn't be a climate denier or a climate sceptic and will act on all the work coming from international bodies and work from states uh, um, across the world in trying to, to deal with this. So predictions, uh, um, you know, if you even notice in Northern Ireland, we are seeing the impacts, particularly in our weather patterns, and I don't think that any of that should be ignored. But this legislation is long overdue, and Northern Ireland remains the only part of the UK and Ireland with no legally binding greenhouse gas reduction targets. We know that Northern Ireland has an unfortunate track record of poor performance on climate. Our emissions are not falling anywhere near the same rate as the rest of the UK, 20% here compared to the UK average of 43%. We have actually increased our share of total UK emissions. The role of climate legislation in driving down greenhouse gas emissions cannot be understated. The commitment to introducing the Climate Change Act for Northern Ireland was a cornerstone of the New Decade New Approach Agreement. NDNA stated that the Executive will introduce legislation and targets for reducing carbon emissions in line with the Paris Climate Change Accord. The Executive should bring forward a Climate Change Act to give environmental targets a strong legal underpinning. 
In February 2020, this Assembly voted to declare a climate emergency and called on the Executive to fulfil the climate action and environmental commitments set out in NDNA. In July 2020, this Assembly again passed a motion calling for the urgent introduction of a Climate Change Act for Northern Ireland within three months. In response to the July motion, the Minister made it clear that he had no intention of bringing forward urgent climate change legislation and the time frame was impossible to achieve and we were ridiculous to ask for it. It was in this context of persistent ministerial inaction that a private member's bill became the only option for bringing climate change legislation before the Assembly before the end of the current political mandate. Time is no longer on our side. We need to move far and we need to move fast. Climate mitigation will impact all aspects of people's lives. The key components of a just transition are citizen participation and democratic decision making. Partnership and participation are inherent to this bill. It was co-developed by a partnership of civil society, legal and scientific academic experts and MLAs. It originates from the Climate Coalition Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland's largest collaborative body on climate action, which has a collective membership of 390,000 people. This bill Sorry, this will continue to be a collaborative process as this bill makes its way through the various legislative stages to become law. It must be a collaborative one. I look forward to taking sectoral evidence through the ERA committee and to work with the committee, MLAs, political parties, stakeholders and civic society to strengthen and advance this bill. Before turning to the detail of the bill, it may be helpful to briefly set out what the bill does and does not do and the rationale for that. This is primary legislation, so it is not prescriptive. It is a framework bill setting out the legislative basis upon which to build future climate policy. It does not assign sectoral specific targets, nor does it dictate departmental policy. What the bill does do is set out a sustainable pathway to decarbonisation for Northern Ireland, ensuring transparency and democratic oversight at every stage, and guaranteeing independent monitoring so that this democratic oversight can be effective. The bill is divided into three parts and is made up of 17 clauses with two schedules. In broad terms, the, the bill does the following. Firstly, it declares a climate emergency as the basis for government action to halt human-induced global warming. Secondly, it mandates the executive within three years of royal assent to prepare five yearly climate action plans containing annual targets, carbon budgets, nitrogen budgets and sectoral plans. Thirdly, the bill establishes the position of the Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner and the Northern Ireland Climate Office as a means to independently oversee the implementation of the bill and to review its working, making recommendations as required to achieve the overriding climate objective. And lastly, this bill guarantees non-regression in Northern Ireland law for, from existing climate and environmental protections contained in EU law as it applied before the end of the Brexit transition period. This is, of course, already provided for in the Withdrawal Act. The bill is broadly broken down as follows. Clause 1 provides for the declaration of a climate emergency from the date of royal assent. In declaring a climate emergency, we acknowledge that climate change exists and that the measures taken up to this point have not been enough to address it. We recognise the role the governments have to play in introducing measures that will halt climate change. The state of, clim of the climate emergency will outlive successive Assembly terms. Its annulment requires Assembly approval and must be on the basis of verifiable proof from a relevant body, the global temperature threshold defined in the Paris Agreement or any subsequent agreement has been met. 
the Assembly can redeclare a climate emergency at any point. Clause 2 relates to the creation of climate action plans. Climate action plans are policy documents detailing steps that will be taken to address the challenges of climate change in Northern Ireland. The climate action plans must be approved by the Assembly and they must achieve the overriding climate objective. This is the establishment of the Northern, in Northern Ireland of the net zero carbon, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable economy by the year 2045. This target of 2045 is an ambitious but achievable one that reflects the general legislative trend towards strong climate legislation and the urgency to do as much as possible as quickly as possible. The net zero year may be altered by order of the executive, but cannot be amended to a year after 2045. Each climate action is prepared by the executive office and laid before the assembly for its approval. And the first cap must be laid within three years of the bill being enacted and every five years thereafter. Clause two also defines aspects of the overriding climate objective, such as net zero and the climate resilient, the lists and lists the seven greenhouse gases that must be included in the net zero target. Clause three states that the climate action plans will be made up of two parts, targets and measures. Targets will be for greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, water quality and soil quality. This is because the climate change is caused by greenhouse gas emissions, but manifests itself in declining water quality, soil quality and biodiversity. Any climate action plan must therefore consider these areas as key performance indicators. Measures look at how targets will be implemented. Measures in the bill include carbon budgets, nitrogen budgets and sectoral plans across the Northern Ireland economy. Clause 3 also sets out what must be taken into account when setting targets. Targets are set after obtaining advice from the relevant expert body and must take certain things into account, including international law and the impact the target will have on the environment, public health and well-being in Northern Ireland's specific economic and social circumstances. This is key to ensuring that targets that are set are fair and do not disproportionately impact upon one group while simul simultaneously ensuring that the bill is effective and achieves its overriding, overriding climate objective. Other provisions in Clause 3 include details of what must be taken into account in carbon budgets and nitrogen budgets, including the requirement to take transboundary impacts into account requirements for DERA to create a scheme to track carbon usage and pur purchase of carbon units, requirements to take transboundary and details of what sectors must be included in sectoral plans and the just transition principles that these plans must be subject to. This inclusion of the just transition principle in the bill are an important part of ensuring that the change to a net zero carbon so society will mean a better and fairer society for all. Sectoral plans must support jobs and growth of jobs that are climate resilient and environmentally and socially sustainable. Support net zero carbon investment and infrastructure. Create work which is high value, fair and sustainable. Reduce inequality as far as possible and reduce with a view to eliminating poverty and social deprivation. Clause 4 provides for implementation reports to be laid before the Assembly each year for the duration of the Climate Action Plan. It sets out how these reports should be set out and what they should contain. This includes whether the annual target has been met, reasons for failure to meet targets if they have not been met, progress on each sectoral policy and the likelihood of full policy implementation and the likelihood of the overriding climate objective being achieved. Part two of the bill relates to the Northern Ireland Climate Office and the Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner. Clauses five to 10 and schedules one to two establish the Northern Ireland Climate Office 
and the Northern Ireland Climate Commission and outline the Climate Commissioner's powers and functions. The Climate Commissioner will provide independent scrutiny and oversight of the Act. Similar to the Public Services Ombudsman, the Climate Commissioner will not be under the direction of any department or minister, the Assembly, the Assembly Commission or any local authority. The manner of appointment of the Climate Commissioner by the Crown on nomination by the Assembly is to allow maximum independence from government. The Climate Commissioner will not have enforcement powers, but similarly to independent climate bodies in other jurisdictions, they will have the power to make recommendations and raise issues that the Executive will then be mandated to address. The Climate Commissioner will have two main functions to monitor the implementation of the Climate Action Plans and to make annual reports to the Assembly on the issue, and to produce at least once per Assembly term an independent review report on the functioning and effectiveness of the Act, and to recommend any amendments considered necessary to achieve the overriding climate objective. These functions create an important statutory discourse which allows Climate Action Plans to be flexibly rooted in independent science. Clause 11 relates to the alteration of climate action plans following the Climate Commissioner's annual report. Will Certainly will. Just for the, the member leaves part two, could you give some explanation to the House of what Clause 6 8 means? Clause 6 8 says the Climate Commissioner may do anything, including acquire or dispose of property or rights which is calculated to facilitate or is conducive or incidental to the discharge of the functions of the Climate Commissioner. What rights is it that is anticipated that the uh, Climate Commissioner could dispose of in Clause 6 8? Thank the member for his intervention. It is not envisaged that the Climate Commissioner would have any enforcement powers within this bill. It is simply a monitoring and reporting function in order to assess how this bill progresses. Sorry, Speaker, I just lost my place. So I'll start again with Clause 11. Clause 11 relates to the alteration of climate action plans following the Climate Commissioner's annual report. Following the laying of the annual report by the Climate Commissioner, the Executive Office must prepare its response, this maybe addresses the member's point, including any proposed alterations to targets or measures. In altering the Climate Action Plan, the Executive must not either directly or indirectly lower targets or standards. These alterations must be approved by the Assembly. In this and in its other processes, the Bill outperforms other climate legislation around the world because it enshrines democracy and transparency into law. Democracy is key to a just transition. Society will shift and change, and conversations about how this happens cannot be had in a room with the doors closed. Every aspect of this just transition will be debated openly and transparently ensuring democratic oversight and democratic engagement. Certainly. Is that why you engaged in a public consultation process, or did you engage in a public consultation process? And could you make us aware of it if you did? Thank the Minister for his, his comments. I um, be a bit surprised if the Minister was not aware that a Prime Member's Bill is not mandated for public consultation, but this will go through evidence sessions with all stakeholders at committee stage. If passes this stage today. Clause 12 provides a duty that there must be no regression on environmental standards that were in place when Northern Ireland left the EU. This is already contained within a condition of the Withdrawal Act, as well as that nothing in this bill will override an act of Parliament. Minister Poot said back in July that we should not use language such as emergency or crises, but the science doesn't lie. The climate crisis is already here. 
Higher temperatures are causing droughts and widespread crop failures. Wildfires, storms in the North Atlantic and rising tides and flooding are part of long-term trends. As the Arctic warms, permafrost melts, releasing even more carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. We are moving ever closer to the point where climate change cannot be managed and controlled by humans. Every tiny incremental temperature rise counts. The more heat that gets added to the Earth's climate system, the more out of balance natural systems get. The more out of balance natural systems get, the more destruction and suffering we will see. We are already sitting at a 1.3 degrees of warming. At 1.5 degrees of warming, we push past the turning point and climate change impacts go from destructive to catastrophic. At two degrees of warming, we see simultaneous global crop failure representing a threat to global food security. In a modest mitigation scenario, we will hit two degrees of warming as early as 2038. At three degrees of warming, which scientists believe is looking increasingly likely between 2050 and 2100, we will have surpassed a tipping point from which there is no return, with humans powerless to intervene as planetary temperatures soar. Warming of three degrees risks seeing almost total loss of the Amazon rainforest, with drought and fires turning trees back into carbon dioxide as they burn or rot and decompose. The Met Office has warned that we could see four degrees of warming by 2060 without immediate action on emissions. To quote climate scientist Kelvin Anderson, 4% degrees of warming would be incompatible with any reasonable characterization of an organized, equitable, and civilized global community. If this is not an emergency, then what is? Climate change, like COVID-19, requires a global to local response and long-term thinking guided by science and the need to protect the most vulnerable. It requires the political will to make fundamental changes to the way we live our lives in order to respond to what is an existential threat to humanity and all life on Earth. This bill will provide a legal framework to decarbonise the economy in a way that tackles inequality and enhances the lives of ordinary people, our workers and our communities. The transition to a green economy must be underpinned by values of social justice and the principle that no one gets left behind. Finally, I would like to pay tribute to all the activists and environmentalists who have gotten us to this point today, to all of our children and young people who took part in the Fridays for Future strikes in Belfast and further afield for so long, and who had the vision and the determination to demand more of us on climate breakdown, because you showed us what democracy looks like, and we continue in that spirit in this bill. And to the Climate Coalition Northern Ireland, whose resolve to see climate change legislation has resulted in the bill that we have before us today. To have a climate change bill debated in this chamber is a first for Northern Ireland, and we should not forget that. I look forward to the debate, Mr. Speaker, and commend the bill to the House. Thank you. And I call the chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Teglin Magalier. Um, thank you, uh, Ken Corlia. Um, I'm speaking today as the chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Uh, the bill has a number of co-sponsors, with the main sponsor being uh, Claire Bailey. The other committee heard from Mrs Bailey and other witnesses uh, at our meeting on the 29th of April. Mrs Bailey is also a member of our committee, as are two other co-sponsors, namely uh, Philip McGuigan and John Blair. Mrs Bailey gave evidence to the committee as a witness and not as an MLA. Uh, she was accompanied by Dr Amanda Slevin, Mr Anurag Deb and Mr Philip Carson, all of whom have also been heavily involved in drafting this bill. Mrs Bailey told the committee that the bill originated with the Climate Coalition, uh, a network organisation representing over 400,000 people across the region. 
It was a priority for this organisation to develop an ambitious climate change bill based on the best available science and for it to be introduced as a matter of urgency. Uh, let me give you some background on the committee work on the, uh, the climate change overall. The ERA committee in the summer of 2020 brought a motion to debate in the Assembly on the 21st of July 2020, calling for the introduction of a Climate Change Act. Uh, that, that motion was endorsed by the Assembly. Since then, we have heard on a number of occasions from dear officials on the Minister's plans to produce an executive climate change bill. We have also heard about the links across the Green Growth Environment Framework, uh, about which the Committee has been uh, unable to get definite detail. During these sessions, officials told us about DERA's consultation on a climate change bill and outlined, uh, and outlined the issues that had risen up, uh, the, and the issue had risen up the agenda. Uh, okay, wrong page here. <laughs> outlined prelimi preliminary policy position uh, on what uh, might be in it. The DERA proposal was to be based on a target of 82% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050. That target is based on advice from the UK Climate Change Committee. Uh, hereafter referred to as the CCC. The Eric Committee also heard uh, from this. Is oh, sorry. Yeah. Just for clarification, that is at least 82 per cent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, I think it is, from the Climate Change Commission report. Yes, Mr. Reagan, that's, that's correct, at least 82 per cent. Um, so we, we had an interesting exchange with the chairperson uh, of the CCC and some of its board members, some of its board members, and uh, we explored the advice to DERA uh, that has been adopted by DERA for that 82 per cent reduction by 2050 for this uh, jurisdiction. The target forms a central point of difference between the bill before us today and the bill that DERA, DERA officials have indicated was likely to come to the Assembly. I have no doubt that this target will, as the bill moves forward, and its legislative passage be one of the most debated aspects. Is already causing considerable debate and discussion in the wider community, particularly among the farming sector. And that is to be welcomed. Uh, we are glad to see that the issue has risen up the agenda and that people, including the farming and rural communities, um, are discussing climate change. I can assure you that, assuming uh, that the bill passes, if the bill passes second stage and comes back to the Euro Committee, that we will allow plenty of time for the views of the agri food sector and indeed all of these sectors to be heard and debated. The bill has a number of aims. Mrs Bailey has already outlined these, but it is useful to go over them again. The committee heard that this is a framework bill. It is not uh, prescriptive, but sets out a pathway to net zero uh, while ensuring transparency and democratic oversight. It begins by declaring a climate emergency and establishes that as the mandate for, mitig establishes that as the mandate for mitigation and adaptation. It also sets out how the climate emergency can be annulled. It sets the target of reaching net zero by 2045, and it mandates the executive within three years of the bill being passed to prepare five-year climate action plans to reach this target. These action uh, plans are made up of two parts, namely targets and measures. The measures will look at carbon budgets, nitrogen budgets, and sectoral plans across a range of areas, such as uh, power generation and supply, transport, including shipping and aviation, residential and public buildings, waste management, infrastructure, land use, and land use change and agriculture. The targets have provisions in place to protect biodiversity, water and soil quality, uh, and carry out nitrogen budgets. These are included because the quality of these are so closely linked to climate change. The bill also has provisions to take uh, trans transboundary impacts into account and to track carbon usage, etc. It import importantly, it also has provisions for a just transition. These have been included to ensure that the change to net zero will mean a fairer and better society for all, for all of us. It also provides for establishment of a climate co commissioner and climate office, and for non-regression of our law from existing climate and environmental protections set out in EU law, as it applied before the end of the... Oh, yeah. Th that issue about the, the fair for, for all, um, can you stand over that? Because... The Climate Change Committee are indicating that the 50% reduction in dairy and 50% <coughs> reduction in beef, for example. So, if that happens, then that's going to migrate what is left of that sector onto the lowlands. And in that case, your hill farmers that you have referred to very often before would be the ones who would suffer most, and they wouldn't get fairness and equity uh, with the bill that's been promoted by the private member. 
Um, I thank the Minister for his intervention. Um, in terms of um, fairness and justice, one of the, and I think Ms Bailey outlined it previously, is that the climate action plans, which are part of this proposed bill, which will come uh, before the Assembly every five years, they will only come about through extensive and detailed public consultation with farmers and rural stakeholders, because we want these uh, climate action plans to be just and manageable and deliverable, and we certainly don't want them to in any way inhibit or um, decimate the farming uh, here in the north. And certainly, um, I, I want to just restate, we have plans from now up until the 16th of December to rigorously scrutinise this, this draft, this framework legislation, because it is a framework which will, be, which will effectively be filled out by secondary legislation. So there will be no surprises coming down the line for farmers. This will be part of a consultation exercise, rigorously debated. We will be hearing evidence from Lord, uh, Lord Debon and the UK Climate Change Committee, but we will also be hearing evidence from other experts in Ireland, in this, from the south of Ireland, from Chagas, and indeed internationally as well, just to tease all of this here out uh, as we move through the, the scrutiny process. Exactly yeah. <laughs> but he asked first. <laughs> uh, I, th I thank the member for giving way and for his response to, to the, the, the minister. Does the member agree with me, as has been stated by the bill mover, that this framework bill does not actually assign, regardless of what the CC said in their letter, any sectoral specific target, nor does it interfere with departmental policy? Uh, the member is correct. And the, this framework bill does not stipulate that at all. Uh, the, the, and as I say, the climate action plans, which will be uh, five yearly climate action plans, will be part, the, the, there has to be like a 16 week consultation to sign off on those climate action plans. And they're within they have to be signed off by the executive and by the assembly, and uh, following rigorous consultation with the farming community and indeed all of the uh, other stakeholders. Mr. Alistair. I hear what the member says, but has he read clause 11 to E, which is very clear that the executive office not, must not propose any alteration which has the effect, either directly or indirectly of lowering any target under Section 3.2 of this Act from the level approved by the Assembly under Section 2.3. So how can you say that there is always the option to look again? There is no option in this Bill to look again, none whatsoever. It is set in stone. Well, this, this is an Act of this Assembly, and it is under the ownership of this Assembly. And as I say, it's a framework. It's a framework piece of legislation at the moment. We'll all, everyone will have their say in terms of fleshing this out. And, and that will include, no doubt, Mr. Alistair, who will, no doubt, have plenty to say in the time ahead because he has plenty to say at other times. So, um, just getting back to where we, we were, um, the committee explored these principles with Mrs. Bailey and the other witnesses. And um, uh, I want to just outline some of the thoughts of the committee. As far as I say, the committee spent considerable time exploring the implications of the 100% net zero target <coughs> by 2025-2045. As you noted earlier, there are many, particularly the agri-food sector, who have real concerns with this target because of advice from the CCC that such a target would mean radical change for the farming sector. The CCC has recommended that any climate legislation for here should include a target to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions by at least 82% by 2050. And that was the point that um, Mr. Aiken sought clarity on um, just a moment ago. It's important to emphasise that the CCC used the phrase at least 2050, because it has been clear that it does see its recommendations as a minimum target. The CCC analysis is based on our position as a strong agri food exporter to Britain, combined with our more limited capabilities to use engineered greenhouse gas removal technologies. The state of this means that we are likely to remain a small net source of greenhouse gas emissions almost entirely from agriculture. Uh, it further states that it is fair that these residual emissions should be offset by, by actions in Britain. At the request of DERA, further advice from the CCC was obtained and has also been considered by the committee. That advice is available on our website for anyone who is interested. The CCC advice suggests that going further to reach net zero 
and 2050 would likely require uh, either or both a larger reduction in output uh, from, our livestock, uh, from our livestock sector compared to other regions, and more farming land released for carbon capture. As created various scenarios to get us to net zero, suggests that even under its most stretching scenario, known as the tailwind scenario, would entail a 50% fall in meat and dairy production here by 2050, and significantly greater levels of tree planting on the land released. Even then, according to the CCC, it would not be enough to get this jurisdiction to net zero uh, in 2050. There is a fear amongst the agriculture sector that it could be disproportionately impacted by this bill. That impact would extend beyond farming into the processing and manufacturing sectors. It is also fair to say that the UFU in particular are very concerned about the uh, impact of this bill. There are real concerns for some of our farming communities. Others fear that a cut in livestock numbers here could lead to food being imported from other countries that do not produce it to the same high standards as we do. The Committee's Board explored this in some detail. We are aware that we have a population of 1.8 million and produce uh, sufficient food, mostly dairy and meat, for 10 million people. We heard uh, from witnesses that the UK consumes double the amount of recommended animal-based protein and the production of this can be beneficial for public health. The issue of dietary change and lifestyle changes that will be required to meet the target were explored. Mrs Bailey stated that she and her colleagues had met with some of the farming sector bodies and after listening to their concerns wished to put on the record that there is nothing in this bill that will harm the, farm, the agricultural sector. She noted that the bill does not mandate any immediate changes to the agricultural sector, nor is it in any way prescriptive. There are no specific targets allocated to individual sectors and that because some sectors, such as transport and energy, are ready to move immediately and quickly, it may be that uh, agriculture will have a more gradual transition. It was also pointed out that the CCC has explored very few pathways for change that include future developments and low-carbon farming measures. The witnesses uh, further noted that the assumption that we cannot reach net zero by 2045 has not been fully investigated and provided some examples of what can be done. Moreover, it should be noted what was happening in both Wales and Scotland. Initially, Wales had a target recommended by the CCC of 92% to net zero. That was based on the importance of livestock to its agricultural sector. Wales has taken on that, that on board and moved beyond that. <clears throat> the committee took this discussion further and considered the impact of climate change on farming and particularly the economic co costs of severe weather. One of the witnesses referred to some research that indicated that climate change had cost the Scottish industry around £161 million, and that on a global basis climate change has reduced productivity by 21% since the 1960s. The Committee also considered the transboundary provisions in the Bill. An important aspect is that we share a land border with another jurisdiction on this island. In practical terms, a farmer in the border regions could have some of his or her land on either side of that land border. The difficulties that might be created were discussed, particularly since the targets in this bill are different from those in the south. The consultation that had taken place with the various sectors was also discussed. We heard that the Climate uh, Coalition, who had been working with Mrs Bailey in drafting a bill, is the largest civic society network for climate change here, with its member organisations representing over 400,000 people. It has done intensive consultation with its members throughout the development of the bill. There has also been engagement with key stakeholders, including IAPA and Farmers for Action, departmental officials and energy companies. There are plans in place for further consultation as the bill progresses. The committee was made aware that the UFU has strongly indicated that it has a major concerns with the bill. I have already noted that the committee explored in great detail the implications of a target for climate change that moved 21, uh, 20, by 2050, and I won't go over that again. The next matter that the committee was discussed was that of the pr principle of a just transition. We heard that this principle is deeply embedded in the bill. The witnesses were able to provide further details on what this means by reference to a paper from COP26 University Network. The paper also outlined the dimensions of social justice, of justice and procedural justice, distributive justice, recognition justice and restorative justice. The aim to, to reduce inequality, eliminate poverty and social deprivation, support high net zero carbon investment and infrastructure and create work that is high value, fair and sustainable as part of the bill. Exploring this principle, the issue of food security was raised and discussed. The witnesses noticed that perhaps the biggest threat to food security is climate change. 
that it will be climate change itself that will force a change in how we do things while maintaining capacity on the land to produce food in the longer term. We then move to discuss the Independent Environment Protection Agency, or IEPA, IEPA, and the crossover, including possible joint working with the Climate Change Commissioner. The Commissioner will have two main functions. The first of those functions will be to report on the implementation of climate action plans for the duration of these plans. The second is about reporting on the effectiveness of the bill once it is enacted and recommending any changes in order to ensure that net zero target is achieved. The Commissioner would provide the Assembly and its committees with the evidence about what is going right, what is going wrong and what can be improved. It is also vital that the legislation is kept under review. That review should take account of the developments in science and technology and our understanding of how climate works and can be abated. To that end, it is envisaged that the Commissioner will make recommendations regarding how we can improve the methods that we use to achieve uh, net zero. We did note that the Commissioner will not have enforcement powers. Indeed, the Committee has noted that there are proposals that the Office of Environmental Protection, whose remit with the approval of the Assembly will extend to here, may have enforcement power relating to climate change. I have outlined some of the exploration by the Committee of the principles of this Bill. In summary, I can say that the issue that the Commission Committee paid most attention to was the impact on the agri-food sector, uh, on the agri-food industry, of the 100 per cent net zero by 2045. Some of our Committee members are very concerned um, about this aspect. And I am aware that, just to ha as I have been, most of the Committee members are being lobbied very uh, hard on this uh, target. However, overall, there was a broad uh, welcome by the Aero Committee for this bill. And, uh, and if it receives the approval by Assembly today, we look forward uh, to the scrutinising and further detail at the City State Committee stage. Uh, members, that concludes what I have to say as the Chair of the Aero Committee. And I just want to make some commentary in my capacity as a Sinn Féin spokesperson on agriculture and rural affairs. Um, in supporting this bill, um, we want to assure farmers, that those involved in the agri-food industry, that we fully recognise the hugely vital role that agriculture plays in our society in producing safe and secure food, sustaining rural communities and underpinning over 100,000 jobs here in the north. And all of us who have been through the COVID pandemic during the last year appreciate the absolute vital importance that has been played by our farmers and the agri-food processing industry in keeping our food supplies moving during very, very, uh, very difficult and challenging times. Also, as custodians of the countryside, we also recognise the huge environmental contribution that our farmers make in the preservation of biodiversity, water quality and animal health standards. Farmers know from their own experiences that they are in the front line of extreme weather events brought about by climate change. And we need no look no further than down in my own constituency of West Tyrone, where we had severe landslides in the Sperns uh, four years ago, and indeed the Minister paid a very welcome visit there down there in recent weeks. Uh, devastated farms, livestock and properties. And with the earth uh, heating up, sea levels rising, these events will become more um, uh, common unless we take action. Across the world, 197 countries have signed up to the Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement. This pledges countries to take steps to keep global temperature rise to less than two degrees above pre-industrial levels. In fulfilment of this, Britain, Scotland, uh, Britain and England, Scotland, Wales and the South of Ireland have passed Climate Change Acts, which commits them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and become carbon neutral in, say, the next 24 to 29 years. The North is the only part of these islands that does not have a Climate Change Act, and we believe this sends out the wrong message to the international world about our commitment to sustainable and environmental uh, practices. And indeed, we, we have a very strong and good message to send to the rest of the world, and we feel that that can be undermined if we don't commit ourselves to ambitious and deliverable uh, uh, climate change targets. We believe that if the North does not adopt the Climate Change Act in accordance with the Paris Agreement, that this could reduce our ability to access international markets for our produce. This would be particularly pronounced as the South of Ireland and the other regions of these islands have committed to climate neutrality by 2045 to 2050. And indeed, during the conversation that I had uh, with um, Lord Devon um, of the UKCCC, that, that was one point that he did make to us, that if we do not if we do not sign up to this, if we do not, do not agree to this, that we will be punished by the, by the rest of the world if we do not sign up to this here. Uh, this, uh, up to Climate Change uh, Act, 
Uh, this could also create unforeseen problems as virtually all of our agri-food and our dairy products are processed from both parts of the island. They are deemed as mixed origin. We know that farmers have concerns about the implications of this uh, PMB. All of us will have received lobbies and representations about this. Um, legitimate concern. Indeed, on Friday, uh, Sinn Féin and myself and colleagues met a number of leading agri-food stakeholders and listened to their, their concerns. It is important that we take on board these legitimate concerns as we go forward in scrutinising the clauses of the Bill and ensure that these stakeholders have their vo voices heard, but also, also that these stakeholders get involved in the process and, and trying to shape this Bill and make sure their voices are heard as we move ahead through the course of the next six months of rigorous scrutiny. The actual Bill, as alluded to previously, it's, it's a framework that proposes a number of structures, the Climate Change Officer, the Commissioner, and the Committee to Senate, the, the Climate Change these climate change plans, but I want to re-emphasise these climate change plans will be co-designed with rural stakeholders and uh, will be subject to uh, uh, public consultation before they actually are agreed by the Executive and the Assembly. So it's, uh, there's a lot of rigorous and there's a lot of involvement there that was wanted to be seen as part of this Bill. The Bill does not contain sanction powers and any plans will have to take account of the fiscal, social and economic impact context here in the North. And in addition to this, the farming sector has not been asked to make any changes for the next three years. I want to just underline this again. I can give this commitment from our party and indeed from the committee as well, that we will scrutinise this rigorously over the next six or seven months. Uh, and we're, we, have, we have identified a range of experts, and this will be debated and discussed at length by the ERA committee. The Assembly will be back in here uh, on more than one occasion and through public consultation exercises before the uh, final bill becomes law. And that was one of the, uh, one of the uh, items that has been agreed by the committee, is the range of stakeholders, um, experts around table events, and also um, public consultation using citizen space uh, to, for members of the public to have their say as this uh, bill uh, on, uh, unfolds and develops. Um, in terms of the asks, what has been asked of farmers in this private member's bill is that over the next 24 years they have been asked to take, uh, take steps to balance out the amount of greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases their farms produce with what they absorb or, or sequester. And we have looked at other regions for evidence as to how this may be achieved. And rather than decimating herds and farm businesses, we believe that reducing greenhouse emissions can be achieved through pr production efficiency, which also leads to profit profitability. Indeed, experts from Chagask in the south of Ireland have identified actions such as extending the grazing season, mixed grass wards, changing to protected urea fertiliser, reducing losses from slurry, and substituting clover from, uh, for chemical fertiliser can help reduce emissions whilst also cutting up costs. Indeed, last year in the south of Ireland they were able to reduce the emissions by 6 per cent. Oh, yes? I thank the member for giving way, and I totally uh, concur with his comments about the importance of the farm and, and rural community and the importance of participating uh, as we move forward in, in shaping this bill. I mean, a lot will be made and said today about specific lines within the CCC letter uh, to uh, the minister or, or the committee. Less will be said about other more positive lines and paragraphs within that committee. Within that letter, but in terms of the CCC and their sixth carbon budget report, uh, they have said uh, that the greenhouse gas impacts of less intensive farming or agroecology options are not included in the CCC scenarios due to the lack of robust evidence on the abatement potential. So, um, could I ask uh, the member, does he agree that, my, with my reading of this, that uh, this means that the CC estimates for potential for greenhouse gas uh, reductions from agriculture are here are incomplete and therefore are currently underestimates? Um, yes, um, I agree with what you're saying, and I do believe there needs to be more exploration through AFBE um, and through the department to look at looking at the abatement potential because that's one of the things that farmers have been saying to us both north and south is that they're, they're, they don't feel that there's a proper calculation for the amount of um, carbon that they actually sequester. And if we're to uh, arrive uh, at a proper um, assessment of reaching net zero, we, we need to have that. Um, yeah. I remember for a given way, and I think it's important that we do debate this issue very fully because we haven't had a public consultation 
and I have to say that that is, that is poor form that this has not been consulted on, uh, irrespective of whether you have to do it or not. Uh, but on the issue of mixed clovers and all of those issues that, that you raise as, as potential abatement, and I accept that and agree that that, is, that has potential. Uh, but one of the pe people who is most involved in this is Dr John Gilliland, and there is an invitation for you to visit the farm in Douth, uh, uh, as, as I have that invitation also. Uh, but we have just received a letter from him this morning expressing concern on this issue. So even those people who are at that cutting edge that you are referring to are concerned about this bill, and it will lead to an impact most on those farms which are less productive currently, and the less productive farms, as you know, are the farms that are on the hills. Yeah, well, that's I, I through the UFU, I have accepted to go and I look forward to that visit to that uh, farm in, in County Louth, absolutely. Um, but just to, just want to pick up on some of the stuff there. That's the that's the sort of information that we want to scrutinise and hear more from during the course of this this scrutiny over the course of the next six months. And that's that's really important because you know you know just when I was looking through Axel Dero's own website, uh, I was looking at uh, what mechanisms they have uh, at the minute to try and give farmers some sort of baseline to what the what 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 they are producing and emitting, and they've got the bovis calculator. But when I, when I just read from Deere's own uh, note, it said here that this was from the department. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions involves understanding the relationship between soils, livestock, environment, and farm management. But fortunately, lower GHG emissions are generally linked to improved improved production and profitability. So I think it's important that we, we, we must explore as far as possible what on-farm options that there are. So just getting back to what I was saying there, you know, the experts, you know, and again, the UK CCC are experts, Chagas is experts, there's, there's many experts that, that we need to hear from. But in, certainly in Chagas as well, in the south of Ireland, they've identified actions, um, you know, um, I've, I've mentioned those previously, but other advances have been made in areas such as beef genomics, soil management, getting the pH right, uh, reducing the crude protein and cattle diets have been identified as effective in reducing emissions, the incorporation of specific minerals, and even incorporation of seaweed in extracts into cattle diets have been identified as an effective means to reduce emissions. GHG uh, emissions can also be balanced out at farm level through environmental actions such as hedgerow and tree planting, the rewetting of bogs, and appropriate nutrient management of soils to maximise the carbon storage potential. And I think that's important as the Minister brings forward his uh, new agriculture and rural policy that that's factored into uh, uh, that new policy. And, and again, I want to restate all of this will be rigorously scrutinised and teased out by the Area Committee in partnership with the agri food sector, climate change experts, and of course, through the uh, by the pub, with the public through citizen space and stakeholder events. In terms of the, uh, you know, the aims of the, of the bill is for agriculture industry to achieve net zero GHG uh, by 2045. Uh, we, do, we do not believe that agriculture should, should be scaled back in order to uh, achieve this here. We do not want to see uh, production being inhibited and indeed the, uh, the problem being offloaded somewhere else, uh, that is known as uh, carbon leakage. We st strongly do not believe that the only solution to reaching net zero is a reduction of herd sizes and decimating farm businesses, and we could, we, we could not stand over the decimation of farming in Ireland, nor exporting emissions to other countries, uh, carbon leakage. In fact, this would be a complete contradiction of uh, our commitment to tackling the, the, this global crisis. To become carbon neutral during the next 24 years, farmers also need to have a baseline. Farmers need to know where they currently stand in terms of progress towards carbon neutrality. In fact, many farmers may be more carbon neutral than they believe they are. They currently are. And interestingly, uh, as I was uh, researching for today, I noted recent comments from the chair of the Irish Farmers Association in County Kerry, who believes that many farms are already carbon neutral. So there's a huge onus on DERA and AFPE to develop an accurate carbon calculator building on the BOVIS GHG calculator that already exists. Farmers need an accurate picture of where they are on the pathway to being carbon neutral, and one which accurately assesses the huge amount of carbon that is sequestered by hedges, bogs, and the grasslands that they manage. The South already has this pathway through their marginal abatement 
cost curve, which was developed in conjunction with leading national and international national experts and scientists, and sets out a series of 26 actions that can be taken on farm to reduce emissions and increase efficiency and profitability. We need to learn from this body of research and indeed from the extensive research that we have here in the north and indeed from other regions both nationally and internationally and working with farmers to help them develop this roadmap. In conclusion, um, I can't underline more strongly that we have deeply appreciate the vital role that farm businesses play in our society and we want to work in partnership with the farming community to support them to put in place a manageable and supported uh, transition to help them achieve uh, carbon neutrality. Gurma thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. And the next speaker I have on my list is Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate as someone who spent my working life farming the land. I am all too aware of the need as are many other industries, of the need to address generally the issue of global emissions. I do not speak from a position of ignoring ramifications of global emissions, but rather from a position of best responding to those matters, with the twin interests of the planet and our agri-food sector firmly in mind. I must state that the threat to farming, food production and the economic stability of Northern Ireland could not be more stark. Uh, when the ramifications of this particular bill are considered. Ms Bailey MLA has managed with her private members bill to unite the agri-food sector, ordinary farmers and representative farming organisations against her bill, and not because they have some fear or unwillingness to protect and enhance the environment. They already try to do that, rather that such a bill, if implemented, would do unimaginable harm to Northern Ireland food production. The threat posed by this bill must be weighed against the impact of Northern Ireland on global emissions. Our contribution stands at 0.04 per cent, according to data. With that, firmly, that figure firmly in mind, it would be pragmatic and sensible to respond to the threat of global warming with measures that do two things. Number one, they assist in contributing to a lower, lowering of global emissions, and proportionally, and number two, they assist in, ins in ensuring Northern Ireland can continue to have a prosperous economy. Mrs Bailey's bill does neither of these. That is why it must be uh, voted down. Northern Ireland's agri-food sector, despite the latest challenges poses, uh, by, posed by the current pandemic, has shown itself to be a resilient industry, one that prides itself in care for both the environment and the livestock it produces. The bill, therefore, before the House and its insistence of net zero by 2045 would require the reduction on behalf of output of Northern Ireland farms and would mean the decimation of Northern Ireland agriculture. That, ne that is neither sensible nor good for the en environment or economy. Indeed, as, as a committee, we have heard from Lord Devon and his work in, climate, in, the, in his Climate Change Committee which has taken a very long, detailed, scientific and wide-ranging view of the changes required and have put forward important conclusions, which, whilst, having also, been a, whilst also been a significant challenge to meet, do represent a much more achievable roadmap to the reductions required in line with the broader United Kingdom strategy. Private members' bill before the House is simply a hopeful political gamble by the Green Party, which seeks to try and one up any official position uh, targets set by DERA on the important issues by reducing time frames and in turn worryingly uh, increases risk for one of Northern Ireland's most important economic sectors. I will, yeah. I thank uh, the, the member given way. It's just with regard to his last remark about this being some sort of opportunistic attempt by the Green Party to do something. Does the member recognise? the cross-party support and involvement in this bill and the fact that there are co-sponsors from every, every party in this House bar his own party and the TUV. I, yes, thank you for his intervention and I do, I, I do accept that, but I think some of those parties I think already earlier rolling back from their position in that. If you listen very carefully to the Chairman of the Agriculture Committee uh, earlier, you'll realise that. There is much focus on the farming industry with climate change 
It's been considered and much expected of the industries in terms of emissions re reductions. However, it is important that we consider the contribution already made by the farming community in assisting in the preservation of the countryside and the wider environment. Indeed, as I have stated before, it is important that the, this contribution is accurately measured uh, as there will be great importance tied uh, to what more agriculture can do. But equally, it is important to understand, firstly, that the industry already does this in this regard. That specific issue requires much more work to establish a scientific baseline for carbon sequestration. My view is that by supporting the private members bill, we step outside the advice of independent experts and support unachievable, unjust targets with the consequence of making farmers redundant, reducing incomes, decreasing herd sizes, increased production costs and potentially land abandonment. We basically make redundant the vital role our farmers play in food production and as custodians of the countryside and those who hold many of the assets we need to help the environment. Therefore, the ironic result of this move would actually be detrimental uh, to the environment and tackle climate, tackling climate change change, because we would actually increase global emissions by outsourcing our production to countries with less sustainable production methods. So let's approach this debate with sensible, practical heads and deliver a pragmatic solution which actually works. I urge the members to rethink this bill and put efforts behind the Minister's own climate change bill which has been brought forward and urge all our exec executive members to get behind these efforts which represent the very best opportunity to work towards achievable targets. The unilateral support of our farming and food production stakeholders and representative organisations must be the core of any efforts moving forward, as full cooperation and buy-in towards addressing emissions will offer the greatest chance of meeting targets. The bill, therefore, before the House has failed already in this regard and therefore must be taken off the table. Thank you. Mr Mark Durkin. I rise in support of the bill and indeed I am privileged to be one of its co-sponsors, working with colleagues across party lines on something that we all recognise needs done. The urgent need for a climate change bill has been well established. The extensive body of research demands that we act immediately, globally, locally and as individuals in response to this emergency. Climate change is arguably the most serious threat that we face, not just to our environment, but to our health, our economic prosperity and our global security. The overwhelming scientific consensus points to the fact that the impacts of climate change are accelerating and they are largely driven by greenhouse gas emissions as a result of human activity. Although while the science is beyond reproach, sadly, like most things in here, it appears that it is not beyond dispute. If we are to combat the devastating environmental, health, economic and societal impact of climate change, as Ms Bailey has outlined, we have a responsibility to act. We owe to ourselves and to future generations to face up to this uncomfortable reality. No longer can it be swept under the carpet or, or stuck in a hole in the ground to be dealt with at a later date. Climate change is here, it is happening, and we are already bearing witness to its dire consequences playing out globally and here on our own doorsteps. Communities here have been devastated by flooding in recent years, and fluctuating weather patterns saw us experience practically every season within the course of last week. If we are to turn back the clock on climate catastrophe, we cannot afford further delay. We must act now. It remains a stain on Northern Ireland's record that specific legislation on prevention of climate breakdown through emissions reduction targets, working toward carbon neutrality or preparing industry for tomorrow's economy has taken so long to implement. Credit must be given to citizens and indeed councils here, many of whom have been ahead of the curve, taking individual responsibility to consider their own personal choices and to enact green initiatives. In my own constituency, Derry City and Strabane District Council have taken action and declared a climate emergency. They have spearheaded the first Council 
Climate Adaptation Plan in the North and have already launched their Climate Pledge, committing the city and district to net zero greenhouse emissions by 2045. Vitally, though, Council has recognised that climate change is not only a global but a transboundary issue. They have developed the first regional energy strategy in Ireland and have an emerging multi-sectoral north-west climate action plan. So too must the executive work to establish an all-island response to climate change, given the similar challenges we face in both jurisdictions on this small island. In doing so, we can develop a greater harmonisation of climate data, support for just transition, cross-departmental coordination with supporting policy, as well as, most importantly, financial and funding mechanisms to deliver action on the ground. But to truly affect positive change here, we need a strong legal underpinning of climate principles, and it now falls to the Executive and the Assembly to play catch-up in that regard. Looking at the Bill itself, and some of my SDLP colleagues will go into more intricate detail on that later, Scientific evidence makes clear that Northern Ireland needs to meet net zero carbon emissions by 2045. That vision can only be achieved through collaborative working, declaring a climate emergency and establishing a mandate for climate change mitigation and adaptation. The role of a Northern Ireland Climate Office and Climate Commissioner as overseers will be integral in accomplishing these goals. And I agree, these targets are ambitious. However, this isn't some pie-in-the-sky notion, but rather they are ambitious because they have to be. Certainly. Does the member agree with me that it is important that we do have ambitious targets, uh, not just to, to have them as part of our, our climate legislation, but to inform all the other strategies and policies that are brought through other departments that are going to ensure that the targets that are set within those are ambitious as well? Uh, I thank the member for her invention and agree entirely. Everything that we do as legislators, legislators or as a legislative body from here on has to take the, these issues into consideration. And we, we are right to be ambitious. We are right to, 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 to aim high. For too long, this executive has rested on its laurels, not to mention the three years of complete inaction we had in the absence of an executive, but to the detriment of both denizens and climate. Successive administrations here have failed the wishes of some MLAs, and I say that as a former Environment Minister, of people and the deluge of scientific evidence in our inability to grasp the single greatest issue of our time. It has taken a cross-party coalition of MLAs to push forward this crucial legislation, despite the prevarication of others. In January 2020, all parties committed to the introduction of a Climate Change Act under New Decade New Approach. And again last July, members stood in this chamber making the same appeals and similar arguments when we called on Minister Putz to introduce a Climate Change Act within three months. Now, almost a year down the line, Northern Ireland remains the only jurisdiction within these islands without greenhouse redu gas reduction targets enshrined in law. And while the impact of COVID may explain in part the recent delay, it cannot be used as an excuse. The focus on green recovery and the creation of a sustainable society is of even greater significance as we emerge from the fog of COVID. If we have learned anything from this horrific year, it is that we must do things differently. The pandemic has served as a reminder of the delicate and unpredictable balance between humans and the natural world. It has also given many the opportunity to reconnect with our natural environment and realise the importance of protecting it. We now need to witness a sea change in behaviours in the powers that be. However, this is not the time for finger pointing, but for rolling up our sleeves, getting our noses to the grindstone. I must at this point pay tribute to the Climate Coalition of Northern Ireland, who have not let up in that regard. They have been an invaluable resource, who have worked tirelessly in their mission to put climate action firmly on the agenda. And also, thanks to all the schools, groups, families and individuals 
who are not only adapting their own ways of doing things, but also educating others on the need to change. So many people and organisations are doing their bit. And within the executive, my own party colleague, Infrastructure Minister Nicola Mallon, has led the charge. She has wasted no time since taking office to embed climate change adaptation strategies in her department and place greater focus on green recovery, including investing in zero carbon public transport, investing in climate friendly street lighting, and creating a £20 million blue and green infrastructure fund. It is important that while climate action will be a challenge for all government departments to overcome, Minister Mallon has demonstrated that even within a department where climate change targets have posed some of the biggest challenges, that she is not afraid to take them on. She has stepped up to the plate. And leading by example, she has created a picture of what it is possible for others to do. We can't pretend, however, that there has been, or is, or even will be, consensus on this issue. Reservations and, in some cases, outright opposition about the targets set out in the Climate Change Bill have once more reared their head, not unexpectedly, from certain quarters in industry and agriculture. And the commercial concerns expressed have perennially been reflected in polit political opposition to a Climate Change Act from some quarters in this House. And while I understand and appreciate the concerns raised by the UFU in particular, climate principles will inform the trajectory for practically all future legislation here and beyond. I agree that farmers and industry should be and will be part of the solution. The genesis of this bill was forged on the premise of collaboration, the basis of all good, solid legislation. And it's that playbook which will instruct how we move forward from here. Engagement with all sectors should not be a byproduct of the legislative process, but an integral cog in it. I acknowledge that Northern Ireland has a very different landscape to that of Britain, and agri-food represents a huge slice of our economic pie. However, Meat and dairy farmers are already feeling the pinch following a shift in consumption habits, with well-known supermarket chains introducing their own targets in relation to sustainable produce. They cannot deny that this transition demands new thinking on their part. And that's where the bill comes on. It's about working with, not against, the agri-sector to ensure they are supported and to enable them to establish sustainable practices, such as incentivising farmers to sequester more carbon in their land as we do move forward together. Healthy debate means that we hear out different viewpoints. It does not, however, mean that we stand still. We have moved, or at least we are moving, beyond the old world view that environmental requirements must constrain economic performance and productivity. It is possible to create a better environment and a stronger economy. A sentiment that Minister Putz himself shared recently, he went on record affirming that environmental challenges present economic opportunities. Climate change will affect all sectors, not just agriculture. The possibilities that enacting climate action legislation can bring should be embraced rather than seen as something negative. The transport sector has grasped that opportunity and committed to transitioning to an entirely renewable energy fleet by 2050. And it's that type of initiative that we need to witness elsewhere. Research has shown that the cost savings of decarbonisation will bear fruit by 2050. As such, going green makes positive economic sense. While the green revolution is regarded with apprehension by some, it is undoubtedly a vehicle for prosperity that we need to get on. But regardless of economic losses or gains, tackling climate change and hitting net zero carbon targets just needs done. Delivering real, tangible change requires difficult conversations and it requires difficult decisions. Without courage, 
there is no progress. And the alternative, that of inaction by the Assembly here and now, does not bear thinking about. Dissenting voices should not be ignored. Mr McAleer has outlined how they will not be ignored, but nor can they hinder progress. Wider societal reform is not an ideal, it is a necessity. We are living in an interconnected climate where an ecological emergency has been driven by human activities. Therefore, ambitious action is critical. How we live our lives is placing pressure on biodiversity. We must learn to do things differently. We must learn to do things better. Commitment to advancing this legislation is a cornerstone of the New Decade New Approach Agreement, which has brought us all here today. We can't backpedal on that commitment, nor can we afford a piecemeal approach. The time for climate justice is now. This bill sets in stone a promise to future generations. It is the embodiment of hope that together we can make a difference by creating green, sustainable communities that deliver for everyone. Today's promises guarantee tomorrow's reality. We owe it to our children and future generations to honour that promise. Given the right leadership and supported by the right legislation, we can deliver change in a manner that will not just help address the environmental challenges, but also has the potential to bring about significant economic and societal benefit for all. I support the bill. Thank you. I call Dr. Steve Aiken. Much indeed, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I rise to, support, uh, the, rise to support the second stage of the Climate Stage Bill, and I outline my support for the main provisions of the Bill, coupled with some amendments that our party may seek to append at the committee stages. But first of all, I would like to say that this is a personal journey for me. Somebody who comes from my background, who was a nuclear submarine captain, would su seem to be somebody who is not likely to be an eco-warrior. If I take you back to 1987, which was a long time ago, I was operating under the Arctic ice in areas where there was a thousand-year ice. It hasn't shifted in a thousand years. However, move on a period of time, and 2010, I was again in the Arctic doing other work, and that ice had gone. Thousand-year ice has disappeared. Furthermore, I was also up in Baffin Island and doing some research for the Ministry of Defence at the time because I used to be one of the lead researchers within the Ministry of Defence on climate change and particularly on what is happening in the Arctic. And we saw at first hand the impact on the tundra and what was happening with the permafrost and the fact that the permafrost had gone. We see virtually every day now the increases in the impact of climate change. And when we say about a climate change emergency, there are very key reasons for that. There is one piece of those who still do not think that this is a situation that is occurring. Part of my job previously, when I was at the Defence Concept and Doctrine Centre, I know it is quite a mouthful, uh, I headed up the Global Strategic Trends Programme. And we helped fund in the Met Office the Hadley Centre, which is designed specifically to do research into climate change in other areas as well. And that organisation was just as full of sceptics as I was to begin with as well. We have heard many times that there are no models that are predicting our climate as well. That's not true. There are models that are projecting what's happening right now. But we were told when I was due to give evidence to the IPCC and various other places not to use that evidence because it was so alarmist. Because the speed and increases in heat and carbon dioxide emissions would have meant that we would never have been able to reach the global targets that we must do to prevent a climate catastrophe. Now, I don't want to be somebody who spends my time going around sort of being a doom merchant. I believe in the future. I believe in opportunity. But let's be very clear about this. This climate emergency is happening, and it's happening a lot faster than people think. And if we think in 2050 we will still be arguing about sort of various parts of agriculture here, or indeed whether beef will be coming from Brazil, which may in fact just turn out to be a desert by that stage, we need to really wake up to the fact that we are in a very, very dangerous situation. 
So with those provisos, I just want to sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to say that, as already outlined, this bill seeks to bring Northern Ireland into line with the rest of our nation. In particular, the provisions of the Climate Change Act 2008, our national government's commitment to 78 per cent carbon reduction above the 1990s baseline by 2035, with an overall approach bringing the United Kingdom as a whole to net zero carbon by 2050 at the latest. We have already seen from the United States, the EU, as well as our own nation, we are seeking to accelerate carbon reduction targets. COP26 is likely to see an even greater emphasis. However, even with meeting these reductions, we are still going to struggle to avoid breaching a greater than 1.5 degrees centigrade increase by mid-century. I think the chances of us meeting that are very unlikely. The, last, the, eight, that the 18 of the last 20 years have been recorded as being the hottest since records have begun. The degradation in the tundra and across the polar regions, the increasing move northwards of desertification, should be plainly obvious to us all, except those who willfully ignore the scientific evidence. It is regrettable that even here in Northern Ireland, at this stage, there are some of those people who choose to ignore the fact of the situation we now find ourselves in. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, Northern Ireland and this Assembly have a very critical role to play. The reasoning for this bill and its substantive 12 clauses is first and foremost to recognise that we are in a climate emergency and that we have little time to act. The recognition by the Northern Ireland Executive and every government department should now be taking that fact as part of the future programme for government, and this should be factored in to all aspects of future outcomes and work strands. The second and third clauses set a series of actions on the Executive to deliver and develop sectoral plans and targets. While much of our net carbon reduction can be achieved from the energy, transportation, manufacturing and housing sectors, there is and remains a considerable degree of comment and concern from sectors of our agricultural industry, as pointed out by the Chairman of the Agricultural Committee. As a party, I and our representatives have listened to the issues raised by the Ulster Farmers Union, the Northern Ireland Meat Exporters Association, Grain Association, amongst others. We have also listened intently to the conservation groups, many individual farmers, and indeed we have had input from the National Farmers Union, who I might remind you are now seeking to achieve net zero carbon by 2040. And on balance, we understand that the goal and objective is to be in line with reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, as set out by the report by Lord Devon, dated the 1st of April, which sets out proposals for Northern Ireland to achieve at least an 82 per cent reduction in greenhouse gas emission in 2050. And Mr Chairman, I emphasise the word at least to do that as well. This Assembly will be aware that elsewhere in our nation there are moves to accelerate the timing of this target. And while the difference between 2045 to 2050 may appear to be slight, it has to be recognised that it has exercised some of our farming community. Therefore, in order to achieve the bulk of the necessary reductions, which we expect to be achieved considerably before 2045, as our entire nation moves to an electric economy, but we do need to help the farming industry transition, as according to the Ulster Farmers Union they intend to do. We will propose amendments at the committee stage to enshrine these reduced targets for the sector so we do not significantly damage the agricultural business sector and allow them to transition effectively. We would state at this stage, therefore, we will seek to amend the date of Clause 2, Para 2, to read 2045, and as far as practicable, based on the provisions of the Climate Change Committee report in respect to agriculture, to achieving their targets by 2050. The reality is quite clear here. The bulk of the majority of the carbon reductions we need to achieve have to come from transport, from energy, from manufacturing, from housing in those sectors as well. But we cannot get to a situation where we fundamentally damage our agribusiness while we are doing that. We recognise that as a party, and that is what we are trying to achieve. We also seek to see provisions Mr. Chairman, uh, of, for, made for the Department of Agriculture and Economies, who recently commissioned a study by Sir Peter Kendall on the future shape of the agribusiness sector in Northern Ireland. Now, most of this is particularly to do around the protocol and issues to do with how it reshapes itself. But Peter Kendall talks very clearly about uh, the fact that farming needs to be and agribusiness needs to be smarter. 
It is not necessarily about making it smaller, it is about making it smarter. And if you look at some of the work he's done for the National Farmers Union and other areas as well, you can see very clearly that the Northern Ireland agribusiness sector, which is vital to our economy, has a real opportunity for the future. But we need to realise that we need to embrace this to do this as well. So, again, he's accept I, th I think also as well the fact that these safeguards that we've been talking about and the examples of democratic accountability that they're built into the bill, laid in the clauses. This will allow this the Assembly to have any final say in the changes that they are. And this is important, because unlike things like the protocol legislation, which will have no say in whatsoever, this Assembly will be able to look at the bill as it comes through. It will also be able to modify any targets that are set. will enable the Northern Ireland Executive to set the action plans to do that as well. And it gives us some real democratic accountability to do that as well. Certainly. The Minister also agree that, um, in addition to this being uh, the democratic oversight here in the Assembly, but that any of the carbon action plans which will be produced will only come about after a 16-week public consultation as well, which is crucially important. And I agree. And I think that again shows there is another safeguard being put into this process. And it would be good if the Minister had been able to say that he sees the work that this Assembly is doing and sees the work of this private member's bill and took the opportunity to look at bringing them together. Because we do no service to Northern Ireland at all. We do no service to our economy at all. We do no service to our environment at all, unless we are being seen to be particularly proactive. We have that opportunity to be proactive. Now, I am, sorry, yes, please, Jim. Sorry, no, listen. The member talks about um, responding to communities, particularly the agricultural community, etc. Within a Clause 11 2, the door is slammed shut to all those sectors by virtue of the fact that it says the Executive Office must not propose any alteration which has the effect, whether directly or indirectly, of lowering any target set in this Act. So is it not so much hyperbola to talk about Going forward, we will be listening. When the very legislation that, you, that the members want to take forward slams the door on listening. And may I thank the member indeed for his intervention. As the member will be aware, when we guided his own bill through the Assembly, I think there were 82 amendments that we had, and we made that a much better piece of legislation. And this is an example of why we will have the opportunity to be looking at this as we go forward when it is brought in front of the Agriculture Committee, when it is debated in this chamber, those are some of the issues we should be able to look at and look at them quite closely. Finally, and I just draw my remarks to a, a close here, it will be quite clear that there is a lot of differing views throughout this Assembly and on what we are trying to do with climate change. Many people are quite concerned about climate change and the impact it is going to have on the agribusiness sector. Indeed. Many people have been very strongly lobbied on that. I respect those people's views, and I respect any particular stance they may wish to take. But I will say this. We have an opportunity now, as this Assembly, to do something that is not an orange and green issue. It is not something that deals with the bickering with the Northern Ireland Executive that we have all the time. We have a real opportunity to do something what is right for everybody in Northern Ireland not just now, but well into the future. I commend this reading to the House. Thank you. Thank you. As question time begins at 2 p.m., I think it would be an injustice to Mr John Blair to allow him to have two and a half minutes before interrupting him. Um, so I suggest that the House take its ease until then, and when this debate resumes, uh, the next speaker will be Mr John Blair. The members, just take their ease, please. Thank you.
Okay, uh, members, Tashinam doing you, Keshni for you, Ira Rin and Fubal. It's now time for questions to the Minister for Communities. And just before we go to the first question, I'd like to advise members that questions two and three have been withdrawn. So, first question, I call Mr. William Humphrey. Your question number one. Sir. Thanks very much. Just, um, I've now agreed my final budget allocations within my department, and as I've previously committed to, I have protected the budget for these vital services. There's no reduction in the budget for advice services, including for appeals and tribunal representation, as the department allocates funding for these services through local government. Belfast City Council is responsible for deciding how it allocates funding for the appeals service, including the Belfast City Wide Tribunal Service. I am investing around £6.4 million this year in a wide range of advice, appeals and debt services, and there are no additional monies over and above this amount that could be used to match any increase in funding by the Belfast City Council at this time. Okay, uh, sorry, um, Mr William Humphrey for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Minister, I understand that Belfast City Council has agreed to provide £75,000 for this year and then £55,000 £55, for the following year, subject to due diligence. Can the Minister commit to, in this House, because our answer falls short of that, to supporting in, in kind exactly what Belfast City Council want to do in terms of monetary? Well, we've made the allocation I've made in terms of maintaining the budget that was previously there. That then goes to Belfast City Council in terms of then how that money is used for its ring fenced for advice and representation. Um, so I've had no further requests in, but as I said, the budget that we have is the budget that we've got. Um, there's nothing additional there at this point. But of course, if there's a, I suppose a request made, I'm happy to look at the issues, but it is that we're working within a constrained budget and effect a cut. Um, within the department, but I am glad that we were able to protect this vital funding at this point going forward. Can the Minister give an assurance that funding will continue uh, to support the important work of tribunal representations? Well, I have given a commitment, um, as was previously seen in the draft budget consultation, the full equality impact assessment that I put out. Money wasn't secured um, in terms of the overarching budget, but I have secured it within my own internal budgets um, going forward. I see the vital role of the advice sector, um, not just during the pandemic, but before that as well, and previously as a councillor, for example, in Belfast City Council. So I want to continue to do all that I can to support them and work with them in the time ahead. Keshtig, Matthew Tool. Question from Matthew Tool. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, you'll be aware that last week the President of the Appeals Tribunal, uh, John Duffy, published his report on standards of decision making by the Department of Communities in 1718. In it, he talks about quote, the systemic problem with healthcare professional assessments, uh, particularly relating to PIP uh, and ESA assessments. Can I ask what the Minister is doing in terms of the representations of John Duffy to, simplima- to simplify that process, including whether she and her department are finally considering uh, requiring via legislation that a short GP summary r- report uh, be uh, provided ahead of a- initial decisions are being made? Well, I think yes. I mean, I'm looking at the report. Um, we're obviously going to be providing a response, and I know that that was taken from the start of the PIP process. There's obviously been changes that have been made since then until now, and there will be continue to be changes in that process to make sure that it's working as best as it can for those claimants. And we obviously, going forward, want to announce plans that we want to engage uh, with those who are claiming the benefits. Um, in a more structured way, to listen to their views, to make sure that we continue uh, to make changes in the time ahead, and that's something um, that I'm committing to do. Um, Obviously, we'll be looking at uh, PIP more fundamentally as well in terms of making sure that it is responding um, to the needs of people out on the ground. There are some issues pertaining to parity, obviously, with Westminster, and there are ongoing discussions with DWP. I know there's a green paper, for example, um, that is being looked at um, in, in Westminster as well, and we're waiting on the outcomes of that coming forward also. So, in the time ahead, I will be making more announcements around this area. I call Kelly Armstrong. 
Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you very much for your question so far. I know you, you are committed to the advice um, sector. In 2016, the Deloitte report confirmed that a new funding model was needed for the Belfast Citywide Tribunal Service. Can the Minister mm -hmm. confirm what actions she has taken to move those recommendations forward to ensure that there isn't a postcode lottery across Northern Ireland and um, to ensure that, that any of those recommendations will be aligned across all council areas? Yeah, well, obviously, we work closely with Belfast City Council um, in terms of that work is going forward. Uh, we secure the money in terms of the advice services, and indeed, I'm glad that we were able to do that this time around. Uh, we have continued discussions, and indeed, even with the advice sector themselves, and that's something that we're going to be looking at in the time ahead um, to see what additional or what changes we can make to make sure advice services are. Um, available to people right across the board and across all communities and to look at any particular barriers that may be there to remove those. So we'll be continuing to have those discussions with Belfast City Council, but importantly with the advice sector themselves. Question Jerry Carroll. Uh, Jerry Carroll for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's very disappointing to hear that the Department does not provide much funding for this vital service, which has provided support for tens of thousands of people, including my own constituents. And many will be asking uh, why things have gotten this uh, way this far, uh, why wasn't the funding included in the budget after implementing the welfare reform, why did it take Belfast City Council to match fund half of it, and why can't the department fully fund it for next year? I would ask the Minister what message does this uh, send to advice workers uh, in city wide and also across the north that she hasn't uh, done this? Well, I think, firstly, I have worked very well with the independent advice sector over the last year, and particularly um, through the COVID pandemic. I have engaged that sector um, also, as have my officials. And we have actually invested over $6.4 million per annum into budgets for independent advice because we recognise the importance of that. I do encourage as well councils who obviously look at this issue. And I was in Belfast City Council um, when funding was put into the advice sector as well. The budget is what it is. It's not a good budget that was given, but the, the, the issue is, is that that was given in a block grant. There was effectively a cut by the British government in terms of the budget here. I have raised concerns about that. I raised that any time I'm meeting a minister. I met with a minister from the NIO last Thursday, and again, I raised the issues of the budget, that when they give a flat budget in real terms, that means a cut. Um, I also raised the issue that uh, commitments in New Decade, New Approach, in terms of financing still haven't been lived up to and that they need to be coming forward urgently um, in terms of addressing those shortcomings. So I won't be found wanting. That said, in the absence of a budget being allocated, I have actually protected uh, the money going into the advice sector and I will continue to do that in the time ahead. I call Harry Harvey. Very much, Deputy Speaker. I'll be question four, Minister, please. Thanks very much um, for your question and indeed for the email that just gave more information um, in the Arts Football Club as well. And just am pleased to see the renewed engagement between Arts Football Club and Arts and North Down Borough Council in their vision for a new stadium, which would once again give the club a permanent home in the Newton Arts community. Unfortunately, in terms of funding to develop club facilities, I can confirm that there are currently no capital grant programmes within my department or Sport NI, uh, which Arts Football Club can apply. My advisors have advised the club to register with Sport NI to receive information on future potential funding programmes that may assist them in realising the ambition to develop their new stadium. Arts Football Club may benefit from future potential funding through the sub-regional stadia programme, which was obviously set out in New Decade New Approach. And I have asked officials to undertake a review of the programme to satisfy myself the proposals are meeting uh, not just the current needs but the future needs as well. This refresh and re-engagement review exercise is nearing completion, and the evidence collected through uh, club surveys, strategic one-to-one -one discussions with key stakeholders, and collaboration with the advisory working group have informed the shape and scope of the programme going forward. I intend to update executive colleagues in the coming weeks on the future implementation of the programme, identifying the potential timelines for delivery and the levels of support available to clubs across the north. Mr Harvey, for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister, for your answers thus far. As you know, I have been trying to strike up conversation with yourself on this proposal. And I would like to ask that you would meet with myself and the manager at the proposed site to look 
and listen to the vision and respond with your thoughts on the way forward. Thank you. Yes, always happy to accept invitations from members. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. I thank the Minister for, for her answers. Can she just clarify then, is she saying that there is no budget for the sub-regional uh, uh, stadia in the current financial year? And if that is the case, when does she expect that money to be freed up? No, there is a budget there and a commitment there, £36.6 million for the sub-regional stadia. Um, the exercise that was taking place was to make sure that the initial outcomes of that programme still meet the needs today and there was a refreshment and a re-engagement with sports organisations and a survey. My officials are now tidying up and making a proposal to me on the way forward in terms of that money being spent. Um, and I want to um, present that to the executive within the coming weeks in order then to get the programme up and running. I called Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, I just um, thank you very much for your answers so far. I'll declare an interest because I, I pay sponsorship money into Arts Football Club for their programmes. Um, Minister, I am disappointed um, by your answers so far, but I understand the predicament that we are in. Arts Football um, Club hasn't had a home for quite some time. I was wondering if, you, as you said there, um, the sub-regional stadium money may not actually be money that ARDS could apply for because they have no home at the moment. So I'm wondering, has there been any discussions with the Strategic Investment Board for such capital expenditure for clubs to be able to apply to? Well, at the, currently there's no other capital programme, um, and I mean this is across a number of sport and organisations have engaged heavily with sports over the last couple of months. Obviously, they've been impacted by the pandemic, and they also have played a huge role um, in terms of the pandemic, and no doubt in terms of the recovery. And obviously, I mean, all members here have raised questions, both orally and written, um, over the last year on the importance of sports more generally. And I completely recognise that. The money that we have got at the moment is for the sub-regional stadia. I also recognise and have said previously that that may not be enough in terms of the demand. You're most certainly it won't be enough. And obviously, I will have to keep discussions ongoing with the executive. It will be dependent on the budget and what's available and measured against other pressures in health and education uh, more broadly. But if there is a need for an increase um, in terms of capital, I will obviously be making those representations and requests to the executive. Um, I haven't had a direct engagement with the Strategic Investment Board, but certainly it's something that I could do, and I would be keen at some point to look at a small capital programme for sports organisations as well, and recognising that not all would fit in um, to the sub-regional stadia, and there's a lot of work that goes on, particularly at the grassroots. Again, we have no budget for that, but I would be keen again to engage with the executive to see if we can find a budget to bring forward programmes because there's no doubt there's a huge need and demand out there within the community, and that's something that I want to continue to engage on. I call Paul Free. Speaker, question number five to the Minister. My department does not hold uh, record information based on constituency. However, the details of the number of personal independence payment appeals pending per town in North Antrim as of the 31st of March this year um, are as follows. Ballymena 310, Ballymoney 98, making a total of 408 people in the North Antrim area who are waiting on an appeal hearing. Mr. Frew, supplementary. Thank you, the Minister, for your answer uh, to my question. And again, uh, to get some sort of comparison with regards to those figures, can you supply uh, numbers for previous years in order that we can get some sort of context to those figures? I don't have those at hand now, but I can write to you formally, um, Paul, just with an update on previous years. Item, sir, Liz Kimmins, point your cash to call Liz Kimmins for I thank the Minister for answer so far. Minister, I should be aware of the importance of ensuring that those going through the appeals process um, are not suffering financially. Can you therefore outline what steps you are taking um, to ensure that this is not the case? Thank you. Yeah, obviously, uh, mitigation uh, payments are continuing for those appealants who are awaiting the outcome of the appeal. Um, and where the initial claim was for disability living allowance or those transitioning um, to PIP as well. 
Uh, my department obviously has advised appealants who are experiencing financial hardship to make contact with their local office as soon as possible, and then also obviously to engage with the independent advice sector as well. Obviously, we want to address the backlog in hearings, and obviously part of that uh, was because of the uh, coronavirus um, and because we had to suspend face-to-face -face hearings. We have been transitioning and obviously rolling out a number of pilots in terms of telephone assessments and also looking at uh, doing it virtually. Again, though, it has to be down to what the claimant wants, and we still know that the majority of those prefer face-to-face -face assessments. So, obviously, we're working with the appeal service in terms of trying to deny as easements are coming in around regulations, how we can start then to safely reopen face-to-face -face and to deal with the backlog as soon as possible. Call Jim Allister. Thank you. The figure from Bellamina of 310 is particularly disappointing. So it doesn't surprise me that my office has an appeal next week, which has been waiting for 14 months. Uh, I would like to know, could the Minister supply the average waiting time in North Antrim for an appeal? Because certainly it seems to be something that needs taken under control, and the return of face-to-face -face would be a major step forward. I don't have the exact waiting time, but I can furnish you with that um, in a written response. Um, I do know the caseload, obviously, from the 31st of March this year was 8,639, and as of the same period, 6,067 uh, live PIP appeals are in the system, which makes 71 per cent of the overall caseload. As I said, a big part of that was obviously because appeals completely shut down during the pandemic. Um, which started in March of last year. I know the Appeals Service extended that um, at the start of this year with the new restrictions that had come in over Christmas. And there's no doubt that that has led to unacceptable levels in terms of appeals. Officials are now working with the service um, and working with the advice sector as well to look at how we have a safe reopening, how we can increase the capacity around trying to deal with those as soon as possible. And have also been rolling out a number of pilots, as I've said, around telephone assessments and also to do it virtually. But again, recognising that the majority of people still prefer face to face, and if that's what they prefer, we have to deal with that as well. So I am hopeful with the ease and of more restrictions with these pilots, with obviously jobs and benefit offices and others beginning to open again um, with the easing, um, that we can start to deal uh, with this and get people uh, through the process as quickly as possible. But I will furnish you with the specifics of your question in a written response. Here, Mr. Mark Durkin, for your cash, I call Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Durkin. I would to thank the Minister for her answers thus far. The number of appeals, and more so the number of successful appeals is clear evidence, in my view, that the system is not working. Uh, many parties, including the Minister's own, have been correctly, in my view, scathing about Capita's uh, performance. Can the Minister inform the House if she will be extending Capita's contract, how that might look and how much it might cost? Well, those issues are currently being looked at at the moment. I recognise um, the issues that have been around the assessments. I recognise public opinion around some of these issues as well. Um, but in terms of moving, I have also indicated that my policy position would be to move towards an in-house model um, and what that would look like. I mean, previously, the in-house model was working with local GPs. Again, there were difficulties that were presented there. We are also looking at the Scottish model, where they work with health trusts. And again, we have had engagements with the health minister. But again, there has to be changes that are made there. For example, the system in which people are recorded are done differently depending on which health trust. There is no one database the way there may be in England. And we found this issue around the food distribution service when there was not that single database. And I know that that is going to take a bit of time for health to put that in place. Um, but I am keen um, that a policy is taken that we transition and move to an in-house service. Again, we are trying to work out the timelines of that at the moment. Once I have made a, a decision around that and on what those timescales will look like, I will certainly update the House and the Committee in the time ahead. call Rachel Woods for her question. Question number six. Thank you. So it's just people who remain in receipt of legacy benefits and credits will be moved on to universal credit in the next phase of the rollout known as Move to UC. 
Prior to the COVID-19, uh, my department notified stakeholders here that the planned commencement date for move to UC uh, would not be before January 2021, with an estimated completion date of September 2024. Planning the move to UC was temporarily paused to allow my department to focus all available resources on responding to the COVID pandemic. And as you will know, universal credit figures more than doubled here um, in terms of those who needed it. And again, we had to respond to make sure that people were paid. A start date for the commencement of move to UC here has not been confirmed. And I have asked my officials for an assessment of the optimal timing for the move to UC process to recommence here, and will bring forward proposals for doing so at the earliest possible opportunity. Stakeholders will also be updated when plans are more certain. Rachel Woods for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. The Minister will be aware that the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions recently announced that the process for moving legacy benefit claimants onto universal credit would be completed by 2024. So could the Minister confirm us if this is the timeline that her department would be working to in the coming months, and also if she'll be engaging further with the independent advice sector, um, as they will be able to enable them to support uh, the claimants who will need help transferring to uh, or not to universal credit in the coming years? Well, um, obviously, I mean, as I just said, there's obviously there was a pause in the move, and that may disrupt the timetable in terms of that final date. Um, I know, obviously, my officials are working closely with the Department of Work and Pensions in Britain in terms of that timescale. That's why I've asked for an assessment um, in terms of recommencing this process and then how long that will take, and that will be for ministerial approval going forward. So once I have that assessment, I will then make a decision in terms of when that's likely that we can commence that work. And of course, that will be done um, engaging stakeholders, uh, looking at the implications, because obviously, I mean, this is going to be a huge change um, for thousands and thousands of people. And obviously, having that independent advice for people as they're transitioning through will be key in making sure the capacity is there. So we'll be doing that with engagement with the sector. And then I'll make my decision after that and again notify the House. Here, Mayor Martina Anderson, for your case, to call Martina Anderson. Minister, can you give assurance to my constituents in Derry and to others across the north that those that are being transferred from legacy benefits to universal credit will have a transitional protection? And what would that transitional protection be? In terms of, we're looking at these issues um, at the moment by way of transitional protections as well. Um, in terms of moving over, some people indeed will be financially better off uh, with a move to universal credit, and obviously we want to work with those in the time ahead in terms of looking at the implications as part of that transitional period. So we're continuing to look at that at the moment. It's part of the transitional assessment that I've asked officials to look at. Uh, once I have that assessment back, then I will come back and update the House. And I can also sorry, correspond with you directly as well. Uh, the member isn't in their place for the next question, so I call uh, Christopher Stolford. Question number eight, sir. <coughs> Yet, through the regional stadia programme, my department has grant funded the three sporting codes to deliver their respective stadia. Community engagement is an important element of the delivery. In anticipation of planning approval for Ulster GAA, um, is finalising details proposals for a fresh engagement within the community. The GAA is clear on the importance of being a good neighbour to the community around Casement Park and more broadly. And I have regular engagement with the Ulster Council GAA project team who are involved in the stadia development in relation to the fundamental element of this project. Mr. Stolford for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the I had no anticipation of being called in question number eight, so I congratulate the Minister on her brevity in getting this far down the list. Um, having said that, the Minister has failed to answer my question. I asked her which, what engagement she or her department has had with local residents around the area uh, in relation to this development proposal, and does she agree with me that it is important that the views of local residents are taken on board in relation to this matter? Thank you. Well, in terms of the engagement, the project overall is owned by Ulster Council GAA, and obviously I have been encouraging the GAA to have engagements. That said, there's the plan and approval hasn't been complete yet, and obviously we need to watch in terms of the type of engagement until we know that the plan and approval has been granted in full. 
I have been engaging with the GAA um, in terms of the programme board um, that have been established to look at the redevelopment of Casemon Park. And obviously, my background just in community development, I have said that they need to be engaging proactively. I know they have an engagement strategy there um, that once planning has been approved. I have had no direct engagement personally um, with the residents group there, either those who are opposed to it or those who are in support of it as well. Obviously, I am waiting on planning permission um, to be approved because I do not want to do anything um, that would be that would have an impact on that consideration um, going forward. But there will be, and I have been pushing the GAA to have a comprehensive engagement and also working with Belfast City Council and the Department to look at the wider issues, but also the opportunities um, that this redevelopment can bring. As you will know within your own constituency, um, what the development of Windsor has done for the community there. From uh, the last can call you. Um, could I ask the minister for her assessment on the, some of the benefits that, um, in her opinion, the Casement Park development will bring to the wider community of West Belfast, but also more broadly um, to the Gaelic Games and culture? Thank you. Well, I think firstly, if you go up to Casement Park, I mean the state that it's in at the moment, and I know certainly Antrim Gales and somebody who's been a camogie player in the past. There is a huge aspiration and demand to see Casement Park revitalised and redeveloped. Obviously, the construction jobs um, as an immediate um, impact is something there in terms of the scale um, of this infrastructure. It's actually one of the biggest infrastructure projects that this executive would take forward in this mandate um, once the approval is signed off and going forward in terms of the direct jobs that would benefit from it. The redevelopment of the whole wider Anderson's town area. Um, I mean, when you look at the fall road from the bottom right up, there have been huge developments over the last 10 years in the west of the city, um, and indeed this will be one of the signature projects um, when you just look at the, the frontage of that road. Obviously, as part of the wider community impact, and this is where I've been working with the GAA, that we want to see a wider impact, just not for Gales, I mean, in terms of playing in a stadium, but also for the community as well, and how this pitch can be used, how the facilities can be used um, by other sports organisations, but indeed by the wider community as well. So there will be huge economic benefits, but also social, cultural and sporting benefits as well for the community. We have seen that. Uh, with the other two stadia that have been developed in terms of the partnering that they have done in terms of the outwork that they have done with local sports organisations and growing their own sport, particularly around women, those with disabilities as well. Um, and I am hopeful that the redevelopment of Casement Park will also bring good opportunities um, just as it was done at the other two stadia. Matthew Tool for Anya Kesht. Matthew Tool for. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister Casement will be a huge benefit, not just for uh, for Ulster Gales, for Antrim GAA. It's, it's hugely overdue and welcome when hopefully it gets built. But the potential could go much wider than that. It could be global. Uh, there is at the minute plans for a joint British-Irish World Cup bid for 2030. The truth is that Casement Park will probably be the only stadium in Northern Ireland that would be capable of hosting World Cup games. Minister, what representations are you making with the IFA, the FAI, the FA in London in order to place Casement Park at the centre of that potential World Cup bid and potentially bring World Cup football to Belfast? Yeah, I think, I mean, thank you for your question, and you're right. It would be the stadium that would actually really advance in terms of that competition. Obviously, the Minister of the Economy takes the lead on the engagement that's happening with London, um, but in my capacity as Sports Minister, um, we have been engaging proactively with our officials and also in engaging with the Minister in terms of uh, saying what the potential of uh, facilities such as Casement can do as part of that bid. So we'll continue to keep that engagement going. Um, but primarily it is the Minister of Economy that represents the executive with regards to um, the I suppose the making the application for the games. Uh, Adam, sir, Justin McNulty, I call Justin McNulty and we'll probably just have time for the Minister's answer on this one without the supplementary. Thank you. Yep, you are aware that the sub-regional stadia programme for soccer is a priority, a new decade, new approach, and consistently confirmed my commitment. The programme does provide a real opportunity to 
deliver um, a wider range of government priorities to address social, economic and cultural needs. I have asked my officials to undertake a review of the programme to satisfy me that the proposals just do not look at the current needs but also the future needs as well. As I have said in response to oral question 4, the refresh and re-engagement exercise is near completion. Um, I am hoping to have that uh, presented then to me, and then in the coming weeks I want to make a presentation to the executive for saying off and for that programme to go forward. Additionally, department officials have also worked with experts in an advisory group comprising of key stakeholders from Chief uh, Leisure Officers Association, the IFA, the NIFL, Sport NI, and indeed my department as well. And this has ensured a collaborative approach to developing the shape and the scope of the programme going forward. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, can I ask the uh, Minister for a timeline for when she will create a fund to encourage the creation of changing places, which are state-of-the-art facilities for those with severe disabilities in buildings uh, across Northern Ireland? Yes, yeah, so just in 2018-19, my department um, has been working in partnership with the Department of Agriculture and Rural Affairs and local councils and also with the PHA to look at the access um, around changing facilities. A total of 12 new changing uh, place facilities have been supported through this programme at a range of locations across the north. My department is leading on the development of the Executive's Disability Strategy, and obviously as part of this strategy, we have developed a co-design approach with the sector. Uh, the issue of change in places provisions have been included. Obviously, we are working with the Department of Finance to consider how these issues are reflected in the new strategy and the funding that would be made available for them. And subject to that, I will be presenting the consultation, or sorry, the full disability strategy after consultation to the executive in December of this year. Mr. Chambers, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the minister for her answer. And uh, uh, England has created a similar fund with 30 million pounds. Can the minister commit to a proportionate level of funding in Northern Ireland? Well, there are ongoing discussions at the moment um, in terms of finance and looking at what that uh, would mean in the time ahead. Once that has been confirmed, then I will update members uh, going forward. Gary Middleton for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware the recent figures have highlighted that 400,000 people across Northern Ireland are living in po poverty. 27% uh, of those are within the council area in my constituency, in Londonderry and Strabane. Uh, what is the Minister going to do, or, or what is the Minister going to do differently to try and tackle these shocking figures? Well, I think the figures around poverty are well known. I think everybody has seen that they have been exacerbated and highlighted as a result of the pandemic. Obviously, I had responsibility in terms of bringing forward an anti-poverty strategy, which also includes children's poverty um, as part of New Decade, New Approach. We established an expert panel. Their report was published in uh, March of this year. Um, and now we have established a co-design group working with community organisations, experts involved in this field, both in children's poverty and also poverty more broadly. We have also established a cross-departmental working group because it's recognising poverty just doesn't rest within my department. It spans rights across. And even in, I know, the Health Committee last week, there was a report looking at health inequalities um, and where those numbers have actually got worse rather than better. Um, so, again, we are working across government to look at what comes out of the co-design approach, um, how that is going to be funded, how departments can take a lead on certain aspects of that. That will then go for public consultation. Um, and then I am hoping the timeline is for me to present this strategy along with the other inclusion strategies for sign off and approval in December of this year. There is obviously also ongoing work, um, and I have also got obviously papers in around welfare mitigations and, and looking at other protections as well, and indeed the whole housing transformation that we are trying to do, recognising that housing plays a fundamental role, and again, looking at areas like FOIL, uh, where there are high levels um, of those in housing need, I want to introduce ring fencing that starts to address the housing crisis in the likes of FOIL in north and west Belfast and in other areas as well. Supplementary for Gary Middleton. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her uh, response to that question. The Minister will also be aware that there are particular challenges often within our rural communities, and it's something that I have heard time and time again about the, the, the difference in terms of some of the more urban communities and the funding available for rural communities. So would the Minister commit to looking at addressing and putting a focus on how we bring uh, our rural communities up to par with many of our urban uh, villages as well? Yeah, no, I think it's a, an important point, and all that I'm looking to do bringing forward is making sure that we are rural proofing our policies and our spend as well. Um, and that will ultimately mean, obviously, a change in spend or how money is allocated, for example, through councils and other mechanisms as well. But I am committed um, to looking at all of these issues. I've also wrote in terms of regeneration functions, I mean, primarily mine is within the department as a focus on urban settings. Um, and I know that many members have uh, written to me even recently in terms of looking at rural settings as well. I have engaged with uh, the DERA Minister and also infrastructure around trying to get a joined up approach, looking at rural um, issues and uh, I suppose rural inequality. Um, they have been positive. I know we did do some funding during the pandemic to respond to the needs of the rural community. Um, and it's something that we're going to be bringing forward soon. So I've asked for a meeting with them. We're doing an assessment in terms of that rural proofing, and hopefully we can bring forward an announcement between the three ministries in terms of making a change in those areas. And of course, as part of the housing programme, again, looking at specific rural needs. Um, we have obviously met with um, community organisations as well in rural areas, again, where these issues have been consistently raised. So, in working with the other ministries, we want to bring forward then proposals as to what we're going to change um, in terms of addressing the issues. Question for Melissa McHugh. Last one, Carla. Ira, could you set out for us uh, your commitment to and plans uh, to increase social housing? Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, I know this has been raised on a regular basis. There was the statement by Carl Nicollin when she was in this position last November, which set out a trajectory of what we need to do um, around housing in the time ahead. And obviously, there are huge changes around revitalising the housing executive, ensuring that it deals with its historic debt issues, looking at the £7 billion deficit that it needs just to maintain its current stock, and also allowing it to build again. Um, freeing it up. So obviously there's been we have established a programme board with the Housing Executive and Strategic Investment Board around looking at what those models and options look like. Obviously I want to try and do that, retaining the current setup of the Housing Executive, and that's something that we're looking at at the moment. We have had a good result on the corporation tax, where the Housing Executive over the last six years was playing over £56 million in corporation tax. We have now been exempt from that and we are trying to claw some of that money back whilst also dealing with the historic debt. And then we are also looking at a, we're going to be going out to consult soon on a housing supply strategy, so looking at the supply going forward um, in the time ahead, looking at issues around right to buy, around ring fencing, um, and then also looking at um, an exercise to identify surplus land and again working with local councils around them identifying public land within their council areas to address the issue of housing. And we also want to work, uh, we're starting to work with the housing executive around looking at towns and city centres above the shops. Are there other things that we can be doing? And even to um, buy back some homes um, as well, to introduce them again into the public housing market. And this year going forward, I mean, I'm glad we've seen an increase in the housing budget by £26 million. So this year's budget is £162 million. Also, within the 2020-2021 period, uh, we had an increase, uh, the first of its kind in a decade, in new social homes started. So we had 2,403 homes, um, and that's something that I want to look at in the time ahead to make sure that we can build the capacity and also to have the finance to look at an increased um, housing development uh, over the next period. Okay, Melissa McHugh, supplementary from Melissa McHugh. Okay. Good uh, I uh, thank you, Minister, for your statement, and you're to be congratulated, as is your department as well, too, for uh, the uh, objectives that have been achieved to date uh, in terms of the completion of new social housing and the very fact that you have exceeded uh, targets in both the commencement and the completion. Can I also ask you, Minister, then, that what steps? Uh, are you taking in order to ensure this trajectory uh, continues in the future? 
Well, as I say, we have set up programme boards in terms of bringing forward uh, proposed models on the way forward to deal with some of the historic debt issues, some of the finances around the housing executive as well. All of this work um, will culminate in the time ahead in a proposal with time scales and with finance attached that I will be presenting to the executive before the end of this mandate for sign off and approval. I'm also, as I said, moving on um, engagements and on consultations around a supply strategy um, for the North as well, and I'm looking to introduce things such as ring fencing, which will be done within this mandate. Um, but the longer term challenges will be presented in a comprehensive report to the executive before the end of this mandate, and work is well underway um, around developing that. As the member is in his place for question number four, uh, Buggy Mishere will move on. I guess uh, Adam, sir, or Leah Flynn for any cash. I call or Leah Flynn for a question. I'll ask, can I call you? Uh, Minister, can I ask what your plans are, if any, to legislate to ensure the people and families who are living in the private rented sector um, will have a safe and secure home? Yes, I will be bringing forward. I have a proposal currently with the executive for the first strand of legislation to build in extra protections for those living in the private rented sector. And obviously, when you're looking at the revitalisation of housing and what needs to be done, I mean, there's more children and families now living in the private rented sector than in the social sector, and it's a huge area in terms of the conditions, in terms of the safety standards um, of those people. So part of the legislation will look at the health and safety within a home, look at electrical checks, carbon monoxide alarms being inserted in. We're also drafting um, other legislation within the private rented sector to deal with issues such as letting agents and having a longer term review, but there's consultations and engagements that need to happen um, around those other areas of work, and particularly around the rules of councils and enhancing their rules around enforcement um, issues as well. So the first part of that legislation, I'm hoping, will be signed off soon um, by the executive in terms of bringing forward um, a bill, and then we will be drafting and working on a supplementary piece of legislation before the end of this mandate as well. Supplementary question for Minister, you partly answered um, my, my supplementary question there. It was just around. Well, first and foremost, delighted to hear that that legislation is being prepared for and is going to be progressed because we know the amount of families that are living in substandard housing accommodation and it's not fair, it's not right. Um, but can you maybe elaborate a wee bit more on the detail of the timeline of how that legislation um, will, will progress? So maybe just some more around maybe dates. Yeah, well, the first part of the legislation I wanted to be completed by the end of this mandate, so obviously engaging with the Communities Committee. I've highlighted um, a number of pieces of legislation that I want to bring forward by the end of this mandate. So it will go through the normal process of introducing legislation, go to the Committee for consideration. Um, and so I would be hopeful by the end of this mandate we will have that legislation in. So that's the timeline that I'm working to in order to bring those protections in for the residents, as you say, living in the private sector. Dear Mayor, Liz Kimmins, for your cash, I call Liz Kimmins. Thank the Minister for answer so far. Minister, can you detail how organisations such as charities, voluntary groups and sports clubs will benefit from the legislation changes um, regarding lotteries? Yeah, well, I was glad to bring forward this change in legislation to allow those organisations to sell uh, lottery tickets online for fundraising activities. This primarily came from a, a request from NICFA and from the sector themselves, who asked us to look at this and the impact, obviously, that the pandemic has had on the ability of charities and others to fundraise and to look at more flexibilities um, that can be built in. So I'm delighted that we've been able to make this change um, and that from here on in, those organisations then can fundraise through ticketing and through lottery schemes um, going forward. So it lifts the block, and it's something that the sector wanted. Thank you, Mr. Lintag. and and thank the minister for answering. I think it's important to welcome the minister's commitment in addressing this issue, as it does open um, vital funding streams for. For many organisations, particularly as we come out of the, the current pandemic, um, can you therefore provide an update on any other supports available um, to help community, cultural, and sporting organisations through this pandemic? Yeah, well, overall, the department's invested over 306 million um, as part of the COVID monies over the last year. 
A large part of that was going into food support, was going into the community support programme that runs through councils, and we've been working collaboratively with councils, who then ultimately work with community organisations at the grassroots. I stood up a community's um, emergencies leadership group involving grassroots organisations and also strategic organisations that have helped us craft our response to the COVID pandemic and also to look at the recovery. I met with that group just over two weeks ago in terms of looking at the social recovery going forward. And obviously, we're bidding at the moment in terms of COVID monies uh, going forward in terms of looking at um, the restrictions being eased. So obviously, I want to continue to try and support the sports sector um, the charity sector, the community development organisations as well, and also our culture, arts and heritage sector going forward. So I have been making bids to do with the COVID money to try and look at that in the time ahead. And one of the areas that we have secured in the budget um, was the £9 million in terms of homeless services as well, particularly as restrictions begin to ease. That may actually um, bring issues to light, um, such as homelessness, and obviously we want to make sure that we're working with the sector and that we have the resources in place to do that. So I'm going to continue to engage uh, moving forward. Okay, members, time is up for topical questions. Uh, if you just take your ease while we change to the next item of business. Thank you. Order members, we now move on to questions to the Minister for the Economy, and I call Jerry Carroll. Number one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for his question? The University and College Union (UCU) requested a meeting with me in uh, June 2020 relating to the Further Education Advisory and Oversight Group, which I established in relation to the reopening of colleges. I was unable to fulfil this uh, due to diary commitments. Following the commencement of pay negotiations, further meetings have been requested in relation to the negotiations. However, it would not be appropriate for me to meet the UCU in these circumstances. These are negotiations between the employers, the colleges, uh, and the trade union side. I hope that we can find a resolution uh, to the current situation. Both students and lecturers have had an extremely difficult time over the past year, and in order to make recovery, we need to focus on skills and the economy, and we need uh, the, everyone uh, to work together to do this. I call Jerry Carroll for something minute. Thank you, Minister, for answer. But Minister, I and many workers in the ECU find it frankly insulting and offensive that you refuse to directly meet them and their reps. At any time, at any level, this is unacceptable, but especially in the middle of a pandemic where workers have worked through it in dispute with their employers. I am currently an FE that are in this, uh, on taking strike action. Not only are you refusing to meet unions and their workers' representatives, but you and your officials have been meeting employers in the same period, meeting one side in a dispute. Come this question, How can people, these workers and UCU members, have any faith in you being objective and impartial if you are only meeting and refusing to meet one side? 
Again, um, I would refer uh, the member to um, my uh, previous answer. Um, it is inappropriate um, to meet um, with uh, the union at this particular stage. Um, I and the department will have to act um, with a degree of objectivity in relation to the outcome of those negotiations and the business case that will uh, be brought forward following the negotiations. I would urge both sides to redouble their efforts to bring uh, this to a conclusion. I have already notified the Finance Minister um, and the Department of Finance that uh, there will be a need for additional funding uh, following the conclusion of these negotiations. It is in everybody's interests, lecturers and students, to bring this to a speedy conclusion. And I wish them well in doing that, and I will do my best to work uh, for uh, that end once those uh, negotiations have come to a conclusion. I call John O'Dowd. I would like to and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, I accept a point that it is not the role of the Minister to negotiate in, in relation to industrial disputes. But a meeting with the Minister, whether it is the employer side or the trade union side, can bring a certain atmosphere to negotiations which allow them to be successful. So will the Minister reconsider not meeting the UCU? And I would also urge her to reconsider not meeting the Students' Union, who are also an important voice in our further and higher education lobby. Um, as I say, <clears throat> I can only refer uh, the member to my previous uh, answer. I do believe that it is important that we are objective in our role, that we fulfil that role that is a legal responsibility uh, to the full, um, and that uh, the employers, the further education colleges and the unions can make an appropriate agreement. If that happens, I will not be found wanting in trying to resolve the outstanding issues. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, given the flexibility of Zoom, Minister, um, would you commit today to meeting the students' unions uh, in order for them to discuss their particular situation um, in relation to uh, COVID uh, supports? Um, well, of course, um, as the member knows, I do many, many Zoom meetings in the course of a day, um, and um, those sometimes can be very hectic and back-to-back. -back. I have met uh, the students' representatives. I will, of course, meet them in due course again, um, and I know that they have been through a difficult time over the past year. That is why I have moved to provide the supports that we have, the most generous support package in the whole of the United Kingdom for students here in Northern Ireland. Moving on, call Mike Nesbitt. Question two. Can I thank the member uh, for his questions? Um, I met uh, with representatives uh, from Excluded NI in September, um, along uh, with um, Stuart Dixon. Um, since then, my officials have continued to engage with them and indeed other organisations as we have developed the COVID-19 supports that local businesses uh, have found uh, invaluable. I will continue to engage with a diverse range of representative organisations as we now focus on economic recovery through the Economic Recovery Action Plan. I call Stuart Dixon. Sorry, Mike, that's for supplementary. Apologies. Hi. How very dare you. I thank the Minister. Uh, for, for the answer, I think Excluded NI would be interested to know, with regard to the uh, COVID restrictions business support scheme Part B, uh, when your department intends to release payments for the period beginning the 31st of March. Thank you. Um, my department have, uh, of course, been continuing um, to um, 
uh, release payments in relation to all of the schemes. Indeed, um, only recently we sought executive agreement for the extension of Part B of the scheme um, that he refers to so that people could avail of it right up until the 23rd of May when we hope to see uh, the lifting of uh, many of the restrictions that hold businesses back. And Michael Stewart. Um, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, and, and thank you, Mr Nesbitt, for bringing forward the question. Um, yes, indeed, Minister, you did meet with Excluded NI, and since that time, uh, sterling work has been done um, in the background between them and many of the organisations and schemes that you have been working with uh, and through. Can I ask you today, Minister, uh, have you further plans to support both the events and wedding industry in Northern Ireland as we emerge from the, the COVID pandemic, uh, and how they will fit into your recovery plans? Well, the member quite rightly um, identifies some of the very core issues. In Northern Ireland, we have identified and plugged gaps of support that were not um, and have not been plugged right across uh, the United Kingdom. So things like the Limited Company Director Support Scheme, um, which uh, to date has paid out £10.1 million, um, has been a very invaluable scheme uh, that uh, was recognised as a gap in the support um, that uh, we had put together. Um, in relation to events and weddings and so on, it is um, absolutely clear that the best way to support all of these um, aspects of our economy is to have our economy open, functioning and operating normally. I look forward um, to the 24th when I hope that we will see another step change in that reopening and that recovery, um, because that is where people want to be um, and that is where we must uh, support um, sectors of the economy. I call Gemma Dolan. Minister, the stringent criteria applied by your department in relation to the recently self-employed scheme excluded those who became self-employed after March 2020. In light of the £2.5 million underspend in this scheme, will you now consider widening the criteria so that more newly self-employed people can receive support? Again, can I uh, thank the member for her uh, question, and she will um, acknowledge um, that we looked at the newly self-employed support scheme a number of times um, and widened and extended the criteria so that it um, actually included a wider um, range of people. Um, we now have um, around um, 3,009 applications to that scheme. 2,481 have been paid, and that totals 8.7 million. This has been an invaluable support to those who were newly um, self-employed and who missed out um, on uh, aspects of the core COVID uh, recovery schemes. As I said uh, to Mr Dixon, the focus now should be for my department and indeed for this House uh, more generally um, to actually get uh, the recovery up, going and running as fast as we can. Today, almost 100,000 people still rely on the furlough scheme for wages in Northern Ireland, and we can only reduce that number, and we can only stave off a spike in unemployment if we get the economy open. And I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your question so far. Minister, how many businesses have had their applications to C or BSFs, uh, Part A and Part B, rejected? Um, I um, can, of course, write to the member with this precise figure um, in relation to that. Um, but we have up until uh, now paid out 83.3 million. Um, part A, that has included over 6,000 uh, applications. 5,086 of those have been paid. Um, some have been rejected and some are still awaiting additional information. But I will write to you with the absolutely specific uh, figure in relation to that. In relation to Part B, 
2,387 applications have been submitted, 1,551 paid, and that again is for the same uh, reasons, um, either a lack of information or ineligible under the criteria. Um, I do commend the staff at InvestNI, who um, have generally responded very efficiently to queries from, I think, members of this House and indeed members of the general public and the level of funding that they have actually put into the economy, which I think through grants at the moment stands at around $120 million that they have administered. Moving on, I call Gary Middleton. Question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Speaker, um, I would ask for your indulgence and to have just a one minute additional to answer this question because I think it is fundamentally important as we go forward. So can I thank uh, my colleague for uh, his question. Since I launched my Economic Recovery Action Plan on the 25th of February, I have been successful in securing an additional $286.8 million um, in the 2021-22 year to deliver this Economic Recovery Action Plan. On the 21st of April, my department hosted a virtual stakeholder event to continue the discussion on recovery because I believe that partnership and collaboration are key to the successful delivery of the actions set out in the plan. On the 30th of April, I announced further details of the High Street Stimulus Scheme and the Holiday at Home Voucher Scheme. Both of these schemes are cornerstones of the plan. The timing of their delivery will help maintain the recovery momentum that has started with the reopening of businesses across Northern Ireland. On the Green Economy Agenda, I have published the Options Consultation on a New Energy Strategy. And this includes progressing key actions relating to renewable energy, energy efficiency, the hydrogen economy and green innovation. On the skills agenda, pilot activity has commenced to test how the flexible skills fund could be utilised to support upskilling. The development of additional upskilling and reskilling interventions is also underway. This is particularly important, Mr Deputy Speaker, when we consider the number of people who are still on furlough or who still have their employment supported through the self-employed scheme. I will continue to work hard to deliver the themes set out in the plan, but it is worth indicating to the House that within this plan an additional £31 million has been allocated to skills, education and support an additional £10 million for university research and development, £145 million for the High Street Stimulus Scheme, £2 million for the Holiday at Home Voucher Scheme, £20 million for advertising and marketing for tourism and hospitality, and £17 million for tourism support programmes, an additional £15 million to maximise North Invest NI's external growth opportunities, and an additional £1 million for cross-border programmes, an additional £6 million for air, to support air connectivity, and innovation and digital innovation, an additional £3 million. Entrepreneurship has, uh, will receive, um, and uh, support for SMEs will receive an additional £3.5 million. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your time. I call Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that detailed update and indeed thank her for uh, taking the time to visit Londonderry Chamber of Commerce very recently. A key element of the Minister's economic recovery plan is the High Street um, stimulus scheme or the, the, the High Street uh, voucher scheme. Uh, can the Minister provide a bit more detail about that particular scheme, which we hope will uh, provide a stimulus to our High Street? Yes, and it was good um, to visit um, in the city. Um, we had a, a lovely day um, and saw some really innovative um, plans uh, to take the city forward, whether that was an innovation at Catalyst or indeed um, down um, on the Loch Shores looking um, at the new uh, environmental scheme there. Really, um, really encouraged. The, as I have indicated, we have £145 million, um, that has been guaranteed for the High Street Stimulus Scheme. Um, we are now proceeding with the procurement and impl implementation of that scheme. 
We have also undertaken some research um, to um, let us um, have some evidence base for when is the best time to roll out that scheme. And it would appear that to encourage spending after the summer months and the, and the initial pent-up demand that we see in the shops now, that at the end of the summer, beginning of autumn, would be the best time to actually roll that out. This will be a prepaid card worth £100 to every adult over 18, and all are eligible to apply. The only stipulation is that it must be used in bricks and mortar businesses in Northern Ireland and not online. It is what it says in the title. It is about stimulating business on the high street and supporting the retail sector, which has um, suffered enormously over the COVID pandemic. I call Keila Archibald. <coughs> I thank the, the Minister for her responses so far and I, I also want to ask about the High Street Voucher Scheme uh, because half of the funding for economic recovery ha is going towards that scheme and last week at the Economy Committee we heard from officials around it and they weren't able to confirm what it could be spent on or where and um, what the economic impact of it would be. So just given what you have said around the timescales for delivering it hopefully at the end of the summer, are you confident that will, it will be ready to be rolled out at that time? We are already well advanced um, in uh, working towards the procurement of the provider for the cards. Um, I would hope that we will be able to deliver that out at the end of the summer, at the beginning of autumn. Um, and furthermore, I want to have the time over the summer to work with uh, local chambers, local towns, local businesses, because we want this to be a scheme that actually supports the local high street. It isn't about um, the, the, the online shop, but isn't about, it is about the bricks and mortar high street. People from our communities who actually have invested um, within uh, their businesses um, and who um, last year were probably closed longer than they were um, open. So um, we will be taking a very, very strong shop local message with the High Street Voucher Scheme um, and will be working extensively with groups, even those who are hard to reach and might find it difficult to access the scheme, to ensure that it is open and available to everyone. I call Sinead McLaughlin. <coughs> Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. And I just want to touch on the High Street uh, Voucher Scheme as well. There are many variables um, in, in this scheme. Uh, but has your department done an impact assessment um, in relation to uh, how, how it is going to benefit the overall economy? And how will we recognise that it has been a success or failure? But I don't suspect it will be a failure. But how, how do we uh, measure that? Uh, and can, if you've done the assessment, will you be a publishing that assessment? I think assessment? there's a number of questions there. <laughs> I, I am, um, this is a scheme that has clearly caught the imagination, not only of people here in Northern Ireland, but actually um, I've been approached about this uh, from Scotland and from a, a very, very wide variety of people. Um, we have looked at and uh, completed a business case around the scheme. Um, we um, will uh, be then doing an impact assessment of the scheme, but where similar schemes have rolled out, it is absolutely clear from the data that have come from them that this has increased spend in the high street. Um, and remember, by the end of, end of August, September, we will see the end of the furlough scheme, potential uh, greater difficulties within the economy, and we want to continue to stimulate the high street right uh, throughout uh, the autumn period and into Christmas. So we hope that there will be a multiplier effect from the scheme, that if perhaps people get £100, they will be actually um, purchasing items that will be, be more than that, and that it will encourage them to continue to support local shops in local towns and local businesses. And I call Michelle McLevin. For Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the member uh, for her question? It is indeed uh, timely and very important. Um, as we mark the centenary of Northern Ireland, we in the department will use it as a time to reflect on our past successes as a small country 
leading the world in shipbuilding, ropeworks and linen production, to where we are now as global leaders in cybersecurity, tech startups, fintech, and with the creative industry sector producing TV and films which are broadcast across the world. The qualities that marked our industrial endeavour in the past are still very much evident today – innovation, determination and vision. And we have seen that in abundance over the past year, as businesses pivot, repurpose production lines or step up to provide much needed materials as part of our response to the challenges of the pandemic. This has been a difficult year for Northern Ireland, and the centenary gives us an ideal platform to showcase everything that is great about Northern Ireland and why it is a great place to live, work and invest, and act as a springboard for economic recovery. Despite the ongoing restrictions in some parts of the globe, we have an ambitious series of events scheduled, including an international investment conference here at the beginning of next year, Invest NI, Tourism Ireland and Screen NI all have a series of events to mark the centenary and give us standout from other regions. As we build our second century, I look forward to working with stakeholders from across Northern Ireland to help shape our future economy and create a place attractive to investors, recognised globally and a place which creates opportunities at home for people from all backgrounds and communities across Northern Ireland. I call Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister confirm whether any bids were made for funding to mark the centenary and to outline what her priorities are as we build for Northern Ireland's second century? Yes, uh, my departments did uh, make bids to the Department of Finance as part of the NDNA process. Um, we have not heard back from the Department in relation to those bids. However, um, we have identified funds within the Department um, which we will use uh, along with um, the Northern Ireland Office uh, to fund the investment conferences um, and uh, the work that we will be doing um, to showcase Northern Ireland. As we um, celebrate Northern Ireland's centenary um, and as we move into the second centenary for Northern Ireland, um, I want that economy to be one um, of innovation, inclusion and, as I said in my uh, first answer, uh, one where people can feel at home and feel that they can have a prosperous and settled life. I call Jim Alistair. I call Jim Alistair. Sorry, thank you. Just didn't hear. Thank you. Um, so the Minister says bids were made. A couple of weeks ago, the Finance Minister told me in this House that he could recall no bids from any department to mark the centenary. So could the Minister elaborate on what bids were made and to what extent, and indeed what funds have been set aside within her department to mark the centenary? And does she agree that it is beyond shameful that here in the seat of government there is not going to be so much as a rose bush to mark the centenary, such as the bigotry The, the member Sinn Féin. has asked a number of questions. Minister. Um, yes, um, I, certainly in relation to the last part of your question, I do think that the coverage I read in the papers over the weekend um, was uh, both petty um, and indeed um, not worthy uh, of uh, people who claim that they want an agreed Ireland for everyone to live in. It appears that it's only for certain folks who uh, organise and, and who conform uh, to what uh, is required. I think that if we are to make this place home, we need to make it a place where we can all live, work um, and uh, express our identity. Um, I have made bids uh, to the Minister. Those were part of the NDNA process, but I have also um, – there was a series of bids in relation to NDNA. Um, but I also have uh, identified funding within my department, which I will use uh, alongside funding that we have secured from the Northern Ireland Office for the investment conference, which I think is hugely, hugely important as we take the Northern Ireland economy forward. Um, I will also um, and have been working um, indeed with the Northern Ireland Office to increase Northern Ireland's footprint globally across the world. Um, and we have secured uh, some more funding 
um, to around 8 million to actually um, have Northern Ireland represented in growing economies across the world so that we can make the connections that help us to develop the economy. Um, our um, arms length bodies in Invest NI and uh, in Screen NI have also a series uh, of events coming up. And of course, one of the important things that I want to revitalise is that ambassador programme across the world for Northern Ireland. Many of the people who come here to invest do so because they have a personal connection or know someone with a personal connection. And we want to really utilise um, that ambassador programme right across the world. I look forward to rolling these out. And of course, everyone in this House will recognise that with Minister's COVID time is up. sorry, well, sorry, just one second. With COVID and restrictions, that has been difficult in a difficult year. I call Matthew to Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We won't agree on the exact nature of uh, what we're commemorating and celebrating centenary, but we all going forward, certainly I want to see maximum investment, maximum opportunity in Northern Ireland. Would the Minister therefore agree with me, given she's talked about an investment conference? that the best way to celebrate the duality and unique nature of this place is to highlight at that investment conference our access to both the UK and EU market of half a billion people via the Northern Ireland Protocol. And will she commit to in in instructing Invest in I to maximise Minister. that opportunity? Minister. I think that we may not agree um, on the centenary of Northern Ireland, but I think we should and can all agree that we want a place that is prosperous for all of our people. I um, am really looking forward to, we are already working on some elements of the investment conference um, that we are going to do uh, at the start of the year, and a little taster of one that we will do in London earlier in the year, um, or at the start of, or at the end of this year. Um, and that's really, really important. But again, the member must realise that investors come to Northern Ireland for a very wide range of reasons. And that includes the skills of our people, the cost base in Northern Ireland, the standard of living, the standard of education. And it is all of those reasons that they come to Northern Ireland to invest, uh, not on just one single element of it. And of course, we have to be absolutely clear that investors come where they have strong supply chains. And if those supply chains are broken by the protocol, then that is a problem as we go forward. And I call Cahill Boyle. The last one coming, Kirst Evercoog. Let her hold question number five, please. Um, can I thank uh, the member um, for his question and, and indeed for his very obvious interest uh, in this particular issue? Project Stratum is the largest telecommunications infrastructure project undertaken by my department and will utilise public funding secured under the Confidence and Supply Agreement together with Fibrous Networks Investment to deliver gigabit capable broadband infrastructure to more than 76,000 primarily rural premises across Northern Ireland. Following contract award in November 2020, the deployment of infrastructure commenced immediately. Work is underway in the first five deployment areas, Coal Island, Killyleigh, Ballycastle, Kilkeel and Castle Wellen. And indeed, I had the, the great pleasure uh, of talking to uh, people in Coal Island who had been the first uh, to be connected through this. To date, Fibrous Networks has completed work on some 1,041 premises <coughs> through Project Stratum, with more premises to benefit from access to improved broadband services shortly. Fibrous Networks has a target of connecting approximately 19,500 premises in 2021 and is currently on track to achieve this. In Nuri and Armagh, and I know the me member will be hugely interested in this, 8,101 premises <coughs> will be connected um, under Project Stratum. When this is complete, that will mean that 99.5% um, of his constituency will have access to superfast broadband. And that ends our period of time for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Gemma Dolan. Minister, the NDNA 
contain commitments on workers' rights, including ways to create decent jobs that give workers a meaningful voice and input into government policy development. How will you ensure this commitment is delivered on and is and in cooperation with trade unions and workers' representatives? Um, again, I, I want to thank the member for her question and to just inform the House um, that this today, this morning, I actually signed off the final draft um, of uh, the first piece of legislation that we will do in this House around uh, rights for workers, and that is the parental bereavement uh, leave um, bill. And I hope that this will uh, be agreed at the executive this week and will reach the floor of this House very, very quickly. It is hugely important in giving um, parents statutory rights in such a, a difficult situation. The Department is also working on another wider range of uh, measures um, around employment rights. Um, and looking at many of the issues that have come uh, to the fore, and indeed over the last year. Um, and those will include things like hire and fire, a practice um, that uh, is, I think, quite wrong, um, and where employers should take the time to explain what they need to do and how they, if they need to restructure to actually do that without impacting on workers' rights. So we will be bringing a much wider range of measures which will cover a wider uh, range of employment uh, rights um, in, as, as soon as we get the first piece of legislation through, which is the parental bereavement leave. I call Gemma Dolan for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. That's very welcome news about the parental bereavement leave. And on the fire and hire um, issue, Will you commit to bringing forward legislation to end this disgraceful exploitation of workers? Well, as I have indicated, I don't think that this is a practice that many of us in this House um, will support. Um, we want to see people treated fairly, um, in line with the conditions that they have signed up to um, in um, their, their workplace. And uh, right now, if uh, anyone feels that they have been treated unfairly or illegally, um, then I would advise them to seek advice either through the Law Centre or indeed through the Labour Relations Agency, because it is important uh, that we protect um, everyone uh, in this society. As I've said, I'm also uh, working on a wider range of employment issues, and these will come to the House in due course. I call Kiva Archibald. Margaret Laskan Koya and Minister, I, I too um, welcome the, the news about the parental bereavement leave bill. Um, last week, Minister, I had a, a response from yourself indicating that Invest NI had identified over 30 new potential inward investment opportunities since the beginning of the year, which is obviously a significant number. Um, can I ask if you will bring forward a strategy to maximise our potential um, of our unique access to the EU single market and our ability to continue to sell goods into it? Well, as I said in a, a previous answer, um, investors come to Northern Ireland um, for a very, very wide variety of reasons, and that can be around the standard of living, the skills of our people. Indeed, many um, investors that I've spoken to as they come to Northern Ireland talk about that collaboration between university and business that is so important uh, to the future of the economy. Many come because of the clusters of innovation that we now have within our economy. So it is not just about one thing, it is about the whole offering that the Northern Ireland economy can give. And of course, in relation to the protocol, we must absolutely sort out the damage that the protocol is doing to those supply chains and those businesses that I write weekly to Lord Frost about and the difficulties they are encountering with their trade from GB to NI. I call Kiva Archibald. For her response, and, and I'm sure we'd all like to see the, the challenges posed um, by Brexit for businesses being resolved as quickly as possible. Um, a report recently from FSB in Britain showed that 10% of businesses that were surveyed were looking for warehousing space here in the north. And last week, Manufacturing and I published a survey which showed nearly half of businesses were wanting the executive to identify and secure new opportunities for their businesses. So, do you accept that there is a need for a coordinated strategy to support businesses to respond to the challenges that they face? because of Brexit, but also to maximise the potential opportunities that are there under the protocol? 
Well, of course, many of the, the, the difficulties that businesses encounter are not because of Brexit, they are actually because of the protocol. And they are because parties in this House voted um, and uh, have stridently um, asked for the rigorous implementation of that protocol, even though 75 per cent of businesses in the same survey acknowledged that they had difficulties with their supply chains and businesses um, in GB. So we really do need to look at the whole picture for investment in Northern Ireland, and we need to offer people a holistic uh, view of what Northern Ireland has to offer. And I do hope that government is listening and will listen, and indeed that the EU will stop uh, on this um, stubborn trajectory of punishing Northern Ireland um, and not helping it, um, as it claimed so many times in the past it was willing to do. And now call Michelle McLevine. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I note that the Minister launched a stay at home tourism campaign today. And while I welcome and understand why this was necessary, could I ask the Minister if she would agree with me that we need to see, at the very least, travel opened up across the common travel area and allow our tourism sector to begin marketing Northern Ireland in key GB sectors? Um, I absolutely do um, agree with the member on this point. Um, I today have launched the Northern Ireland uh, uh, tourism campaign for the summer because we know that realistically the vast majority of our businesses and, and the business that comes to our hotels um, and our hospitality sector will be from the home market. So it is to encourage people to explore Northern Ireland, to get out and about and see um, maybe things that they have forgotten about, I lost contact with um, over the past number of years. And I very much hope that that campaign will be successful. However, there is not enough business in Northern Ireland to sustain our economy or to grow tourism if we only rely on the home market. And therefore, it is very, very strange that we are the only part of the United Kingdom that has the guidance um, within uh, the health uh, guidance that uh, if someone should come here, um, that they would have to isolate for 10 days. It is guidance, Mr Speaker, um, but nevertheless impossible to go into the GB market with a tourism campaign with such guidance in place. I look forward to, and I have discussed this issue with executive colleagues, and I look forward to Northern Ireland being treated equally across the common travel area and certainly with those areas in the rest of the United Kingdom. That is important for business. I call Michelle McVean for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her response. But given the rates of infection here in comparison with the mainland, could I ask the Minister what she believes to be the rationale of restricting travel across the common travel area? Um, and uh, again, um, this is a matter I have discussed um, with colleagues. Um, Northern Ireland has a higher, rate, a, a low rate of infection, but comparatively higher um, than uh, England, Scotland, or Wales. Um, and therefore, that cannot be the reason for restricting travel uh, from uh, GB to Northern Ireland. Um, of course, we are wary and want to protect. Um, from um, some of the COVID variants that we have heard about. But again, many of these COVID variants are either um, in the Republic or they're actually um, already uh, in GB um, in Scotland, England and Wales, and yet their infection rates are lower. I don't think that we can continue with this situation. And for the sake um, of our people, um, for the sake of allowing family and friends to visit, for the sake of allowing businesses to grow, and allowing us to get into the GB market with a, a good campaign for the summer, we need to review this across uh, the common travel area. I now call Melissa McHugh. Uh, Minister, uh, in your recent announcement uh, in relation to the holiday at home vouchers, uh, you stated that it would be allocated on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, now, what, in fact, are you implementing there to ensure that it is equality assessed? Um, so it, it is, um, I, and I am really um, absolutely adamant um, that we get to a situation where we are supporting tourism and hospitality because of the absolutely dramatic and terrible impacts on that part of our economy 
um, through COVID. Over 70,000 jobs are at stake in this part of the economy, many of them part-time, many of them with women, many of them with young people who do part-time hours in order to support themselves um, at college and so on. So therefore, within um, my um, Economic Recovery Action Plan, I have a number of schemes um, that are there to uh, support um, uh, this particular sector. The Holiday at Home Voucher Scheme is one of those. There is a budget of two million for this scheme, um, and that is obviously a finite amount of money. Um, and when um, we have, um, I suppose it's done, it's done. Um, so therefore, it will be on a first come, first serve basis. Um, I hope that people will be able uh, to avail of it, um, and I hope that it will continue again, like the High Street Stimulus Scheme, to stimulate demand um, within that part of the economy, so that we continue to help it to recover. I'd also remind uh, the member that we have allocated £20 million for advertising and marketing and £17 million for other tourism support programmes. And this, along with the money that is within the city deals, which will be a medium-term objective of recovery for tourism, will mean that once again we will get to that high water mark that we achieved in 2019. I call Melissa McHugh for a supplementary. Thank you for your answer, Minister. But uh, in your answer, I'm still not convinced that there is any system in place there to ensure that it is a quality assessed one way or the other. But notwithstanding that, Minister, um, can I also uh, continue then that uh, you have also selected a number of tourist attractions and accommodation providers uh, that um, uh, would be part and parcel of. Um, the voucher scheme as well. Now, how will you ensure that that impact is spread fairly throughout the six counties, in particular, I think, again, of my own region in West Tyrone, where there's many a lovely uh, and attractive site there that uh, would benefit from the scheme as well? Well, the objective of this is to try to spread um, the tourism offer and therefore the benefit um, from tourism. And obviously, it will have a dramatic impact on the North Coast and the Fermanagh Lakelands, um, maybe in South Down and, and in other you know, more uh, well-known areas. But this is available to everyone and every part of Northern Ireland and is part of uh, not just the recovery of tourism and hospitality, but it is part of the our aim and objective of what we are trying to do with the Economic Recovery Action Plan of ensure that we have a regionally balanced economy that everyone can prosper in. I call Gurma Ara Privlesh Kankorlia. Minister, we have recently met with um, Fibris, who are obviously the, the provider of Project Stratum, and we have been made aware by people in our own constituency, and I believe this is an issue right across the north, that people have been left out of the scheme because either the LPS had not confirmed that there, were, there was somebody living in the property, but also because speeds that were not accurate were being given to the, the department or to the provider. And people were being told they're getting over 30, when in some cases they're not even getting too many. Can, 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 can you uh, tell us how you're going to address this, please? Um, again, this is a, a really and a, a hugely uh, important area um, who for, for those people who have been excluded from the target intervention area um, and indeed for those people for whom we received um, incorrect uh, data from land and property services. And we are working um, on this particular issue. Um, we are trying to identify additional funding within the state aid envelope that we have for the scheme um, to ensure that we have more funding uh, to bring uh, more people into uh, the, the target uh, area and to make sure that we are not uh, excluding anyone. Having said that, and these are really important issues which um, we are, con we are um, at this moment in the department working on, this is a massive scheme, the largest infrastructure project that has under been undertaken in Northern Ireland. Um, it has been made possible through the confidence and supply funding of £165 million, pounds, with additional investment from Fibrous um, to add uh, to uh, the value of the scheme. Um, and it is exciting 
that at the end of this, Northern Ireland will have one of the most advanced networks in the whole of Europe. And that concludes our period of time for topical questions. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments before we return to the Climate Change Bill uh, and we change uh, those at the top table. Okay, members. Um, I have received notification from members of the Business Committee of a motion to extend the sitting past 7 p.m. under Standing Order 10.3a. Clerk, please read the motion. That in accordance with Standing Order 10.3a, the sitting on Monday, 10 May 2021, be extended to no later than 8 p.m. They call Clerk Bailey to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The question is that the motion standing in the name of the Business Committee be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is carried and the Assembly may sit until 8 pm this evening if necessary. The sitting may now extend to 8 pm should it be necessary. By then, the debate will have had over six hours of plenary time, plenty of time, one would imagine, for the balance of opinion to be expressed and party strengths recognised. The Business Committee and I have therefore agreed that the Minister will be called no later than 7 p.m., the sponsor of the bill no later than 7.30 p.m., and the question put no later than 8 p.m. And I hope all contributors yet to speak will facilitate this approach. And I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to begin 
um, in, in this session by thanking Claire Bailey and her team for taking a lead on this matter on behalf of concerned members. And I also want to commend the wider Climate Coalition Northern Ireland group for their uh, experience, their expertise, their dedication to this bill, and to thank them for their research and preparation and for keeping members informed throughout the drafting process. Those of us who uh, have been involved closely with them will be, I think, forever grateful for, for their contribution and dedication. Um, much of the detail of the bill, Mr. Speaker, has been discussed um, in the opening speeches and subsequent speeches, but I think it's worth pointing out, without going over all of that detail at this point, that it has thus far been a most constructive debate. The bill itself was brought forward when there was no movement on the introduction of a long overdue and increasingly urgent Climate Change Act, and in the context that Northern Ireland is the only region. Um, only region of these islands not to have such an act and associated frameworks, something had to be done. Such a situation could quite simply no longer be tolerated nor defended. Emerging Mr. Speaker, from the catastrophic coronavirus crisis, our immediate priority must be how to avoid further disasters. Like the pandemic, all of us will feel the impact of climate change, but we won't all feel it equally. The pandemic has led by the injustices and weaknesses in our society and in our economy. We have seen the damage caused by governments acting too slowly, chronically underfunded public services and flawed short-term and self-serving decisions. We simply cannot make these same mistakes when tackling the climate crisis. Industrialised nations like the UK, and of course there are others, disproportionately bear responsibility for climate change and millions are already suffering the impacts. Millions of people across the globe are immediately threatened. Climate change is destroying livelihoods, infrastructure and communities, forcing people from their homes, towns and countries. The UN Refugee Agency reported that in 2019, weather-related hazards triggered some 24.9 million displacements in 140 countries across the world. And this does not even include people forced to flee their homes as a consequence of slow-onset environmental degradation, such as droughts, sea level rise and uh, melting permafrost. It is estimated that there could be anywhere between 25 million and 1 billion people at the climate, cha climate change front line who will be forced to leave their homes by the year 2050. This crisis will only increase in magnitude if immediate action is not taken to rapidly reduce carbon emissions. Right here in Northern Ireland, we can and we must play our part. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as a member of the Agriculture Committee, I feel it is pertinent to address the concerns which have been raised by the agri-food sector and have been much mentioned here today. I, along with Alliance Party colleagues, have met with the Ulster Farmers Union on this matter, and so we are acutely aware of the union's concerns and the huge efforts being made by farmers in relation to tackling environmental challenges. The agriculture sector are our greatest ally in tackling this crisis. As outlined recently in my own party, the Alliance Party's policy document, Alliance Green New Deal. Our farmers play an essential role in driving nature's recovery, and matters like cattle grazing and hedgerow maintenance are critical to protecting our wildlife and biodiversity. Across Ireland, climate and soil mean we depend on a grass-based industry. We are very aware of this. Our native grass and trees are crucial for carbon sequestration. Nevertheless, much can and must be done to make the industry more sustainable. With around 20, 25,000 farms in Northern Ireland, most of which are small and family-run, we must support our farmers in embracing, the, embracing environmentally beneficial farming practices, reducing their carbon footprint and better using and protecting natural resources and biodiversity. In fact, I am currently with Aero Committee colleagues working with the Nature Friendly Farming Network on a motion to protect our natural environment and tackle the climate emergency while providing a profitable future for the sector. Future agriculture policies, raised by me recently in Assembly questions, must enable a transition whilst providing nutritious food and increased farm resilience. So farmers contributing to sequestration and taking valuable actions to assist in the battle against climate change must also be assisted as we go forward with new and better ways to reward them for their efforts and to continue to make progress. As we said earlier, and it is worth repeating, that the Climate Change Bill is not sector-specific. All sectors have a major part to play in tackling our carbon emissions issue. 
My colleagues Paula Bradshaw and Andrew Muir will, I believe, refer to other sectors when they speak later in the debate. As we seek, Mr Speaker, COVID-19 and, and returning to that issue, I hope all departments and sectors work together to protect the environment as well as existing jobs and bring forward new green jobs. The Alliance Party is committed to a green and just recovery and an urgent and radical overhaul of the policies and practices which have hindered our progress to date. With that in mind, Mr Speaker, it should be said that the purpose of this Bill and the subsequent outworkings of it should not and cannot be about whose idea it was first or whose policy it most closely embeds or who made uh, additional proposals in the first instance. If there is any issue on which we can and should share vision and ambition and also determination to move forward, then surely the safeguarding the future of our, our planet is that issue. As co-sponsor of the Bill with Alliance Party colleagues, I will be uh, supporting the stage of the Bill, and we encourage, we encourage others to do the same and progress these urgent matters for the good of our people and our future. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I welcome the opportunity to speak in this important debate today. <clears throat> the DUP is committed to addressing climate change and ensuring that this part of the United Kingdom plays its role in reducing emissions. I am a firm believer that, as custodians of our planet, we all have a moral and civic responsibility to care for the environment and do all we can to create safer and healthier spaces in which to live and enjoy. As has already been alluded to, tackling climate change is a commitment of the NDNA agreement. The agreement stated that the executive would introduce legislation and targets for reducing carbon emissions in line with the Paris Climate Change Accord through the bringing forward of legislation to give environmental targets strong legal underpinning. I am aware that Minister Putz has been working on a climate change bill which is in the final stages of drafting and has been awaiting approval to be discussed at the Executive for a number of weeks now. Giving that NDNA makes clear that this is for the Executive to introduce legislation, and giving that the Minister has brought proposals to the Executive, and giving the urgency with which other parties wish to address this issue, I cannot understand why this matter has not so much as been discussed by the Executive. I find it quite bizarre, Mr Speaker, that the parties who tell us there is a climate emergency have not been able to find time to even discuss the Agricultural Minister's draft bill. However, regardless of where the bill originates, the core issues are still at play, namely the need to get a robust legislative framework to underpin environmental targets that, though ambitious, are achievable and do not require us to bankrupt our business community to do so. On this point, I would echo the sentiments of Manufacturing NI who have warned this House to be careful not to destroy jobs and livelihoods by failing to strike the right balance. I have concerns that the bill before the House today does not strike that balance. I come to that view based on the direction provided for by the Climate Change Committee, the independent body ta tasked by this Assembly and the other UK administrations to advise on this important issue. In their recent recommendations on Northern Ireland, they committed or commented on every scenario for achieving UK net zero that we have constructed, Northern Ireland would not get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. An 82 per cent reduction in all greenhouse gases in Northern Ireland represents equivalent effort and a fair contribution to the UK net zero target. The bill before the House proposes a net zero target by 2045, this is something the Climate Change Committee has said is not only impossible but unnecessary to ensure the UK's climate change targets are achieved. It is evident that the bill has little thought for the impact of a net zero target on farm businesses and the wider agri-food sector. Northern Ireland is a significant net exporter of agri-food products with nearly 50 per cent of all agri-food products produced in Northern Ireland consumed in the rest of the UK. It is only fair, therefore, that other parts of the UK, with a lesser focus on food production, 
bear a heavier burden towards meeting the UK target. The EFU regularly remind us that NI farmers feed 10 million people in the UK. Any climate change legislation from this House must acknowledge that. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, and as has already been said, we must get the balance right. This is pivotal. Unachievable targets will be of use to no one. We must tackle climate change head on, but it cannot be at the price or we will have achieved nothing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to um, Gormaga, Kang Corlea, and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this important debate. Um, and I want to commend those who have worked hard to progress this bill, and in particular the Climate Coalition and I, those parties from across the Assembly um, who have supported it to this stage. And, and I'm proud that my first motion of this Assembly term, when it was re-established last January, was to declare a climate emergency, a motion that we worked on with the mover of the, of the bill today and her party to bring forward. And I think a collaborative approach is not only entirely the right approach. It is in fact the only way that we can deal with this existential issue of our time. There is no doubt that we face a climate emergency and biodiversity crisis. Across the globe, there are some very acute impacts being caused by climate change. Melting polar ice caps, increased ocean temperature and acidity, increased sea levels, deaths from weather events, droughts and famines, as well as disease more people being forced into climate refugee, as, ref as referenced by Mr Blair, and threats to global food security. But the impact is also clearly being experienced locally with more extreme weather events. Wind and flooding, as Mr McAleer said about his own constituency, my constituency too was impacted by the flooding in the Sparrens, as well as the wildfires that we have seen over the past couple of weeks in the Morns. This year alone we have had the driest and frostiest April and the coldest May day on record. The 2019 State of Nature report by RSPB outlined that 11 per cent of species on the island of Ireland face extinction. In the UK, 41 per cent of species have declined since 1970, with 26 per cent of species found in fewer places. This is the reality of what is happening around us and what will continue and worsen without action now. In 2016, 197 parties signed up to the Paris Accord a binding agreement which brings all nations into common cause to undertake ambitious efforts to combat climate change and adapt to its effects. More than five years on, we are the only part of these islands without specific climate legislation. In January 2020, in New Decade New Approach, the parties are committed to bringing forward a Climate Change Act. Unfortunately, despite it being a commitment in New Decade New Approach and the expressed will of the Assembly, the era minister dragged his feet in taking the action necessary to bring forward climate legislation, and so the other parties collaborated with NGOs and activists to bring forward the bill that we debate today. Only then did the era minister belatedly publish a discussion document um, through, to bring forward a bill through his own department, and disappointingly those proposals could best be described as unambitious and somewhat leading in terms of how it was written. Within that document, there was no serious discussion about how an Act would operate as an overarching framework to adhere to when creating legislation. Only basic lip service is paid to the idea of a just transition. A Green New Deal isn't even mentioned, and most worryingly, the proposals didn't address the fact that we are an, an island and that these are all transboundary issues. It seems like the bare minimum, and given the Minister has previously denied there is a climate emergency, one can only surmise that is why there was a complete lack of ambition in his proposals. It would have been much better if the Minister had chosen to work with the proposers of this bill in a constructive way. Unfortunately, it seems he has sought to undermine it, and rather than engaging with it, um, the approach has sorry, rather than engaging, and the approach is somewhat disappointing given his office covers environment and rural communities also. The progression of this bill um, is an opportunity to have a really informed debate and discussion about the type of action that is required and how we plan to deliver on ambitious, fair and achievable decarbonisation targets together. We have the opportunity to learn from the mistakes of the Government in the South, who did not engage properly with the rural community and where there is some disillusionment with the actions that are being, imposed or being seen as imposed on communities there. Over the course of the past couple of weeks, like every other MLA in this House, I'm sure, I've received dozens of emails, both supporting and expressing concern in relation to this bill, and I'd like to thank all of those who've taken the time to correspond with me. 
There is no doubt there is huge support for this bill and for climate action. Almost all of the emails I received expressing concerns about the bill have been from our farming community, and they are genuine concerns. I am from a largely rural constituency. I am a former member of the ERA Committee and former chair of the ERA Committee. I worked for almost 15 years in agri-food research, and I worked alongside the industry. I know its importance. I have talked to farmers about climate change. Not only do they understand it, they want to play their part, and many already are. They are the custodians of our land, and given that 75 per cent of land in the north is managed for agriculture, there is much that they will contribute in delivering the type of action that is needed. Our farming community is and will continue to be at the coal face of the impact of climate change. Weather events that devastate land and crops, increased incidence of plant and animal pathogens, including new plant and animal diseases, and pathogens being found to occur in regions where they would not have previously altered growing seasons. All of these things will impact on the profitability of our farmers and agri-food producers. Importantly, it also affects our food security, our ability to feed ourselves sustainably. Our farmers, like all communities, must be supported, and that means financially and also in terms of developing innovative practices and in knowledge transfer to be the most sustainable that they can be. And it's not just in reducing our emissions that will deliver on our greenhouse gas um, um, reduction required. It's also in expanding our carbon sinks. And again, our farming and rural communities have much to contribute and again must be supported in delivering afforestation programmes of native trees and hedgerow management that will not only act as carbon sinks, but also support and improve our biodiversity. These are the things that need to be part of the discussion and central to the action plans being developed. Sinn Féin is completely committed to ambitious climate action. It is what is necessary. Inaction and half measures are not an option at this point. As it stands, we are on our way to a three or four degree increase in pre-industrial temperatures, which would be catastrophic for our planet. Limiting temperature increase to one and a half degrees will be a significant challenge and it will require radical action. Every single time I have spoken on the climate and biodiversity crises and on the need for action, I have emphasised the need for the principles of just transition to be embedded in that action. Climate action has to be based on social justice. It has to be equitable. It has to empower communities. This must be the guiding principle of the climate action we deliver through this bill. So to all those who have expressed their concerns, let me assure you, I hear those concerns. We hear those concerns. This bill is a hugely positive development, and it should be seen as an opportunity. I have talked about our targets being ambitious. They must be achievable. We must be able to deliver on the targets, and doing that is going to require investment in terms of financial support for communities impacted, but also investment in technology, research and development, and innovation, and support for businesses and entrepreneurships. But it is investment that has the potential to pay off hugely for our local economy, and it must be seen as such. In New Decade, New Approach, we also committed to a Green New Deal, and that has to be core to our economic recovery from COVID. We must seek to positively transform the lives of people, rapidly reducing emissions while creating good, decent paying and secure jobs, warmer homes through retrofitting, tackle fuel poverty and deliver healthier lifestyles and more efficient ways of moving around through investment in our active travel and public transport world-class digital and physical infrastructure, and an abundance of renewable and more affordable electricity from our wind and tidal resources. We must create opportunities for young people and for those whose jobs will no longer exist in the way they previously did. This debate today is about the principles of this bill. It is about moving it forward to the next stage at committee, where there will be opportunity for further scrutiny, input and consultation. This bill creates a climate office, a climate commissioner, the bill will establish the requirement for a climate action plan within three years of the bill receiving assent, and then every five years. The climate action plans would have to be approved by this Assembly, and those plans would be subject to public consultation. There is nothing being imposed or done within the scope of this bill that will not be agreed upon by this Assembly. And I believe there is some scope for development to ensure that this bill protects communities in achieving the ambitious targets that are set out within it and the climate action plans that need to take account of our circumstances. 
We need to see a greater focus on transboundary impacts and needs to be developed through in the action plans. We are an island and there needs to be proper account and proper cooperation across the island. It is a very positive thing that the just transition principles are embedded in the Bill and there are references in, paragraph, or in Section 3, Paragraph 8 to reducing inequality and eliminating poverty and social deprivation. I would like to see expressly written into this Bill that achieving the net zero target and the climate action plans must be based on the principles of just transition. I think it is important that we define what we mean by just, transi oh, sorry, excuse me, just transition. At its simplest, it means transition to net zero must happen in a fair way that leaves no one behind. A report for the OECD in 2017 stated that a just transition ensures environmental sustainability as well as decent work, social inclusion and poverty eradication. In fact, it is set out in the Paris Agreement itself. National plans and climate change that include just transition measures with a centrality of decent work and quality jobs. A just transition must be based on social dialogue, as mentioned by Claire Bailey when she uh, moved the bill, and ensure the type of social interventions needed to secure workers' rights and livelihoods when economies are shifting to sustainable production to combat climate change and to protect our biodiversity. I also believe the development of the first climate action plan should be informed through the establishment of a just transition commission involving all partners and representatives of all sections of our society and economy. And again, I would like to see that expressly written into this bill. The Climate Office described in the bill must have meaningful civic engagement as its modus operandum. The type of radical action that is needed to halt the catastrophic breakdown of our planet will mean change. It will require a major rethink on what prosperity means. The ever pursuance of profit and capitalist models of consumption have greatly contributed to the climate breakdown that we face. But we have the power to make change if we act now. We have to be honest with people that change is necessary. We also have to empower our communities, provide reassurance and evidence that climate action will mean job creation and community renewal. We have to lead and we have to manage change. So I am going to finish firstly by speaking directly to those who have concerns about what this bill means for them. We are listening. We believe the, the best and only way to effectively tackle the climate emergency is by working in partnership through informed debate and discussion designed with communities for communities. The type of climate action that we are talking about here today cannot be done on to our communities. We must have maximum buy-in to the plans developed and that is the only way that they will be successful. That is the process that I want to see to deliver on the ambitious, achievable and fair climate change legislation, and that is what Sinn Féin will be working towards um, to ensure as this bill progresses. And finally, when I think about the climate emergency, I think of our young people. I think of those young people on the climate strikes who have been motivated to become activists by their desire to save our planet. Those kids who get on to their parents about recycling and turning off the lights and walking instead of going in the car. The young people who will inherit the planet that we leave. As political leaders, we have to do not only what is politically expedient, we have to do what is right. And protecting our planet for future generations is the very least that we can do. Mr Speaker, I support the bill. Thank you, Cora Margaret. And I call Jim Wells. Mr Speaker, it was a bright, sunny day in May 2017. I thought to myself, I am going to be environmentally aware. I am not going to drive from Lurgan to Banbridge. I am going to take the bus. So off I tootled to my local bus stop in the middle of Lurgan, and there he was, the bus driver, reading his newspaper, the sun, as it turned out to be, and I am not going to bring out any too runny jokes here. He was reading the newspaper. Of course, his engine was on. It was a bright, hot day, and of course, Translink and Craig Ovenborough Council had kindly provided the seating at the bus stop in direct line with the exhaust pipes of the bus. So there I sat as he read his newspaper. Fifteen minutes went by and still his exhaust was going quite merrily. He finished reading his newspaper. He folds it. He walks across the street to his bank. He withdraws some money. He comes back to his bus and then he starts to eat his lunch, still with the engine running. So half an hour of exhaust fumes poured out into the atmosphere. I wrote to Translink about this dreadful waste of uh, energy, taxpayers' money, and the resulting carbon emissions. 
And you'd think I was asking for the impossible to suggest to TransLink that they might ask their staff to turn off their engines when they're waiting at bus stops. And many times since I've seen that. And that's an example of what is going on, the profligate way in which we use energy. We don't have to go too far. In this building, the recording machines for, for Hansard in the committee rooms remained on for three years when this assembly didn't meet. And nobody was prepared to go and switch them off because the planet, the, 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 the roof would collapse upon us if we dared to switch off those machines in the three years in which we didn't meet. Also, I recorded record the hottest day in this assembly building one day. We recorded the hottest day recorded in Northern Ireland's history. And of course, the heat was full on in this building on the hottest day. And all attempts to get the heating turned off fell flat uh, with no success whatsoever. The problem is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, sorry, I'm in off trouble with you without I call you Deputy Speaker. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, that 24% of the energy that we, waste in, we use in Northern Ireland is wasted. It goes down the plug hole. And if we could solve that particular problem, then we wouldn't have to burden our farmers with, high, with very strict emissions targets. We wouldn't have to do very little in the way of increasing our renewable energy demands because we can solve the problem by simply not wasting the stuff we're producing already. But any time a yours truly obscure backbencher from South Down of no great political import, every time I raise this with any authorities, you think it was asking for the sun, the moon and the stars. Nobody's prepared to tackle that absolutely basic point that we could, we could utilise now to protect our planet. This is going to be painful. Bringing our emissions down to net zero, zero by 2045 is going to be painful for all of us, for industry, for private consumers, and for farmers. We cannot reverse the, 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 the juggernaut of climate change without a huge degree of pain for all of us. But as the Honourable Member for East London Day has pointed out, the consequences of not doing it means we may not have an agricultural industry in the future. We may not actually be able to produce enough food to feed ourselves in the future if we allow our planet to go the way that it's going. Now, I have received I don't know how many emails, letters and phone calls about this particular issue. I suspect it's probably only second to the debate on abortion in terms of mail, the amount of mail that's come to me. I've had many, many people in South Down asking me to support this bill and I've had many people, mostly farmers, ask me not to do so. And in fact, I suspect we've all had the same email uh, from the farming community, which I believe was instigated by the Ulster Farmers Union. And of course, it is a fact that what we're asking for will produce pain for the farming community. But we have the mechanisms to deal with that. First of all, everyone so far has said there has to be transition. There has to be protection for vulnerable groups by transition to a net zero target. Indeed, there's also the fallback that any targets will have to be agreed and policies will have to be agreed by this assembly. That we're setting up a framework, uh, Mrs. Bailey's, uh, Mrs. Bill, Mrs. Bailey's bill is setting up a framework, but time and time again, it's gonna come back to this assembly to make a final decision. And of course, this bill is only at the second reading stage. It goes off to the committee for further consultation and scrutiny. And the committee's actually been quite good in this assembly at dealing with complex bills. We're often uh, maligned by the public, but I think in two issues, the ability to ask written questions and the ability to scrutinize uh, bills and legislation and policies through the committees, we've actually been quite successful. Not that anybody's gonna report that in tomorrow's newspapers. So therefore, it goes off to the committee and I have no doubt the committee, led by Mr. Irwin, who is who's, who's one of its uh, prime spokesmen, will scrutinise every jot and tittle of this bill and will pour all over it. And no doubt it will come back to this assembly in a very different shape and form to what it entered the committee as. And therefore there is an opportunity to deal with these issues, these legitimate concerns of the farming community about the, uh, the, the emissions targets. But also we have in Northern Ireland uh, and throughout the United Kingdom, a unique system of farm support. I still call it single farm payments, but I know, and Mr. Irwin, no doubt, being the guru, 
the font of all knowledge in this issue, will point out to me exactly the new terminology that is used, what I call single farm payments. And that is a mechanism which we had heard from the European Union and which we now have control over ourselves. And that can be used as a mechanism to compensate farmers and to cushion the blow that undoubtedly will occur as a result of these targets. Because no matter what, no matter what bill we adopt, be it Mrs. Bailey's bill or be it the Minister's bill, and I've no doubt the Minister's bill arrived very quickly because of Mrs. Bailey's bill coming down, down the, the, the railway line, as it were. Um, so the rush suddenly appeared when Mrs. Bailey's bill was published. Now, no matter which bill is published, there will have to be reductions in emissions from all sectors in Northern Ireland. Now, some would argue that the Minister's bill will be less painful than the Green Party's bill, but it's going to have to be done. So therefore, we're going to have to take the mechanism that we have already in place to ensure that we minimise the damage to all sectors as a result of the, of the emissions targets. And I see the single farm payment as being a way of allowing farmers to adjust to the new landscape by compensating them through a mechanism which has worked and worked very well. So therefore, I don't believe it necessarily means that farmers will be out of pocket, but it will be, it will be painful. Secondly, or thirdly, I'd also say that we do have a resource in Northern Ireland. If we stop wasting energy, which I don't think we will, because I think Northern Ireland, many Northern Ireland people are not happy unless they are wasting energy in some form. But if we stopped using wasting energy, that would make a major contribution. But secondly, we in Northern Ireland, and indeed the Irish Republic, have a unique resource which, if properly utilised, would be a much less painful way of dealing with this climate change issue. And that is that 18% of our land that is covered in peat. Peat covers only 3% of the land area of the entire world and yet stores more carbon than all the other vegetation in the world put together. And we have a vast tract of peatlands which, if properly utilised, could form a carbon store of a measurable, uh, uh, unmeasurable consequences. Because what has been shown is that if you take degraded peatland and restore it by a process known as re-wetting, you can form a carbon sink which can do so much to reduce emissions that are coming from industrial and farming processes. That begs the question, if 18% of our land is peat, and that is the most valuable tool that we have to sequestrate, if I could say it properly, carbon. Why are we still allowing the destruction of peatlands in Northern Ireland? Why are we still giving planning permission for them to be used for peat removal? And why are we permitting them to be drained and burned and damaged when we know we have this essential tool which could save the day? There must be a complete moratorium immediately on all further damage to peatlands. There must be a policy which is only just starting to re-wet those peatlands. Now, I'm aware of the accident project on the Garan Plateau. I'm aware also of the work being done at Coca in, in Fermanagh. And that's a good step forward. But we really need to get our act together in protecting this valuable habitat. Now, of course, we know tomorrow Mrs. Kelly, Dolores Kelly, is um, uh, uh, proposing a motion which is going to deal to a large extent with that issue. But I just wanted to make the point, when we've got two areas where we can immediately take action to reduce emissions, wastage and peatlands, we're not actually doing anything about it. And both are an awful lot, le le an awful lot less painful than imposing restrictions in other parts of our economy. Finally, Northern Ireland is extremely blessed with a lot of wind and a lot of land suitable for solar panels and for tree planting. Again, much less painful ways of dealing with the problem. Now, certainly will. I listened to the member intently, and he's used the word painful uh, half a dozen to maybe a dozen times during his debate. I mean, would he agree with me that in terms of constructing the narrative of climate change, using the word painful is actually doing a disservice to what this bill is about? You know, for, uh, clean energy production, uh, less air pollution, more active travel, 
more green energy, businesses investing in the future, our children and grandchildren having a, a, a much better future isn't painful. But indeed, there are many, many positives that society will gain from the introduction of this bill. It agrees me to say this, but the honourable member speaks a lot of sense. But what, I, what, what I would say is, yes, he's absolutely right that when we get to our final goal, yes, there's, there's real rewards for our community. There's a healthier environment. There's less dependency on fossil fuels. There's less waste of precious resources. But to get from our present position we are today to that holy grail, I think there will be pain. There will be difficult decisions that have to be made. There will have to be reductions in emissions, and there will be a, have to be compensation. To, you certainly will, yes. Will the member uh, agree with me and uh, my party colleague who, who spoke before me that imperative to that is a just transition so that nobody loses out on this path to net zero? It grieves me even further to agree with him on that point. He's absolutely right. Would that <laughs> oh, this is, trouble. is it not just a little too simplistic to say in this uh, situation that no one loses out when we know that our agri-food industry will lose out up to 50 per cent of its production, where we know that meat eaters, of which the member is not one, uh, will find that they are exporting their carbon to import their meat supplies uh, which will no longer be supplied locally. So it is just rather too trite, is it not, to try and suggest that no one will lose out. Um, <laughs> clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. I'm stuck in the middle on my own. Uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, what, what I would say to that point, and I mean, the, the, the member makes a point which I know, I know is one that's held by many in the farming community. We, can, we do have a system whereby we can use the mechanisms we have already to try and ease the pain, and I, that's where I disagree with the honourable member to my right, to ease the pain, which there will be for some in this process. There will be. And I think the farming community, as long as they believe they've been treated fairly, and that if society is demanding that they reduce their emissions, that society is also prepared to use the mechanism they have already to compensate farmers for that, I think They'll, 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 they will join us and support us in what we're doing. But what we can't do is leave the farming community marooned and left behind. Because, as everyone has said, the farming community have a tremendous role to play, a crucial role to play, as we move to net zero. There's no doubt we can't do it without the farming community. And the only way we're going to do it with them is to have mechanisms to ensure that we don't lead to what the member is saying there about a massive reduction in farm incomes that we can compensate them for that. It's difficult, and it's going, to stretch, it's going to stretch everybody in this chamber and the committee, and indeed the minister, to achieve that. But that's the only way forward as far as delivering on a, a, an effective climate change bill. To go back to um, my earlier comment, we have potentially, uh, when I first came into this chamber a very, very long time ago, have anyone had told me that over half of our electricity generation would be achieved through renewables? I would have laughed at them. It was pie in the sky. It was impossible. But that's exactly what we've done. We now have a very, very high rate of renewable electricity generation in Northern Ireland. And that's just wind turbines. What we haven't scratched the surface of is solar panels. And I'm beginning to see these farms uh, starting to be developed now. I know the Honourable Member for North Antrim has a particular problem in his area, and I'll just get retaliation first but in before he raises that issue. But the reality, is, the reality is that Northern Ireland actually has a huge potential for solar, solar panel energy. And even in our climate, which is not the sunniest, it is amazing what modern technology can now do in order to achieve a high rate of renewables. So there's an opportunity for the farming community. But I just want to raise the issue of afforestation. One of the best ways of controlling carbon emissions and, and trying to, to uh, reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is through tree planting. And again, Northern Ireland is one of the least afforestated parts of the United Kingdom, indeed, of, of Europe. And there's vast areas of Northern Ireland which could be used for tree planting. We do already, courtesy of the Minister, have a very attractive a system of grants and subsidies which enable farmers to set aside land to plant trees and the payments are spread over 25 years. 
that should be used to a much higher level in order to diversify farm incomes. But could I say how disappointed I am in the Minister and in the Department? I opened the Farming Life, uh, which uh, Mr Irwin features in at least three or four times every week. I opened the Farming Life uh, last Saturday, and I saw this, uh, this, this announcement of a large afforestation project. Uh, so I think it was in County Antrim from memory. Now, well and good, 50 hectares, hundreds of thousands of trees, until I read that half of it was Sitka spruce. And we're going to get absolutely nowhere in increasing diversity, wildlife biodiversity in Northern Ireland and improving our emissions, our emissions problem, if we believe that by planting exotic foreign conifer, conifer, coniferous trees in Northern Ireland will do anything to help the situation. And I felt very disappointed when I saw that. The Minister has announced a major tree planting, prob uh, tree planting pro uh, programme, but all attempts to tie him down as to what proportion that will be native Irish stroke Ulster stroke British trees have failed. They must be all native trees. You cannot increase diversity by going back to the serried ranks of conifers that have so much marked our hillsides for many years. That has to stop. We have to go back to the oak and the birch and the sycamore and all of those species which we know are good for biodiversity and are good for climate change. And that penny hasn't dropped yet. So what I'm trying to say in my very inadequate way, uh, Mr Speaker, is that there are options available, if we take them and take them now, that can turn around the juggernaut of climate change, which will have less – I'm not going to use the word pain because I've been hauled up already for saying so – but which will be less challenging than if we simply leave it too late and we end up in a situation where the emissions have got out of control. Now, people may say, well, why should we bother? Little Northern Ireland, six counties of Northern Ireland, part of the UK. Sure, we're only 3% of the population. We're, less than, we're just slightly above that in terms of emissions. But the, we've got two fundamental problems. First of all, we are part of a big polluter, the UK. The UK is the fifth largest economy in the world. So therefore, we have to be seen to play our part of our overall UK target. That's the first problem. Secondly, even though Northern Ireland only has a population of 1.8 million people, its emissions are much higher than many African countries. When you, when you go to, to, to the Sahel regions of Africa, you have populations of 10, 15 times higher than Northern Ireland, but their emissions per head are so much lower that their overall contribution to, to global climate change is very small. So therefore, Northern Ireland can't sit back and say, we'll just forget about this, we'll pass on this particular issue. We're going to have to do something to help lead the world, as Scotland, Wales, the Irish Republic have all done. We have to play our part. We're the last part of the United Kingdom which does not have a climate change act. So that, that's our first difficulty. Secondly, how can we lecture other countries in the world? How can we say to small and impoverished nations with very low GDP, how can we say to them, you must take challenging steps to reduce your climate emissions if we are not prepared to do it ourselves? We simply can't do that. So therefore, that's why I think Mrs Bailey is absolutely right in moving this bill. And Mr Putz is absolutely right in moving his bill. And hopefully, between the two, we're going to arrive at a situation where we are playing our role. Mr Alistair, the Honourable Member for North Antrim, made a rather disparaging comment about vegetarianism there. And as far, there, right there. as far as there are only three vegetarians in the chamber, just remember this. It takes 16 pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. I'll put it another way. If everybody in the world was vegetarian, we could feed the planet three times over and still have a surplus. And we're going to have to face the fact that we have only one planet only one planet, to sustain ourselves to the level of the United States or Germany, we'd need four planets, and we don't have that option. So we're going to have to start to think about our diet and how we produce food. And the frightening thing is, is that the only reason there's 1.1 billion Indians and 1.4 billion Chinese, and they can survive, is it's a largely a plant-based diet. The frightening spectre we have as a planet is those two huge populations 
adopting a Western diet with all of the energy demands that that entails, then we really do have a problem. Our population could remain static, but we have, a pop we have two major concentrations of peoples who are moving rapidly to a diet and a lifestyle which is incredibly, incredibly demanding upon our planet. Could, so therefore, could, I, could I ask the member to focus more on the principles of the, the bill? We're at the second stage of the climate change bill, as you know. But uh, uh, equally as well, the business committee, as we announced earlier on, has agreed that the uh, assembly will finish at 7 p 8 p.m. tonight. We'll call the minister at 7. The minister has confirmed it will only take a half an hour. The sponsor of the bill has confirmed she will only take a half an hour. So the business concludes at 8 o'clock. And I'm just asking the member to uh, be understanding that there are quite a number of members who still want to speak, but the session will end at 8 p.m., whatever happens. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, I will not be speaking at 7 p.m. Um, so, in fact, I was just about to draw my, my, my remarks to, to a conclusion. Um, I, I think this, this is good for this, this assembly that we're dealing with this issue. I've already heard some very, very useful contributions from all sides, and I, I believe at this stage we should allow this bill to continue on to committee stage, where no doubt there are many members waiting to get their teeth into it, and then we'll come back then for further consideration. And I think this bill, by the time that process is finished, knowing the track record of this assembly, will have made a major contribution on this issue. I want to thank the member for that, and uh, I want to call Martine Anderson. Go me, I can call you. Um, Sinn Féin has been consistent on the need for, for climate justice and for a climate change act uh, in the north, because we're living in the middle of a climate emergency. Now, in Derry and in the North West, uh, we have already seen the impact of severe weather, flash flooding, and at times scorching heat waves and relentless storms that have been battering more relentlessly than over the last decade. If we go back to August 2017, there were 70 millimetres of rain, uh, around 63% um, of the rainfall of August fell in just nine hours. And homes and businesses and agriculture, infrastructure and habitats destroyed. 400 homes affected. The A5 was closed for three days. Local farmers lost tens of thousands of pounds due to land damages. And five bridges were completely washed away. Then in 2018, we had 58 consecutive days without rainfall strain in farmlands, causing water shortages and hospital admissions, not to mention gas fires raging throughout. So the situation that where we are the only part of these islands without a bespoke climate legislation is un unacceptable because it is our duty, duty as public representatives and the custodian of this land to do everything within our powers to keep, uh, to keep global temperatures increases to less than 1.5 Celsius increase of the pre-industrial level. Now, if we fail to do this, and I think we would if this bill doesn't uh, go through its course, and I do welcome the fact that we're here discussing this today, the principles of it, then the consequences, uh, I think, for our island, our peatlands, our wetlands, our ancient forest and mountain life, uh, in all its natural beauty, um, could well face extinction. Uh, as we know it. Now, my colleague Sinn Féin, Declan McAleer, spoke about the rural community and farmers, and we all have received the emails from, from farmers, particularly in recent days, uh, who must be consulted, uh, they must be listened to, so that there is, as has been said, a just uh, transition. I, and I also want to acknowledge the Sinn Féin spokesperson, Philip McGuigan, who has led the Sinn Féin position on climate justice from the front and who is a proud co-signature um, of this bill. This bill provides a framework for decisive action uh, in the North because we are failing to adequately reduce carbon emission when you consider between 2008 and 2016, the North only managed to reduce emissions by 9%, and that's totally unacceptable. So unless urgent action is taken right across this island, then we are on a trajectory for natural disaster. 
So I would urge uh, all of the MLAs to vote in favour of sending this, the principles of the bill, to the committee stage so that it can be fully and transparently discussed and considered, as has been outlined uh, here today. The bill gives us the opportunity to tackle an endless cycle of extraction under regulated capitalistic growth and materialism, which has brought our planet to the brink. You know, business as usual is no longer an option. And that is why Sinn Féin bought a motion in February last year declaring, de declaring a climate emergency, and why my party colleague Declan McAleer, as chair of the Agriculture Committee, brought forward a motion calling on the Minister, Minister Putz, to introduce a Climate Change Act. But Minister Putz continued to drag his boots. He only started to take action when every single other party in this chamber came together to bring forward this bill, and I think that's to be acknowledged and congratulated to all involved. So I do welcome the fact that this bill sets out the framework for the creation of a climate action plan to put us on an ambitious trajectory for net zero carbon emissions by 2045. And a cornerstone of this bill is the fact that the climate action plan will be co-designed uh, with those sectors, businesses and industries to work to make crucial and fundamental change. And of course, change can be challenging, which makes it all the more important than ever that we ensure a just transition, which has been referred to today in this chamber as outlined in the bill, so that crucial action to protect our environment does not disadvantage anyone who's already struggling to make ends meet. The bill offers us the chance to be ambitious, to be fair and deliverable, to protect workers, farmers, families and communities by protecting and enhancing our natural world. Part of the Climate Action, climate action Bill, as envisaged, uh, or the Climate Action Plan as envisaged in the Bill, will, without doubt, uh, with reference to the energy production and supply, I think one of the things that they should be taking account of is what has been mentioned earlier about the revolutionisation of our electricity production and consumption. Currently, as has been stated by other members, uh, almost half of our electricity um, in, in the north comes from renewable sources, but that's still not enough. Good as it is, it's still not enough. And the sectoral plans envisaged by the bill, I think, should take account of changes that need to be undertaken in, for instance, the transport sector, and I know the Minister has already been doing work on all of that. That means that as more hydrogen buses get, get on the road, that we have the skills based to maintain, and we have the ability to fuel them locally, because if we do not produce local hydrogen, then we are unravelling any environmental benefits referred to in the bill by shipping tanks of hydrogen into the north from abroad. Now, in terms of the energy production and the supply referred to in the bill, the production of hydrogen, uh, an industry set to be worth something in the region of 2.5 trillion globally by 2050, is an opportunity that I think for the economy minister he sh should not attempt to only shunt into a small corner of the northeast, particularly when the natural geography of Derry and the northwest, including Donegal, is perfectly suited and the perfect location for the generation of wind energy that is inferred to in the sectoral plans of the bill which is necessary for the production of hydrogen. Um, I've been in centrally involved in showcasing Derry and Donegal to investors, exposing to them what this bill sets out regarding energy production and supplies, which is in abundance in the northwest. And that as this bill sets out uh, an ultimate objective of achieving net zero emissions, I believe that hydrogen opportunities can help to achieve uh, and to achieve that in Derry, investing in economically sustainable jobs and tackling regional inequalities in the northwest. 
And again, in relation to what the bill is saying around energy production and supplies, I've already initiated conversations um, with, for instance, McGee University, Letterkenny Institute of Technology, Derry and Shaban Council, Donegal Council, the Foil Port and NA Water to help advance the opportunity for Derry and the North West uh, City Region, which captures the All-Ireland opportunities to advance climate justice. In fact, I would say over the last number of months, I have done more for Derry with potential investors than Invest NI, but I suppose um, that wouldn't be too hard, but that's another debate for another, another day, and I know you'll not want me to stray into that. So, Akarja, I want to say that the bottom line remains that we are at a crossroads where we can choose to do more of the same or we can choose to protect our natural world. And the longer we dilly-dally, choosing which path to go down, the less of our natural world we can protect. And I think the next stage of the process will be vital in understanding and shaping a climate change act which will protect people, our ecology and our environment. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, and Anish Erlam or Patsy McGlone. I call Patsy McGlone. Good evening, Mr. Deputy. Can call you. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the principal sponsor of the bill for its introduction here today. Uh, my party colleague, of course, Mark, the member for Foyle, is a co-sponsor of the bill. When he was Environment Minister in 2015, he proposed a climate action bill <coughs> at the time of the Paris Accord. Uh, to keep the rise in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We have an obligation and a, a responsibility to meet those commitments. The commitment to climate change is a commitment to social justice. The delay in seeing a climate change bill brought before the Assembly has been because of a number of issues, among them the denial of some members of the current Environment Minister's Party and the absence of an executive when members of the Deputy First Minister's Party walked from the Assembly. Nevertheless, uh, we are where we are today, and indeed when the Assembly declared a climate emergency in February last year, the Minister, along with his party, voted against that direct declaration. However, as we look at this, and um, many... No. Yep, sure, sure, Jim. Not, not all of his party... I uh, voted against that motion. I actually was very much in favour of declaring a climate change emergency. As ever, th thanks very much, Jim, for your elucidation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so it's good to see this bill in front of the Assembly today and the debate underway. Um, the, and the, this bill is un unambiguous in its ambitions. Um, it, set down, it sets down legislation a commitment to target of net zero by 2045 compared to 1990 levels and puts in place a framework for delivery. Some members here will raise the advice of the UK Climate Change Committee. I accept the advice of the Climate Change Committee for what it is. It is their expert opinion based on the evidence available to them. But as the Climate Change Committee have pointed out, there is no purely technical reason why we cannot meet a net zero target for greenhouse gas emissions. As the chair, the chair of the Climate Change Committee, Lord Dibbon, told the ERA Committee of the advice that the CCC provides that their job, quote, their job is to make sure that you as a government and the arrangements that you have in the north of Ireland are such that you can genuinely say to all the people of the province that you are absolutely able to reach this end, unquote. He also told the committee that if you were to decide that you wanted to do better than that, we would be very pleased indeed. It's also worth noting uh, that at the time since the CCC appeared before the Assembly Committee, both the United States and the UK have significantly updated their commitments to much more ambitious targets than before. The SDLP support the bill not only because we want to do better, but because we must do better. Reaching net zero by 2045 will not be easy, but it is essential. The latest NI greenhouse gas inventory estimates for 2018 show a 20 per cent decrease in the emissions compared to 1990. The current projections estimate only a 39 per cent reduction compared to 1990 by 2030. Agriculture remains the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions for Northern Ireland in 2018 at 27 per cent. 
The share is expected to increase to 35 per cent in 2030 as a result of the improved performances of other sectors and only a 3 per cent reduction in agricultural emissions. That isn't sustainable. But indeed, there have been many scare stories about what this bill will do to farmers. I represent a rural constituency. I have no intention of putting farmers or indeed the, the agri-food sector out of, uh, out of business. And I was really glad to hear that the, the proposer of the bill, uh, Ms Bailey, said that this bill does not assign sectoral targets um, at the, um, from, from our own party's point of view. What we would welcome parallel to that or as a consequence that is a cross-departmental just transition working group, one which would audit comprehensively the environmental potential, but also look at the social consequences in terms of food prices, etc., the economic and business implications and opportunities, and energy implications and changes in the use of energy, which has been referred to Mr. Wells indeed referred to it there. But also for those of us who are in the rural areas, there are big transport implications for this and the necessary requirements for infrastructure, properly funded infrastructure, whether that be electrical or indeed changes in the types of existing uh, modes of transport which have been used. These measures, I would suggest that that working group must come up with proposals for government to support and incentivise various sectors and industries such as farming to help them make that transition and support them through that change. Change can be welcome, change can be a challenge. This change is inevitable and because it is needed. Um, many of us have stood, I can think of one particular night when at two o'clock in the morning I was standing in Sandy Breeze in 2014 in Macherfeld, which is the state of Macherfeld. We were to our knees in flood waters as a result of flash flooding <clears throat> that had never happened before. The Glenelli Valley, as uh, the chair there knows it much better than I, um, that incident that happened there, that crisis basically that caused for a lot of farmers in the Glenelli Valley. I have been to Kern, uh, a small townland outside between Mahara and Marafelt, where the river Moyola burst its banks and new houses were flooded. Never happened before. And indeed, last year, just on River Road in Zeberstown, the same thing happened with the River Myola, where a house literally had one metre of water in it that had never been flooded before. These aren't happening by coincidence. It's the change that's happening, the change that we must stymie and try and stop. And this is, this is why this bill is before us here today. The aim must be to, as a result of the Th those particular sectors that are affected, we must be able to maintain the profitability of farms and agri-food sectors and other businesses, and indeed promote new methods and new ways, which are equally, if not more, sustainable and indeed profitable for them, and encouraging the use of less environmentally damaged methods and practices. That would be for that working group to see through and bring up proposals for support, financial support, or other incentivisation for the various sectors. We need to build social benefits into reduction efforts so that communities can see it working for them. Bringing communities with us as we reduce greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors, energy, transport, business and agriculture is key to successfully making the transition to a net zero society. <clears throat> and I welcome the words from, from the Chair, uh, Mr De Me Declan McAleer, earlier that the committee will in fact ensure that there is inclusivity, that there is all voices will be listened to, so that whatever legislation comes through in its final form represents and in actuality does listen to the needs of the community. There are many, many needs, and I was glad to hear the Chair uh, outlining that. With a firm and ambitious target in place, we can shape policy to meet that target and put in place support and incentives to help all sectors. We also have a responsibility to help not just Britain and the rest of Ireland meet the net zero target, but to help all of us meet a global net zero target. Importantly, the consultation process as this bill works its way through the ERA committee will be uppermost. And, uh, I thank, thank you and I thank the proposer of the bill again uh, for bringing this before us here today. And I welcome uh, working through the committee and indeed with her as it progresses through that committee in its various stages. Gormai uh, can call you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Mr. Speaker. Gormai Agat, thank you. And I call Alan Chambers. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I don't believe that there are many, if indeed any, members in this Assembly who do not recognise that climate change is something that needs urgent attention. It is not just an issue for Northern Ireland, but is a totally global topic that requires international action. This motion before us today has given the Assembly the opportunity to debate this issue and to start to find a way forward that attempts to confront and mitigate the problem. However, it is equally important that we do not create a set of legislation that presents severe and perhaps unachievable challenges for any of our citizens, especially those who may have their livelihood curtailed or damaged as a result. Like others, uh, in recent days I have had a large number of emails coming to me from those within our important agriculture sector. Some of these have been irate and others have been very reasonable in setting out the challenges they might face from any legislation that flows from this Bill as it currently stands. The one common theme in all these emails is the fact that everyone recognises that climate change is a reality. It is a reality that we must address in the interests and welfare of our children and our grandchildren in the future. No one is in denial. The biggest fear expressed in the correspondence that I have received from those in the agriculture sector is the timelines outlined in the Bill. Suggestions that herd sizes would need to be reduced to achieve zero carbon emissions by 2045 is a major concern for those farmers who have made contact with me. Many of their concerns are around large investments they have recently made based on business plans that go beyond the Bill's timeline targets. Others are about to make investments but are concerned that they may be landing family members who inherit the farm after them will be left with business plans that start to unravel and create financial difficulties for them in the future. Having a personal background in business, Mr. Speaker, I understand their concerns and recognise the need for certainty when making long to medium term investments. We all in business rely heavily on the financial support of banks when we embark on such investments in our businesses. This bill may make the banks nervous about long term lending if there is any suspicion that forward financial and business planning could be disrupted by challenges thrown up by legislation. Some of my local farmers, Mr. Speaker, have called with me personally. Their approaches have been civil and heartfelt. Listening to them, I have been impressed by the steps that they are already taking on their farms to reduce carbon emissions and how they carry out their work. This has reassured me that I have been engaging with people who are on the same page as this Assembly in recognising the reality, indeed the dangerous reality, of climate change. I will be supporting this Bill today because it is the right thing to do for the community I represent. It is also the right thing to do for my grandchildren and everyone else's grandchildren. However, I have listened to our agriculture sector and I recognise that some of their concerns are both genuine and set firmly in reality. They want to reach a position of arriving at a zero carbon emission level. They support our aspiration to achieve this. That said, I believe that meaningful amendments will need to be brought forward and timelines revisited as this bill goes forward. We cannot afford to make legislation, Mr. Speaker, that is going to have unforeseen consequences that may damage not only our agriculture sector but also other areas of our economy. We must go forward together in common cause, and to achieve this, we will need those meaningful amendments. And I believe there will be the will in this House to produce legislation that everyone will not only support but will actually be achievable. We need to get this right. To that end, I will give a pledge to our agri industry that I will support all amendments to this bill that will make that sector feel more comfortable with any resulting legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Morris Bradley.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I agree wholeheartedly that a climate change bill is both necessary and urgent. Uh, and I thank my, I thank my dear committee colleague, uh, Ms. Bailey, for bringing this bill before the assembly. But I worry about its impact uh, on the agri-food and farming industry, who will be most affected by the bill before us. Mr. Speaker, it has been a good debate so far, and I will try not to replicate some excellent points that members have raised already. Increasing rainfall, unpredictable storms, landslides, threat to habitat and species, uh, as was highlighted recently by the Mourne uh, wildfire, are all warning signs that cannot be ignored. Climate change is the world's most pressing emergency, and I agree that we in Northern Ireland must do our bit to combat rising seas, rising temperatures and unstable wa- uh, weather patterns. We need more than words and more than lip service. We are in the midst of an emergency, but it is an emergency that needs to be properly funded to ensure any climate change bill is a success. That cost has not been factored in as yet. We need to be part of a joined up strategy, properly funded and with measurable outcomes, a strategy that is in line with the rest of the UK and our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland. There are differences regionally in industrial uses. Here in Northern Ireland, agriculture is one of our main industries and employers, and we cannot overlook that industry. Their input is vital. One such measure is the reinstatement of bog and peatlands, and more needs to be achieved and quickly on the reforestation of Northern Ireland. Here I agree with my colleague Mr Wells, where suitable native trees, native broadleaf trees, must be planted in preference to coniferous. However, renewable energy should that be wind farms, solar farms, no matter, we need to gravitate away from fossil fuels uh, to use green energy. This bill heralds a time when all stakeholders need to sit down and discuss a time frame strategy on the way forward processors, wholesalers, corporate food retailers, industry, and the general public. We also need to look at airlines, both passenger and freight, where five litres of aviation fuel burnt at 30,000 feet is the equivalent of burning 25 litres on the ground. Yet many of us can't wait to get away on holidays. A societal change is also necessary. In addition, the shipping industry, the corporate haulage industry, they use massive amounts of fossil fuel, with too much of that used to bring beef and dairy products into Northern Ireland, while we export up to 80% out of Northern Ireland. Burning home heating oil, gas and coal across Northern Ireland, all of these, along with our fossil fuel vehicles emitting the worst emissions possible, are damaging to our environment. So, Mr Speaker, Whilst I support a climate change bill, I would rather wait until the Minister's bill is brought before the House. To that end, I would encourage the Executive Committee to grant its passage as soon as possible. I believe it has been with the Executive Committee for the past four weeks. I fear two separate bills on climate change will be counterproductive. Therefore, Mr Speaker, I prefer to wait until the Minister's climate change bill can be heard to see which one sits better for the benefit of all of us here in Northern Ireland or indeed if both bills can be complementary one to the other. It is too important not to look at all these issues. Mr Speaker, we are in the middle of an emergency, and if we don't take stock now, it will be our children and our children's children that will suffer the consequences. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Philip McGuigan. (coughs) Gary Melgood, Ciong Collier. And I want to thank uh, the bill's main sponsor, Claire Bailey, for bringing uh, the, the, the bill and the second stage debate to the chamber today. Uh, can I begin by saying that it is a privilege to be a named co-sponsor of this important bill on behalf of my party, and I am delighted to be able to speak today in its favour. I also want to point out the broad cross-party support uh, for the bill and its desired outcomes. This progressive bill is a good example of MLAs in this institution cooperating. Uh, indeed, it is an excellent example of MLA and civic society cooperating. As politicians, there are many vital and important issues deserving of our inten- attention. We are still dealing with the effects of a global pandemic, trying to keep our citizens safe and well as we move towards reopening society and building back our economy must be an immediate priority. Rebuilding our health service, tackling education inequalities, boosting our economy, dealing with Brexit-related issues progressing and shaping positive progressive politics towards a shared future on this island, and many more vital issues will also require our attention now and the time ahead. But there can be absolutely no doubt that the defining political issue of this generation on this island and beyond is the climate emergency we all currently face. And how to deal with that 
will determine the type of chances given to your children and grandchildren and the type of the world that they will get to grow up in. Every week, a different report or study alerts us to the real and catastrophic dangers of global warming. That's a sentence I, I, I read out in my speech in July during the last debate on the need for a climate uh, legislation to be brought forward here. And, and these alarming reports haven't stopped being produced since July. Just a few short weeks ago, the United Nations produced its State of the Global Climate preliminary report and stated in it that 2020 was one of the three hottest years on record, marked by wildfires, droughts, floods, melting glaciers, and prompting the UN Secretary General to say the world stands on the verge of the abyss. So hopefully there is nobody in this chamber still in denial about the extent of the problem we face and the need for urgent action on our part. And I listened to Claire uh, intently as she outlined the likely impact of the world we live in with each degree increase in temperature rise. And her contribution reminded me of listening to a radio debate very, very recently, actually, because uh, there's a similar debate going on in the South in terms of climate legislation. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the contributor, but he, he, he stated that sometimes the science of this uh, is overly complicated for people and turns people off. And he, he described the impact in lay terms. Uh, and when he compared the impact of the, the growth in the Earth's core temperature to that of rising body temperature in humans, internal body temperature is normally, as we know, 37 degrees. If it rises by one or two degrees, he said, you have a fever. Another degree, you're in hospital, and any further rises without reduction, and you die. He then went on to say that we haven't seen temperatures or changes in temperatures that we are currently seeing in millennia since the last ice age, in fact. Six hottest years ever recorded were between 2015 and 2020. And we are currently the only part of these islands that doesn't have climate legislation. What message does that send out? I want to be part of shaping this legislation through this bill that shows our citizens that we here in the North are prepared not only to join others across the globe and show leadership, but that we are here in this chamber are prepared to set a direction of travel that will build a better, just, economically and environmentally vibrant economy for the citizens of the North that we represent. Climate impacts are not only happening in far off places. We have all witnessed growing freak weather patterns here in the North. The Chair of the Agriculture Committee uh, uh, described the, the Glenelly Valley. Uh, my era colleague, Patsy McLoone, described uh, floods in Kern and Mara Felton, growing up in South Derry, places I, I, I know well. Uh, I, I, whilst he was speaking, I, I was Googling for the exact date uh, and year of the, the freak snow that wiped out over 10,000 animals in the glens of Antrim through freak uh, snow and ice conditions and damaged farm properties uh, as well. So on a growing and a more regular basis, all of us as elected representatives are dealing with uh, issues associated with the, the growth in global temperatures. I want to see the North move to enjoy fossil-free energy supplies. I want to see your businesses thrive and prosper as part of a Green New Deal. I want to see your transport system transformed through government strategies that supports a comprehensive public transport system and puts active travel at the top of its agenda. I want to see your farmers and rural communities rewarded for good environmental practices and the protection of the land and environment. And I want to see people living in big towns and cities living there free from the dangers of air pollution. And I want to see all of this come about in a just transition that helps lift the most vulnerable in society. Some people listening to this will be rolling their eyes and thinking, that's all lovely rhetoric, but we've heard it all before and we've heard it for years. And they would be right to think that. We cannot rhetoric the climate emergency away. It requires action. And for us, as legislators here in the North, this climate bill before us today is that action. This bill will commit the executive to creating a climate action plan, which will contain annual targets on various emissions and environmental quality standards and measures on how these targets will be met, with the overriding ultimate goal of a net zero carbon, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable economy by the year 2045. That is ambition. I think everyone in the House, even people who don't even believe in climate change, would agree with that. But would he agree with me 
that there are many, many options to get to net zero. Some of them, I would say, are painful, and some of them are a lot less painful. Would he accept if we go down the forest station, the solar panel uh, route, and the wet, re-wetting of peatlands, that that is a way forward that reduces the difficulties that some sectors will have, in the sense that, for instance, taking 10,000 acres of peatland and re-wetting has a lot less dramatic impact on agriculture than reducing herd sizes by 50 per cent? I thank the member uh, for his intervention, and I found uh, this debate to be strange and that I, I have already agreed with some of the things that the, the member has said. I mean, there, there will be quick wins in this. Uh, and, you know, this bill has been stated by the, the proposer and many of the other speakers isn't prescriptive in terms of the way forward. No, the, the real heavy lifting in this bill will actually come once it becomes law and we start to engage in the the action plans uh, within each sector, and we go to set the targets within each sector. But I mean, I agree that there will be easy, quick wins in the first number of years, and we should explore all of those. Uh, so, I, I, I listened. To, actually, he's not here, but I listened to Steve Aiken uh, describe his earlier days as a nuclear submarine. Uh, I don't know what you call somebody who drives a nuclear submarine pilot. Indeed, uh, uh, and that that didn't exactly set himself uh, uh, as an eco warrior. I mean, I am Sinn Féin's party's environment and climate change spokesperson, but I don't consider myself an eco warrior uh, either. Though I was recently labelled a trendy lefty eco warrior during a discussion I was having with the importance uh, with somebody about the importance of us needing more uh, cycling and active travel and infrastructure here. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was meant as a joke or an insult or as a compliment. Maybe it was just a reaction uh, to the growth of my ginger beard. There is nothing uh, that is stopping us building a more extensive walking and cycling infrastructure, and it should happen now, regardless of any bill for climate change. And can I ask the member? Can I also also focus on the principles yep. of the bill? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Gomaleskil, can call you. Uh, I thank the member for his introduction. He's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, five kilometres per year in the last five years of, of uh, cycling only infrastructure is completely unacceptable, and there is nothing to stop uh, an increase in that. But regardless of all of this, uh, I don't believe the issue of uh, environment, of dealing with climate change, of protecting the earth of future generations should be the sole preserve of environmentalists uh, or party environment spokespeople. The issue is far too important and far wide re reaching for that. That said, I do want to commend all those activists who over decades have kept this issue to the fore of the public and political agenda. Particularly, as uh, has been said numerous times, the young activists right across the north who in recent years took to the streets to highlight and campaign on this issue. The majority of MLAs in this assembly want to see climate legislation passed. That has been clearly demonstrated repeatedly. In the debate here in July, the majority of MLAs voted for the Minister to bring forward climate legislation within three months. That is the debate in which uh, we will all remember the Minister uh, for the Environment telling us that we should not use language such as emergency or crisis when describing the climate challenge we face. He also said that the bill could not be produced within three months. Others thankfully disagreed. and I want to pay tribute to those within Climate Change NI who listened to that debate who heard the positivity and the desired will of the majority of MLAs and who worked to produce this bill before us today. They and you deserve immense credit. As with all legislation, though, it is vital that we get it right, and today is only the second stage on that process. Despite the fact that climate legislation will be transformative for all of society and every sector within it, lots of today's debate has been taken up by what it could mean for our agriculture sector. And I totally understand that. I represent North Antrim, primarily a rural constituency whose local economy relies heavily on tourism and agriculture. Like most MLAs, I have family members and friends and neighbours who are farmers. Agriculture is a vital part of my constituency and it is absolutely vital to the economy here in the North. I see nothing in this bill that will jeopardise that. But I do know that if we don't tackle growing temperatures, the negative impacts of climate change will greatly damage agriculture in my constituency and beyond over the years to come. Key to this bill is a just transition. 
Our farmers and food producers, as with other sectors, must be supported economically as we move to reduce emissions so that they can continue to produce high-quality food. As my party colleague and chair of the Era Committee, Declan McAleer, has already stated, uh, the, the agriculture sector also have a key role to play in shaping how we move forward. And this must be done in partnership with farmers and our agri-food sector. If this bill moves beyond second stage today, as I hope it will, then as a member of the ERA Committee, I look forward to hearing from the public and all sections and sectors of society as we gather evidence over the next few months. As has already been pointed out, this bill uh, is a framework bill. If it becomes law, then the climate action plans that emanate from it and which will, in five-year timeframes, detail the actions required to reduce greenhouse gases within these timeframes will be laid before the Assembly. They will not have effect unless approved by the MLAs within this Assembly. And prior to that, they will, have a 16, they will be subject to 16 weeks of public consultation. All of that is important. Uh, climate action isn't nor cannot be something done to society. For it to work, it must be something agreed and done in conjunction with society. Sinn Féin support and want to see a climate bill that is ambitious, effective, fair, based on science and that is deliverable. How we move forward, the targets we set and how we achieve them must be based on the best available science and in conjunction with international targets. The progression of the bill beyond this stage will allow for that scrutiny and all the hard work to begin. Gary Melga. Thank you. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support the bill at this second stage, and I would like to thank the sponsors of the bill and the proposer, my constituency colleague, Ms. Claire Bailey, for bringing it forward. This bill emerges from a cross-community, non-partisan initiative, and it reflects the very, um, very real climate emergency ahead of us. This is not an issue on which we can. Um, do what this Assembly so often does, namely engage in endless delays or an internal process of lots of talk but no action. The Bill is the product already of well-defined expert input. If we cannot proceed on the basis of a clear emergency and on the basis of well-defined expert input, when can we proceed? Um, as others have mentioned here today, Mr. Speaker, we are, of course, in a, the peculiar position of having two climate change bills in development with another one coming from the Department. This means the bringing forward of this bill has led to the Department also taking action, and that is a good thing. We are supporting the passage of this bill on the basis that it is challenging climate, uh, that it is a cli sorry, a challenging climate Change Act and that it should exist in Northern Ireland. But we are also content to scrutinise all relevant options to achieve this. I hope, no nevertheless, that whatever way we end up with a Climate Change Act, the legitimate concerns of the agri-food sector, represented by the Ulster Farmers Union, sectoral lobbies and others, will be taken into account. In our own new um, deal paper that we um, published recently, the Alliance Party has put forward proposals for enabling and supporting a transition, including through support for nature-friendly farming. These would, I believe, complement this bill, but it should also be emphasised that it is, they are essential to the success of any such legislation. That is not to say we should not set challenging targets. On the contrary, it is to say that we should. But we should also emphasise that some sectors will need support to enable us collectively to deliver on them. It is also important to note it is not our intention to focus on the fear factor. Indeed, I would argue that sometimes the fear factor um, plays um, to a greater role in these debates and can end up turning people off. On the contrary, as my party established, as I said, in our Green New um, Deal policy paper last month, the challenge in tackling climate change can be hugely engaging and a positive one. This is not just about avoiding a, an emergency ahead of us, but in fact about creating opportunity. Nor is it just about the environment, but also about how we proceed with much greater fairness in everything from the provision of social care to the delivery of economic livelihoods. Those who engage in denial are not just um, denying the obvious impact of rapid climate change, but in the denial of social and economic opportunity to a much wider number of people. I would also add, since those um, at the more sceptical end of this debate tend to come from the unionist benches, that there is a significant UK success story here. 
The decline in carbon emissions is in fact one thing that the UK, which it, um, is genuinely and clearly world beating at currently. However, Northern Ireland has not contributed anything like its fair share towards that reduction in carbon emissions. Let us now ensure that Northern Ireland plays its full part in that success into the future, proofing policy to ensure that it is a leader in tackling um, climate change and grasping the opportunities which emerge from doing so. Yes. Following the decision that coal generation is deceased in 2024, that that will make a major contribution to the reduction of carbon emissions. Uh, would you accept that? Uh, well, I suppose any and all opportunities um, for, for um, making our economy more green are to be welcomed. Um, I am concerned, Mr Speaker, going forward, therefore, that some of the targets in the bill are being um, presented as restrictive, when in fact they are means of developing opportunities. Um, this is more relevant to Northern Ireland than anywhere else because of our ongoing reliance on the subvention and the need to create our own wealth to reduce that reliance. What better way than to become a world leader in sustainable development and sustainable economics? The costs that some refer to could, in this way, be turned into a net benefit. If I may... Yes. In, in terms of sustainable economics, um, can the member bring some evidence um, to challenge what the Climate Change Committee are suggesting, that we need to wipe out over 50 per cent of our beef and dairy herds? And does the member understand that agri-food employs 100,000 people? It is a £5 billion generation to our economy. And if we do not listen to what CCC are saying, we are going to put ourselves into a position where tens of thousands of people who work in this agri-food sector are going to be out of jobs. So could you give us some evidence to challenge CCC and where these economics are coming from uh, to sustain what you've just said? Well, well, the Minister will know I don't sit on the ERA committee. I sit on the Health Committee and it's, uh, we have our, our spokesperson sits on the committee and will be engaging fully in the scrutiny process as people bring forward the information. And I mentioned in my earlier remarks that we are open to engaging and I know that um, John Blair has met with the Ulster Farmers Union um, and other organisations to look at the issues that they're bringing forward and see how these could be mitigated against. Um, so, M Mr Speaker, um, and may I make a more broad comment? Um, there must be no question of meekly returning to the status quo when the pandemic is over. We must grasp the opportunity to reset some of our policies and even assumptions which are pro proven so outdated. Uh, Mr Speaker, tackling climate change is not just about the environment, as I said. It is about creating a genuine, fair society with opportunities for all. We want Northern Ireland to be a world leader in green opportunities and innovation in environmentally friendly areas as far reaching as fintech, where we are already world leading, um, to renewable technologies and green aerospace, where we have much to build on, to emergency areas, uh, sorry, emerging areas in hydrogen deployment and smart materials. Mr Speaker, yet again we find that Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK without legislation in a crucial area. Over a decade since it was put in place elsewhere, we are lagging behind politically on yet another issue. The attitude that we will not be bounced into legislative action is an attitude which condemns us all to be lagging behind. Is that what we want for Northern Ireland? It is time to lead, it is time to legislate, and it is time to grasp the opportunities of a Green New Deal supported by this bill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Shanae McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise in support of the Climate Change Bill in all its parts. No one can overstate or underestimate the magnitude of the climate problems that we collectively face. Decarbonising our economy requires action right across most of our lives and will impact every industry, including the power industry, agriculture, travel, to name but a few. Mr Speaker, amid the vastness of issues impacted by climate change, I want to look at one specific issue by way of illustrating the importance of the task at hand. And I want to discuss one of the biggest challenges of all, and that is heating our homes. 
According to the Department of Economy's draft energy strategy, we need to retrofit 50,000 homes a year in Northern Ireland to make them energy efficient, to meet our net zero obligations by 2050. Unfortunately, the strategy says very little about how to do that, and the Finance Minister's budget says even less. Retrofitting homes to make them energy efficient is a massive challenge. Many of our homes leak heat, many of our homes do not have cavity wall insulation, and much of the existing cavity wall insulation is now old and needs replacing. Windows need replacing, insulation needs to be installed, dry lining of walls needs to go up, and of course the heating systems need to be replaced, ending our reliance on fossil fuels of oil and gas. This is an expensive set of improvements. On average, it is likely to cost in and around £20,000 per home. In some homes, it will cost up to £50,000. Yet some of the homes in my constituency of Derry have a market value of £80,000 and less. Those figures should give us all a little bit of food for thought. And then we have the vast number of privately owned rented homes, and some of them are actually in much worse condition. And yet there is precious little sign that our government departments, their officials and sadly the ministers, have got to grips with the scale of the challenge. So congratulations to the Irish government, which is expected to announce plans very shortly by which homeowners will have access to state-backed loans to make properties energy efficient. In place of a realistic solution, our Department for the Economy seems to have adopted a policy of hope and delay. The draft energy strategy includes many optimistic references to, use, to, to the use of green hydrogen to heat our homes. Not everyone listening today or to this debate will know the difference between green hydrogen and blue hydrogen, and I can admit, hands up, um, I was one of those people not so very long ago. <laughs> so let me explain. Green hydrogen is produced from renewable electricity, but the process is not energy efficient as much of the energy value is lost in the process of converting electricity to hydrogen. However, it is clean. Blue hydrogen, on the other hand, uses electricity from fossil fuels, which is neither energy efficiency nor is it clean, unless the carbon emitted from it is captured and stored. But the Department for Economy says our landscape is not suited to carbon capture and storage. Theoretically, hydrogen could replace natural gas for those homes connected to the gas, work, gas network. That is the option that is currently favoured by the gas companies. And remember, there have been numerous complaints, including the University of Exeter report, that states that the gas industry itself has been too influential in making energy policy here in Northern Ireland. However, the use of hydrogen on this scale is at present largely a theoretical ooh, can't say that word, idea. Without evidence, it can work on a scale required. Nor do we have the scale of renewable electricity necessary to dedicate much of it to the production of green hydrogen to replace natural gas. Britain, on the other hand, is looking to replace its use of natural gas, yet Northern Ireland continues to invest heavily in the gas network. There has been £66 million in financial support from government to expand the network here in Northern Ireland in recent years. While natural gas emits less carbon than oil, I give it that, it remains a serious carbon emitter and is a fossil fuel. That is why England is seeking to make significant progress over the next four years in moving away from the use of natural gas. Yet in Northern Ireland, the Minister of Econ Economy seems to be given serious consideration to new gas exploration and extraction in Fermanagh. And the utility regulator still has a st statutory duty to promote gas as an energy source, while not having a duty to promote energy efficiency. Frankly, this is all quite unbelievable. So I will certainly be supporting the bill today, but the bill and our vote means nothing unless our ministers act and act much faster than they have until now. 
That means the Minister for the Communities must ensure that the housing executive and housing associations have realistic and achievable plans for retrofitting our social housing stock. Her department's programmes should stop financing the replacement of oil bo boilers with gas boilers. So should the Economy Minister. The focus must be on energy efficiency for reasons both of cutting carbon emissions but also to cut fuel poverty. And the Economy Minister, with the backing of the whole of the Executive, must come forward with proposals to retrofit homes across all tenures and for its financing. These conversions will need to use technologies that work – heat pumps, district heating schemes, solar panels, electrification of heating systems backed by energy efficiency improvements. Mr Speaker, tackling the climate crisis is one of the most difficult tasks of face facing our administration, but there is none that is more urgent nor more important. Thank you. Um, I think you might have moved on from the ministers, and that's why I asked you to give way, um, because I have corresponded with uh, the Minister for Infrastructure and indeed uh, spoken to her on, on at least two other occasions uh, separate from that uh, to try to press ahead with getting the charging points available for electric cars. And of course, electric cars are much more widely available at this moment in time. And we have 45% of our energy produced from renewable sources or electricity produced from renewable sources. Therefore, utilising that on electric cars would be a superb thing to do. So, could the mem member actually indicate to us uh, whether she includes uh, the infrastructure minister and whether she will press the infrastructure minister to actually accelerate um, having charging points available throughout Northern Ireland and therefore encouraging investment? Uh, by the general public in electric vehicles. Thank you, Minister, for your intervention. And this is a cross-department uh, crisis. Every single minister has a duty to uh, implement changes that helps decarbonise uh, our economy. And I too have had my concerns regarding uh, electrical uh, points and have spoken to the minister and written to the Minister of Infrastructure regarding this. This is a cross departmental issue. Member for giving way and, and uh, earlier maybe the minister wasn't here whenever I mentioned it, but I did propose that the cross departmental just, just transition group should be cross departmental and in fact should address those issues such as transport, energy, economy, social consequences, including infrastructure. And I know that he has talked to the minister about this particular issue. When I call Roy Beggs. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would firstly declare that I own 25 acres of agricultural land, uh, which I let out, and I also provide voluntary assistance uh, to my, my parents on, on their farm. From the outset, uh, I wish to indicate my support for Northern Ireland playing its part in enabling the United Kingdom to reach carbon net zero and also achieve zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. I recognise that this will still be painful for many sectors. It will still involve challenges to get there. The EU is also aims to uh, be climate neutral by 2050 and appears to be moving towards uh, legislation. Most farmers that I talk to recognise that our climate is changing and many recognise that action is required. Recently, I picked up a comment from one farmer who basically said the tap is either full on or full off, and that reflects a little bit of what has, we have been experiencing, uh, and that causes difficulty for us all. I, I say that uh, to acknowledge that we have a climate emergency and to indicate my support for the Northern Ireland Assembly legislating to play our part within the United Kingdom, just as have the devolved governments in Scotland and Wales. They have already legislated uh, to, to provide protection. Scotland has a Climate Change Act since 2009 and recently updated its targets to a 75 per cent reduction in greenhouse gas uh, emissions by 2030 and 90 per cent by 2040. They are well ahead of us. Wales legislated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in 2016 and in February this year 
after almost, almost five years of planning and actions. They've updated their targets, they've worked out how they're going to do it, uh, and they're now aiming for, to achieve net zero by 2050. So why, I have to ask, has Northern Ireland not legislated yet? And in particular, I asked the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, and indeed the Dear Minister, who made commitments in the NDNA that the Executive would bring forward a Climate Change Act to give environmental targets a strong legal underpinning. Minister, I have to ask, why has there been such a delay? There has been talk of legislation. When will it be presented to the Executive, and when will the official bill be published? Certainly. Could I really, could I, sorry, could I advise the member? We're straying into something which is not under debate today. <coughs> I accept the, 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 the Speaker's comments. I, I would commend the member for South Belfast uh, for your Private Members Act to the degree that it has forced this issue once more onto the table and provided uh, that increased visibility that the Executive has not delivered as it should have. But this bill sets out ambitious targets over a compressed time frame, uh, <coughs> uh, way beyond the UK Climate Change Committee targets. Certainly. Does the member um, realise that his own party manifesto commits to net zero by 2035, which is much faster and much more compressed time frames? I, I believe that was the Westminster manifesto. Um, it certainly risks delivering an uh, overly painful shock to our economy and jobs, rather than enabling efficient changes and mitigating for change. Clause 2 uh, uh, legislation, uh, and the legislation would force the executive to bring a, bring a plan to net zero. I have to ask, why does it not simply state that we will follow the UK Climate Change Committee recommendations to ensure that Northern Ireland plays its fair share of greenhouse gas reductions? It indicates that the legisl a legislative commitment to reach net carbon zero by 2045. So we are at least five years behind Wales in legislating, and this bill proposes that we are going to miraculously leapfrog ahead of other regions in a compressed time frame. I have to ask, how is this to be achieved without pain? I would urge all members to read carefully and study the UK Climate Change Committee's letter uh, to DERA, dated the 1st of April 2021. It is a very serious letter with an unfortunate date. It wasn't an April Fool. Really, that is a key letter that everyone should be aware of, which replied to a DERA official's request uh, in, in, in February. And in it, the Climate Change Committee states, in December 2050, we recommend that any climate change legislation for Northern Ireland include a target to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions by at least 82% by 2050, as part of a fair contribution to the UK net zero target in 2050 and our international obligations under the Paris Agreement. This remains our clear uh, recommendation. Again, I would point out to everyone, there will be pain and costs as a result of legislation. We need to legislate to protect the environment, but in a fair and proportional manner. So our region uh, contributes uh, to the UK meeting its climate change targets by 2050. The UK government is well advanced uh, in its targets to meet the Paris Agreement climate change committees, our commitments. Some regions are to be net sinks, others are to be net sources. But the UK of, as a whole would meet the climate change target set in the Paris Accord. We do have to play our part. This bill will affect much more uh, than just agricultural industry. And each region of the UK is different, and all aspects must be taken into consideration. Can we take the, the issue of electricity generation? Within the UK, there are numerous nuclear power stations in Scotland, in Wales, and in England. 
And of course, uh, and in fact, I understand at present some 8 gigawatts of generating capacity, but none in Northern Ireland. So those regions, other regions of the UK, are able to generate electricity without contributing uh, to, to CO2 to emissions. So we somehow have to get a, 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 a generation without that. I, I do acknowledge that we do have the interconnector with Scotland, and undoubtedly some nuclear energy will, will flow along it. In addition, uh, the UK has significant hydroelectric power uh, installed with a capacity of 4.7 gigawatts. Uh, that includes 2.8 gigawatts of pump storage. But again, where is the significant hydroelectricity in Northern Ireland? Now, why those two forms of electricity generation uh, are particularly important is that they can continue to flow when there is no wind. Uh, uh, and that is an issue that must be cared for. Going forward, uh, in such situations, Kurut is destined to close. We will be entirely uh, reliant, admittedly with lower uh, gas outputs than I suspect that our CO2 outputs and, than Kulrich's coal, but from gas. But nevertheless, there will be a, a, a more significant proportion of CO2 outputs in Northern Ireland. In, in addition, uh, uh, within the other parts of the United Kingdom, there are extensive offshore uh, wind turbines. I'm thinking of the North Sea and, and Morecambe Bay. And to a degree, when the wind doesn't blow in one area, they may blow in another. We don't have that either, uh, which again may lead to additional energy being produced from gas. Mention was made earlier of, of hydrogen production. How is the electricity going to be generated to generate the hydrogen? You know, that is a significant problem that hasn't been addressed here. Um, <clears throat> so GB has greater options to assist with generation when there is no wind. No allowance have been made for this in our local targets. Uh, and that this, in turn, may then affect the price of electricity for individuals and for businesses, because additional other standby generations will be required, uh, and perhaps uh, carbon mitigation purchased in to, to compensate for any, any such generation. And I, I turn to the agri-food sector. Others have indicated the bill greatly impacts agriculture and the agri-food sector. Food production in Northern Ireland has a greater greenhouse gas footprint than the rest of the UK. Northern Ireland agriculture is responsible for some 27% of our greenhouse gas emissions, but in the rest of the UK this is only 10%. Again, this is actually an issue that has been recognised by the UK Climate Change Committee, that food production in Northern Ireland for the rest of the UK generates greenhouse gas emissions here. Northern Ireland food production helps to feed the rest of the UK. This has been recognised by the uh, uh, um, Climate Change Committee in their assessing a fair limit and target for each area. This will be a major factor why they have not sought a 100% uh, greenhouse gas reduction by 2050, never mind by 2045. And I'll quote from the uh, Climate Change Committee. Our analysis shows that Northern Ireland's position as a strong agri-food producer to the rest of the UK, combined with more limited capabilities to use engineered greenhouse gas removal technology, means that it is likely to remain a small net source of greenhouse gas emissions, almost entirely, entirely from agriculture. Any scenario where the UK reaches net zero in 2050. And it, the, the committee considers it is fair that those residual emissions uh, should be offset by actions in the rest of the UK. And then there is a comment. At this time, our assessment is that, zero, that net zero uh, target covering all greenhouse gas cannot credibly be set for Northern Ireland. Targets should be ambitious but must be evidence-based and delivered with a fair and equitable route map in achieving them. 
I ask the question, how does this bill recognise this comment by the UK's Climate Change Committee and how does it take its views on board? I have not heard or seen it. There's then, the, the, the committee also highlights that there's difference in land use uh, and in particular uh, uh, the livestock sector in Northern Ireland. It, it uh, results in a higher proportion of grassland in Northern Ireland and a lower proportion of cropland. Again, I'm quoting from the committee letter. Forest coverage is also lower than the rest of the UK at around 8%, and this includes small woodland area, and significant emissions from peatland means that land use is currently much larger net source of emissions in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the UK. So Northern Ireland is, is starting at a different level. We're at a different plane. We must plant trees. We must restore peatland uh, to build uh, a, a net land use sink over time. I certainly will. that any tree planting that has a high proportion of Sitka foreign exotic species does nothing for biodiversity and nothing for climate change, and therefore the vast proportion of that planting must be of native deciduous trees native to Northern Ireland. The, the, the member has uh, introduced an interesting uh, point, and I hope the minister will answer it uh, when he, he replies later. But the final uh, comment on this section from the uh, UK Climate Change Committee is that the starting point means the starting point of our land use means that the total size of the net sink will be smaller in Northern Ireland than in other parts of the UK by 2050. I, I think, in particular, of a recent announcement that the minister made. Uh, I think it was 50 hectares of new forests in North Antrim. And there was huge cost involved in establishing it. Uh, so if we, there is cost involved in, in moving forward. Uh, farmers generally do not have the money up front to convert from agricultural land to forestry. It is hugely expensive. And there is a huge uh, time period to wait before that crop is harvested, which most farmers could not, not wait on. So there's a cost involved in the change. And we are starting at a different uh, point. The UK Climate Change Committee has also assessed our infrastructure in setting local targets, and they've highlighted that there's less developed uh, natural gas network in Northern Ireland. Uh, it talks about our electricity network, uh, existing housing stock, clusters of heavy industry, uh, and our airport infrastructure. It then goes on to uh, comment on about our potential to store CO2. Because as I've indicated earlier, uh, part of what the plan is for parts of the rest of the UK is to use carbon capture to get, to get there, to get to the, the, the zero figure. But it says, the, the, the Climate Change Committee says, Northern Ireland is less likely to have a major UK carbon capture cluster by 2050, and therefore does not appear to be the most ideal place to locate greenhouse gas removal technology. So you can see that is the complexity of the range of issues that, 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 that we faced. This is not a matter of picking a figure that that's what we have to go and, go and reach. It is, it is very complicated. Carbon capture is planned to play a role in the UK in reaching its Paris uh, Agreement climate change obligations to protect the planet. But our regional figure is not to benefit from uh, that, that capture elsewhere. So we have had a different allowance set for Northern Ireland, and that's been a contributing factor to the 82% by 2050 that has been recommended. Uh, uh, the 2045 zero greenhouse gas target uh, is causing huge concern in the rural community. I have to say that friends and neighbours have been contacting me Concern for the future, not only of their current enterprise, but for future generations. And what money will there be to mitigate all of this? Already our budgets are stretched. I, I suspect that promise, promises of mitigation uh, uh, may be difficult to deliver. So again, I say, why do we not 
legislate for the targets agreed by the UK Climate Change Committee to enable the UK to meet at least the Paris Accords 2050 obligations of zero net greenhouse gas emissions. I have to say, if individual plans come forth that demonstrate that we can better them, then we can increase our targets just as Scotland and Wales have. Why have we not learned from them? Is that not a route that, that we should go? I have to say that one of the most concern, concerning statements in the letter is the context of the net zero 2050 target for the whole of the UK is also important. Rather than leading to an additional overall reduction in UK greenhouse gas emissions, wait for it, there is a risk that a net zero target for Northern Ireland in the same year or earlier could simply shift a greater share of the UK-wide cost of reaching net zero to Northern Ireland. So UK is committed to reaching net zero by 2050. And if we decide to move ahead of that, we are at liberty to do so and pick up the cost and the pain. But what might happen? The UK may just simply reduce the amount of carbon capture that they're planning for other parts of the United Kingdom. And we can inflict as much pain as we wish on our agricultural sector and our other industry, affecting jobs and employment and our economy. I certainly will. Is one of the issues of most concern um, to, to myself and something that I think should be shared by this Assembly is that if we go down this route and we decide that we don't need this beef production and we don't need this dairy production, that we'll have to do it elsewhere. And I, and I, I believe that the member indicated at committee that we could get it from Western Europe and New Zealand. Uh, but maybe the member hasn't checked her facts and acknowledged that Western Europe, in their production of beef and dairy products, have actually a higher carbon footprint per kilogram than we have here in the United Kingdom. So instead of actually reducing carbon emission in this bill, the perversely they are actually potentially raising it by simply diverting the problem and exporting the problem elsewhere and saying, haven't we done well, Gov? I, I, I wish to, to, to answer the, the Minister myself, first of all, and, and I, I may subsequently give way to, to the member. Just for clarity for everyone, uh, the, the Minister was not referring to myself. I am not on the Agricultural Committee. I believe he was referring to the proposer of, of, of the bill, and I'll happily give way. Thank you to the member. And, uh, Minister, at that session at the committee, when I was asked that question, I was questioning where um, would be able to pick up the slack in terms of dairy production and use the New Zealand model. So I wasn't talking about us importing from New Zealand, but I was saying that they have their own climate bill, their own measures, and therefore to increase their productions, they would be measured against their own existing climate legislation, something that we don't have. I thank the member for her contribution. Um, uh, there, there's another uh, interesting quote in, 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 in this letter. Um, from the Climate Change Committee. I mean, this letter must be studied by everyone. This letter is critical to the future agri-food industry in Northern Ireland and the wider economy. It cannot be taken lightly. I have to say, I stumbled upon it. How many of you have read it? I would ask that everyone ensure that they read it, or what they are wishing to achieve may actually uh, uh, not, not be uh, achieved. The letter also indicates that a larger reduction in output from Northern Ireland's livestock sector compared to the rest of the UK, even our most stretching tailwind scenario, which entails a 50% fall in meat and dairy production in Northern Ireland by 2050, and significantly greater levels of tree planting on the land released, wait for it, is not enough to get Northern Ireland to net zero emissions in 2050. This is what the UK experts in this field have stated. I'm aghast that nobody else has, has, I haven't heard this referred to in the debate so far. This is critical stuff. There then is, a, is another comment that they've made, and it reflects what, what has been said earlier by the Minister. 
uh, uh, there is a, a, a risk that without corresponding reduction in consumption of product, this would simply shift emissions overseas. We can stop producing food here. Uh, we can stop encouraging farmers in our agri-food industry. And instead of exporting it, to, we can lower our carbon footprint. And at that point, consumers in the UK, what are they going to do? They will take food from elsewhere. Uh, yes, I will. signed up to be enthusiastic supporters of this climate change bill. And yet, unless I'm reading him wrong, and this is a, bit, a little bit of a kettle calling the pot black, I suspect that he's taking a sort of a, almost a solo run here and seems to be picking the bill apart line by line. Now, he's perfectly entitled to do that. That's his view. But is he in line with his party's view on this issue? I, I would ask the member to be patient. Ask the member to be patient. Um, there is there is a real risk. There is a real risk of offshoring food production. I have to ask the question: Will this include other industries? I, I've referred earlier to the issue of electricity, and if electricity costs uh, go exceedingly high, uh, there is risk there. Further. If we move, and this is another important aspect, and I've thought about it, if we move in advance of uh, HMG, <coughs> there may not be appropriate carbon tax in place to protect Northern Ireland producers and businesses from competitors overseas. I mean, that is, that is a real thing. We can add costs to our local producers and businesses, but is there going to be protection? Now, I suspect at some point there may well be carbon taxes coming in to give a degree of protection and to stop unfair competition from the rest of the world. But my question is, if we move ahead of the rest of the United Kingdom, we may, may, may well have no such protection. So there is a risk that we could add pain to our local agriculture and food being sourced from elsewhere in the world. And will this result in food with a greater carbon footprint, perhaps even with lower quality, and perhaps even lower animal welfare standards being favoured rather than our products. These, this is the complexity of what we are doing here. And all these factors must be taken into consideration. It is not enough to pick a date and say, when sort of out, we're going to do it by that date. This is extremely complex. Some people think I think too much about things, but I, I try to get an understanding of where we are and come to a reasonable conclusion. The Climate Change Committee indicates that going too slow could lead to unnecessary costs in the future, and I agree, and could lead, uh, lead to Northern Ireland missing out on the benefits of climate investment that takes place elsewhere in the UK. How, they then go, however, however, going too fast, and in particular aiming to decarbonise significantly faster than the rest of the UK, also poses several risks. Setting emission reduction targets that are too ambitious to be delivered can undermine their credibility. Going beyond the natural rate of stock turnover perhaps uh, making equipment redundant earlier than its lifetime would have, would have meant, would lead to premature scrappage of assets such as vehicles and boilers. This may be costly, risk undermining popular support for transition, and would cause increased embedded emissions. So if we take uh, equipment and scrap them early, before the end of their normal life factor, guess what? We're adding to emissions costs. For all of these reasons, I cannot support this bill. In summary, I want a Climate Change Act for Northern Ireland which is proportionate and fair. To date and listening to contributions, I remain concerned at the proposals that are being made, which are, placing, which are, endangering, are in danger of placing unrealistic requirements. I call for common sense. We must do our bit as part of the UK to protect the planet. I support the 82% reduction of emissions by 2050 and have no doubt that in itself 
will be very challenging and painful. That is not a pain-free option, but I recognise that in playing our part in, in reducing uh, climate change, that we have to do it. And that is why I would be supporting us playing our part within the United Kingdom. As UK targets um, for carbon cap capture uh, are, 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 are there, and we cannot be part of it, there are lots and lots of complex issues involved here. And I urge members not to be attracted by a simple figure or a headline. We need to understand all the knock-on effects, and it's, as I said earlier, for that reason, having assessed all the information, having looked carefully at the bill, and looked at the Climate Change Committee's detailed, I think it's an 18-page letter, uh, I cannot support the bill today. Again, again I call Jim Allister. Mr Speaker, the easiest thing in politics is to follow the crowd. I don't intend to follow the crowd on this bill, and I'm glad that Mr Beggs doesn't either. Nor might I add to intend to follow the crowd of unionist leaders who are abandoning the leadership of their parties. <laughs> but when you come to this subject, the communal pressure which builds towards supporting such a bill as this draws so heavily on hysteria and whipping up fears that there comes a point when it loses its traction with credibility. And some of the cheerleaders for this proposition, that it is the apocalypse if we don't pass this bill, would take us down that road. But of course, I remind this House that it was some of the past cheerleaders of the same lobby who told us that by today we'd all be dead and gone because of such horrible things which were going to happen. Al Gore, remember him? Back in 2006, he told us that the world had 10 years to avert a true planetary emergency. In 2009, he reckoned that there was a 75% chance that in five to seven years, the North Pole would be ice-free. The UN, back in 1989, an official said entire nations would be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. And the one I quoted in an earlier intervention, the executive director of the Environment Programme 39 years ago said, by the turn of the century, an environmental catastrophe will witness devastation as complete, as irreversible as any nuclear holocaust. And it's the same genre who are today telling us that the apocalypse is upon us. I acknowledge there is climate change. There always has been climate change. Over the millennia, our, our climate has changed time and time again. It is changing now. But frankly, I'd take a lot of convincing to believe it's all because of belching cows or industry or anything of that nature. And yet on the back of that, we are told we must do this. If we don't, we're doomed. And what is it, of course, that we've been asked to do? Well, very often when a bill is published in this House, the first thing I reach for is the explanatory and financial memorandum to see just what this bill is all about. Yes, I'll read the bill myself, but I want to see what the proponents are saying it's all about. 
And when I reach for this explanatory memorandum, I must say, it is the most audacious but vacuous document that I've read in a long time. Audacious in the sense that it tells us that the Climate Coalition in Northern Ireland represents over 390,000 people. Chair of the Agriculture Committee by this afternoon had it over 400,000. Well, interestingly enough, if you go to the website and look up the membership of the um, Climate Coalition, you will find that there are 26 individuals who belong, and then there's all sorts of corporate bodies and all sorts of institutions that belong. But how they get to 390,000, that creative, fictional situation is just not explained. But if you do go to their website, and I'll do it live, and you press on the button support our petition to back this bill, you will discover 1,559 people have signed the petition that the mass followed coalition has produced. 1,559. It was 1,558 this morning. So I do say that we do need to be more careful than some of the propaganda that has been ushered out on this matter. And then when I read this EMF and I go to background, I'm thinking to myself, well, what will they say about the Climate Change Committee's report? This is a document published on the 22nd of March. First letter, which is on their website from December of the Climate Change Committee to the Minister, had been there for three months. The background doesn't even mention it. Not a single reference in this EMF to the Climate Change Committee and the letter that they wrote. Now, Mr. Beggs has dealt very fully with it. That means I needn't deal as fully with it, but it is a very illuminating document. It tells us that achieving net zero emissions for the whole UK by 2050 does not necessitate that every part of the UK gets to zero emissions. Some parts will be net sources of greenhouse gases by 2050, with emissions offset in other parts that are net sinks. It does record the fact how much we are relied upon in the UK as a food producer, and that we are a net exporter with nearly 50% of all agri-food products going from Northern Ireland to GB. And therefore, it's right that we should have the benefit of the sinks which are elsewhere. And it goes on to be very clear, as Mr. Beggs expounded, that a consequence of forcing net zero on Northern Ireland is a substantial reduction in output from Northern Ireland's livestock farming. And that is why it says that by 2050, for Northern Ireland to get the whole UK to where it needs to be, 82% is sufficient. But not sufficient for those who drive this bill. They want us to go ahead of everyone else in terms of 100% and by 2045 have a 100% reduction. And all that with no regard to what it would do 
to our primary industry in Northern Ireland. The proposer of this motion managed to make a speech, and unless I missed it, didn't once mention agriculture. And yet, agriculture is the very foundation of our economy. Someone said in this debate, this bill doesn't set targets for agriculture. I'm well, sorry. Agri-food is identified. Clause 3.6i. Clause 3.7h. Sectoral plans. Sectoral plans inevitably will include targets. So this bill does anticipate setting sectoral plans with targets for our agri-food industry. We've all had many lobby letters on this subject, and rightly so, but probably the one that, for me, encapsulated the threat came from the Northern Ireland Grain Trade Association. Let me re read a couple of paragraphs from it, because I haven't heard them countered in this debate. The private member's bill proposed by the Green Party will be devastating to the agri-food sector. It will reduce the value of the livestock sector by more than 50 per cent, taking around one billion per annum out of the rural economy, leading to rural depopulation and a major loss of export earnings. There will be a loss of up to 50,000 jobs in the processing and supply industries, which will devastate the Northern Ireland economy. The private member's bill currently proposed is ill-considered and irresponsible. It ignores the UK climate changes advice, which recognises that the much greater importance of agriculture in Northern Ireland and that much of the food produced here is consumed in Great Britain. It also flies in the face of the excellent work carried out by our expert scientists and researchers in DERA and AFPI. And the reality is that the measures will contribute nothing to the global environment or to the challenge of feeding a growing population. The inevitable outcome of this policy is that the UK requirement for meat and dairy will simply be imported from regions where emissions are higher and animal health and welfare standards are much lower than in Northern Ireland. That, to me, sounds pretty irrefutable. And I've heard no one in this debate refute it. No one. So when people speak out of both sides of their mouth in this debate, and say, oh, we're going to look after the farming sector. We're going to consult. We're going to make sure these things don't happen. It's quite clear what will happen. Why? Because of this bill, if it is enacted. So you cannot, on the one hand, proclaim for the sake of your local constituency that you will protect the farming community while at the same time, trip through a lobby tonight, which will devastate your farming community. That's the reality that we face in this debate. And I do remind the House something I made in an intervention. The target set cannot be reduced. Clause 11 in this bill. We were told, oh, things can be reviewed and we can Look at things as we go along. Some things you can't look at. Clause 11 7 is clear. The Executive Office must not propose any alteration that has the effect, whether directly or indirectly, of lowering any target under Section 3 2 
from the level approved by the Assembly under Section 23, when the corresponding Climate Action Plan was so approved. There is no second chance under this bill to rescue a sector that you are so wantonly going to devastate. No second chance. You cannot reduce the targets. Mr. Speaker, the other point I wanted to talk about, or one of them was, the powers that this bill creates. It creates in clauses five and six in the relevant appendix. A Northern Ireland Climate Office, a Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner, and the staff appointed by the Commissioner. And there is no limit on the staff that the Commissioner can appoint. And indeed, there is no refusal of this House to approve the expenditure, because it is to be done under the Assembly Commission. And the Assembly Commission's budget is not alterable by this House. The Assembly Commission's budget is not something this House can tinker with. Once it gets through the Audit Committee, it follows inevitably. So by putting it under the Assembly Commission, this House is signing a blank check in terms of the cost of this office, of uh, this Northern Ireland Climate Office, and this Commissioner. And the bill goes on to tell us that salaries can be paid as high as the highest salary in the civil service. What's that? 170, 180,000 pounds? We truly are signing a blank check with this bill. Once we give the function to the Commissioner to appoint his or her own staff, and the Assembly Commission must do it, and it becomes part of the Assembly Commission's budget, then it's beyond our reach. Blank check is what this House is being asked to sign in respect of this bill. And of course, under this Clause 6, this Commissioner can acquire property. And another clause, I invited the sponsor to tell us what it meant, but she didn't oblige, is Clause 6 8. I read it again. The Climate Commissioner may do anything, including acquire or dispose of property or rights, which is calculated to facilitate or is conducive or incidental to the discharge of the functions of the Climate Commissioner. I asked, what does it mean to say that the Climate Commissioner can do anything, including disposing of rights. Yes? The member is perhaps one of the most experienced parliamentarians in this building, and he knows that in the real world what is going to happen, as his two private members' bills, uh, what happened with them, is this will go off to the committee, and the committee will be very diligent in teasing out all of his concerns, and no doubt when it comes back from the committee, there will be quite significant changes to what we have before us at the moment. And I also suspect that he, using his expertise, will table amendments at consideration stage if he's not happy. So the reality is he has concerns. Those will be dealt with at that stage, and the bill will come back, and he will get ample opportunity to scrutinise and to amend it accordingly. And he certainly has got the ability to do that. Of course, the much better option is not to let it get to committee, because it's so flawed and so disastrous in its potential that it'd be far better for this House to take courage and refuse it. Yes, I'll give one. The member for Northampton needs to come clean. Does he believe that man has any role 
in the climate change disaster that we're facing at the moment. Because if he doesn't believe that, if he believes it's just a natural occurrence, then he's right. There should be no bill because there's no crisis. Is that where he stands? Well, I think I've made a plain. I accept that we want, and we all should want, to leave this planet in better shape than we found it. But I'm not going to be swept along by the hysteria that climate change has never happened before and is only now happening because we have too many animals or too many factories or too many cars. Climate change has happened long before we had cars or anything else. Climate change does happen. Yes, profligate use of resources, I have no doubt, can add somewhat to it, but they are not the primary cause. Natural uh, cycles of climate change happen. That does not take away from us our obligation to do what is right, but not to do what is foolish. Yes? I am not sure uh, exactly what, what the member is saying, but in particular, does he not accept that during the time since the Industrial Revolution, there has been considerable more CO2 in the atmosphere and there is science involved in how it can adversely affect the climate? I, I do not think I have denied that, but I am saying the answer is not to take 50 per cent of our animals and slaughter them, to take 50 per cent of our production and export it to the being removed rainforests of Brazil and then sit back smugly and say, didn't we do well? Because that's the ethos of this bill. People, no matter how much Mr. Wells might not like it, are going to continue to buy meat. Or do they buy the meat that is produced in North Antrim? Or do they buy the meat that is produced in land that has been stripped out in the Amazon basin? That th is an issue that politicians in the Western world have to consider. And therefore, I say to this House, that this bill is, as I think the Northern Ireland Grade Association described it, is ill-considered. I am seeking to illustrate in some of its powers. It is extreme. It is full staff, no limit on the staff, no ability to control the expenditure. And what and all that of the block grant? Where do you think that money is coming from? It is coming out of the block grant. And of course, this bill also uh, includes the right to pay incentives. But as I finish with the powers of the Commissioner, Clause 10 also gives very sweeping powers to the uh, Commissioner to compel delivery of information. This is a largely unaccountable person being bestowed with those huge, those huge uh, capacities. And I come back to the point that I was distracted from, Clause 6 8. What rights, what rights is it that the Commissioner thinks they can dispose of? So here we are in this House saying that we are all going to sit back and be perfectly content that a Commissioner that we can't remove from office unless there is a two-thirds majority, who can be appointed in perpetuity every five years, itself something that can fix poorly with international standards, that a Commissioner, we are going to give them powers to dispose of property or rights in a sector which is dominated by the private sector. Are we serious? And maybe somebody before this debate ends will tell me what Clause 6 8 means. And if I'm wrong, to put me right. 
And on the question of cost, what a farce. When you go to the explanatory and financial memorandum to get an insight into what this policy that's in this bill is going to cost, what are you told? It has not been possible to precisely cost either of the above implications. That's the costs and the actions taken under the action plans. So you're being asked literally again to sign a blank check. The cost of the office itself, no cap on it, as highly paid as anyone in the civil service, can acquire property, clauses six, seven, can issue financial incentives, clause three, seven, To remind the House, no matter how punitive and unworkable all this ultimately turns out to be, because of Clause 11 2, you cannot reduce the targets. So, Mr. Speaker, I say to this House, it will not heed me. It will trip enthusiastically. Most members not having read the bill, I dare to say. Most members not having read the Climate Change Committee's letter will still trip through the lobbies to set on its way a piece of legislation which will devastate much of our basic industry and write a blank cheque as well on the way. It's not the right way to go, members. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I call Jerry Carl. Can I just remind members that the Minister will be called at 7 p.m. at the latest? And could I just ask members to be mindful of their own contributions because there are a number of people who want to contribute? Thank Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Polish socialist Rose Luxemburg said over 100 years ago that we are faced with a choice of overhauling the system in favour of socialism or face a dissent into barbarism. These words have been repeated countless times since, but I think it would be hard to imagine a scenario where this phrase could more aptly be applied in the climate crisis uh, facing our planet uh, today. The crisis we face ultimately has its roots in capitalism, in the pillaging, burning and aggressively extracting from our earth at a ceaseless rate to feed an ever-growing profit drive, regardless of the consequences for the environment. And those who bear the most responsibility sit at the top of society, raking in said profits, while shaping a narrative that all individuals share the responsibility for a crisis of their making. The failure of governments, or more realistically, uh, the complicity of governments around the world has fuelled rising temperatures, uncontrollable gas emissions, and the resulting weather catastrophes which harm the most vulnerable. That's the context under which this bill was written, and in that context, I think it's important, but unlike Mr. Beggs, I think it probably uh, doesn't go far enough to be uh, frank. But the reason I have agreed to co sign and support it, Mr. Speaker, is because it is a start locally to challenge climate change, and I remain utter utterly unconvinced that ministers in the executive would take even these introductory measures if left to their own devices. Mr. Speaker, we must see the rise of emissions, the use of fossil fuels and plastic, and environmentally damaging practices as being directly connected to the rise of capitalism, in particular the neoliberal version of the last 40 to 50 years, because environmental breakdown and inequality are essential to both. And I know that may sound like sacrilege to some in this House, but unless we point this out in many of the aims of this bill, our ability to effectively challenge the climate crisis in society at large will likely be unachievable. I welcome the role of a climate commissioner in this bill. An independent scrutineer of our environmental efforts will be vital to hold us to the aim of targeting the big uh, polluters and reducing emissions. And people today, Mr. Speaker, can be jailed for non-payment of TV licences, but major corporate polluters, people who are serial emitters and destroyers of our natural environment, who ignore and breach environmental regulations are likely to be given licenses, grants, and in many cases even protection from the, uh, from, uh, the police when challenged. This must change, and the role of the Climate Commissioner must be allowed to work without political or business interference. 
Mr. Speaker, I also want to welcome the focus within this bill on a just transition. We know beyond doubt that the climate crisis hurts those at the bottom of society the most, and through intervention, the most vulnerable must be assisted as we move towards a more eco oriented society. In order to stick to the principles of a just transition, there are a number of priorities I think we must adopt, whether through the process of this bill or future bills, and these are issues which uh, movements around the world are calling for. The first is the democratisation of planning and the economy. That would allow us to put the needs of communities and the environment first when making key decisions about resources. And it shouldn't be limited to just house building, although that is clearly important. We need to talk about democratising the planning and the funding of uh, food, transport as well. Take food. We have supermarkets planning how to fill their stores, what food production lines they use, what quality to bulk buy, all on the basis of maximising profit. This system is intrinsically linked to the production of food on the basis of profit rather than need, which generates waste, destroys the natural earth, and often produces huge amounts of emissions, particularly methane. In order to tackle this, we need to see farmers enabled to produce more sustainably and financially supported to do so. Small farmers in particular do not benefit from the current system, uh, as many have uh, maybe ducked the question. As Mike Davis has noted, the problem occurs because, and I quote, the world market misallocates crop production, beef over grain, and fails to deliver basic income to small producers and farm workers. But through a just transition uh, to sustainable production, we can see that change. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, big producers and even some in this House uh, would rather see us separate out the issue of agriculture and methane production. That is thoroughly unambitious and undermining. We need to look at the figures. 25% of human greenhouse emissions come from agriculture, food production and deforestation. And this kind of agriculture capitalism is ultimately failing workers as well as the planet. The UN has stated that uh, to feed a world population of 9.1 billion people, will require raising food production by around 70 per cent from 2005 uh, levels. Clearly, this will uh, lead to a massive spike in emissions and has to be addressed. And in doing so, we have to separate the interest of the small and medium farmers from those big food production plants, which ultimately have an interest in keeping things uh, as they <coughs> are. And I find it galling, Mr. Speaker, uh, that some have expressed full concern about farmers while supporting or saying nothing about the current Minister's plan to scrap the Agricultural Wages Board, which provides some protection for these workers. Workers in the food production line have been failed time and time again. Notably, they have suffered high rates uh, of COVID. They are paid extremely low wages and reports of conditions. Uh, particularly for migrant workers, they have a lot to be desired, and we need a just transition for them, importantly as well. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, we need a new system that includes farmers, food producers, uh, workers, uh, and one that puts the needs of communities at the centre of it. And I think this would catch, capture the spirit and, indeed, uh, the idea of a just transition that is contained within this bill. A just transition, Mr. Speaker, must also extend to the creation of a greener economy, which uh, creates jobs by building public homes which are fit for purpose by extending carbon sinks, rewetting bogs, homes, jobs, and a healthier environment. Tick, tick, tick. But it's this kind of break which threatens the private developers, the big extractors, and those who do well in society as it is. And that is where we get the resistance and lobbying. Mr. Speaker, any government worth its salt would have made a start on what is in this bill already, would have written an environmental charter for companies that forces them to adhere uh, to zero carbon and emission reductions, would have broken with their addiction to roads and cars already, would have forced pension funds to divest from destructive fossil fuel companies uh, or risk operating illegally, and many, many more uh, issues, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, it's worth just pointing out, Mr Speaker, that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, challenged that idea uh, that the state does not or cannot intervene in areas of uh, health or providing support uh, to communities and workers. And leaving aside how many people fell uh, through the cracks or how slow some actions were implemented, uh, the state uh, uh, intervened and implemented measures. And this puts it up to those who argue and support a Thatcherite, small state vision of society, uh, support further privatisation of public services, etc., etc. If a state can intervene in the middle of a global pandemic to provide some level of protection and support, then what 
what uh, justification can there be uh, for the lack of intervention to prevent further descent towards climate catastrophe, which will threaten the lives and health of our communities, millions of people across the world, and ultimately our ability to, our ability to survive uh, into the future? How many livelihoods could be improved or even saved with, with such an approach? Ultimately, I don't think uh, this bill or, or any bill will force the hand for, for action, um, but if limited, uh, are, are important steps in the right direction. But we know what it will take, Mr Speaker. It will take an almighty shift on the streets to break politicians with their reckless record instalments. So I want to finish, Mr Speaker, by obviously supporting the bill, uh, by extending my solidarity to the school students, XR activists, and all those people in the Climate Change Coalition and everyone who has stood up to protect the environment uh, recently and over the last number of years, all those campaigning against Alradian and Tyrone, those campaigning for action around the Muboy uh, dump, uh, residents in my own constituency campaigning to address the issues emanating from the Muller Glass site, and the many, 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 many more campaigns both here uh, on this island and across the world. Thank you. Thank you. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And in rising to support today's reading of the Climate Change Bill, I pay tribute. Uh, to the members from most of the parties here for bringing it to the House uh, and all the organisations and groups who helped to shape the bill that we have before us. We must make no mistake that regardless of flag or language or even the Northern Ireland Protocol, that which we discuss today will be the defining debate of our generation. None of us can shy away from the dis this discussion because all of us will be affected by the outcome of our deliberations and the impact that this bill will have on the world around us. Climate change is real, it is happening and it has been happening for some time. The stark reality is that unless we act now, then we will doom future generations to a world that has been irreversibly infected by the deadly effects of climate change. Action must be taken now, and that action must stem from this House. Leadership must lead and not be afraid to do so. Such leadership must be proactive and it must be consistent. Doing the bare minimum is not enough. That was evidenced last year when, upon taking up ministerial portfolio for infrastructure, Nicola Mallon, MLA, invested in an eco-friendly ministerial car, invested in zero-carbon public transport, delivered new cycle lanes, invested in climate-friendly street lighting and created a £20 million blue and green infrastructure fund. Minister Mallon has clearly set the benchmark for other ministers to follow. I normally would, but we're really pushed for time and I think you've had enough time here today. The bill which is before us has clear objectives. The overarching objective is to achieve net zero emissions in Northern Ireland by 2045 at the latest. A duty on the Executive Office to bring forward a climate action plan within three years and the establishment of a Northern Ireland Climate Office and Commissioner to set the targets free from political interference and to monitor their effectiveness. I am under no illusions these are ambitious targets to meet, but frankly I do not see ambitious targets as a justifiable reason for some to object to this bill. Mr Speaker, if we are bold enough to set our aspirations for our response to climate change at the highest level and we actually follow through on this, then we will cease to lag behind the rest of these islands and will potentially become the benchmark for other uh, regions to follow. I do appreciate that there are many people who have concerns around this bill. I have certainly been contacted by enough people within my constituency to this effect. South Down is, after all, predominantly a rural constituency, which has many agricultural heartlands. Farming and fisheries are part of the lifeblood of South Down and make an essential contribution to the economic success of the North. Coastal erosion is also a major issue in South Down, like other coastal constituencies, and has seen significant destruction of our natural coastlines and its hinterland. More recently, we have seen the immediate impact of climate change with further wildfires across the Mourns, where once these fires were happening uh, every four or five years, they are now taking place every year and sometimes numerous times in a year. Tragically, it has been pointed out to me that because our dry seasons are becoming drier and for longer, we could soon be witnessing wildfires in Ireland on the scale of those witnessed recently in Australia. Something needs to change. And I am glad that we will have the opportunity to discuss more of that tomorrow. 
Mr Speaker, I have heard the concerns of local farmers and those in our agri-food industry who have stated that they are ready and willing to do their bit in the fight back against climate change but want their voices to be heard and their valid concerns listened to. It is avail yes, of course. I appreciate the member giving way as I haven't had an opportunity to speak on this very important bill coming forward. There, there does appear to be a perception that what we're voting on today is the bill. Would the member join with me in putting on record that this is stage two of a bill to put in place a, frame, an, a framework which will then feed into action plans? And I would encourage those farmers who have been in contact with myself and the members' office to engage in that process, because the farmers in South Down, like the farmers everywhere, are in the most privileged position to affect change and to ensure that farming going forward is sustainable in the long term. I thank the, the, the member for her contribution, and it's great to hear a range of voices from South Down rather than just the same one. And if we reflect back to some of the other contributions that we have had, who were taking it clause by clause by clause, you would feel that this is the actual bill that's being voted on tonight. Of course, it is the principles, as you have pointed out, and therefore there are still many, many opportunities to engage uh, to help shape this bill as it moves forward. And it is of the utmost importance that as today's bill progresses, that those people are listened to and the government works with them and does not leave them behind. While there are valid uh, concerns over potential job losses as a result of this bill, we must remember that this bill presents opportunities for growth in the green and sustainability sectors. We will need to see the development of a just transition, and this element will be critical going forward. Mr Speaker, perhaps the loudest voice in this ongoing debate has been that of young people. Of everything we discuss in this place, climate change is going to be uh, the issue that determines the story of their future. The start of that story has already been written. However, we still have the opportunity to write our contribution and smooth the way forward for future generations. The alternative is just to kick the can down the road and leave this fight to the next generation. Years from now, when most of us will lie in scorched earth graves, our next generations will be left to step out into polluted air where every breath is contaminated and every step in the sunlight is a step closer to skin cancer. Then they will rightly ask the question, why did this assembly not act when it had the chance? Should that awful day come, Mr Speaker, it will be something which we will not be excused for, and rightly so. The next generation will not forgive and they will not forget. The time is always right to do what is right, and that time is now. Doing the basics isn't going to cut it anymore. It is time to right the wrongs of the past and bring forward an ambitious and bold legislative framework to deliver a zero-carbon society and economy. Every party that seeks to be part of our government must commit to that, and the SDLP will not be found wanting. I thank the member for bringing this bill before us. I wish well with its progress, and I am more than content to support it. I thank a member for his cooperation, and I call Andre Muir, but I could just remind members that your own remarks and the length of your contribution will determine how many further speakers are having an opportunity. But the Minister will be called at 7 p.m. sharp. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I am very conscious of that, so I will try to keep my um, comments brief. And tonight I want to focus upon how the bill will impact upon infrastructure, and particularly transport, as the Alliance Party's um, infrastructure spokesperson. In saying that, I do believe that this bill is long overdue and the need for legislation is clear. Um, there is much to commend about the bill as it currently stands. There is a need for Northern Ireland Pacific emissions reductions targets, and there is a need for regular reporting on emissions reductions and the need for independent monitoring. It has also, and has been outlined uh, recently and throughout the debate, this is the start of a passage of the debate. We are at the second stage. There will be the committee stage, the further uh, the consideration stage, and the further consideration stage, as Mr Allister uh, sorry, <laughs> is, is aware. Um, so this is part of a, an engaging and an iterative uh, process. I do particularly welcome the focus on short-term targets. It is all too easy for politicians today to promise emission reduction targets more than 20 years down the line, safe in the knowledge they will not, perhaps, be about to see them through. To make them real, these long-term targets need to be combined with short-term targets and measures for which this bill provides for. Often when we are debating matters in this Assembly, it is on an us versus them or right versus wrong basis. 
As this bill passes through the legislative process, I look forward to an evidence-based discussion on the measures included in this bill, and the knowledge that everyone has agreed on the need to cut emissions, and everyone has agreed that this really matters. I welcome provision in the bill for sectorial plans, whereby specific sectors will focus on how they can reduce their own emissions. Targets are meaningless if they do not have tangible immediate, immediate actions to back them up. With regards to infrastructure, transport accounts for somewhere between 16 per cent and 23 per cent of Northern Ireland's emissions. Our transport emissions per head are higher than average than in the rest of the UK. Yet perhaps most disturbingly of all, over the past 20 years, at a time when cars have become cleaner, our transport emissions have grown by 29 per cent. On transport, it is abundantly clear that we are heading in the wrong direction and need to turn around fast. This bill legislates for the declaration of a climate emergency, something that this Assembly voted for early last year, and something that, in reality, we have been aware of for much longer than that. And yet, it is one thing to declare an emergency, it is quite another to respond as if you are in an emergency. In the past decade, we have improved our public transport network immeasurably, delivering better quality services and customer experiences. But there is still not enough progress in generating that modal shift from cars to active travel and public transport. As uh, Philip McGuigan outlined earlier during the debate, Jonathan Hobbs from NI Greenways recently reported that 25 kilometres of cycling infrastructure has been built over the last five years in the whole of Northern Ireland. The current Minister for Infrastructure, with the best of intentions, no doubt, pledged last year to seize the opportunity for a green recovery from COVID-19. But yet, more than a year later, we find ourselves deeply frustrated at the pace of change. Active travel made up 2.5 per cent of the Department for Infrastructure's capital budget for last year. For every one person that works in DFI's Transport Policy Division, which includes active travel, more than 40 work in DFI roads. We want to support the Minister in her bold action as required in the Department. And this bill is one key way that we can kickstart the radical action needed to reach net zero emissions for infrastructure. This will, as actions required, include the rapid rollout of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. The current setup is a shambles. Rebalancing the Department Infrastructure's budget to properly fund active travel and reviewing concessionary fares to get more young people using a rapidly decarbonised public transport network. Last month, the Alliance Party published our Green New Deal, and it sets out many other measures that we would need to take to meet the requirements set out in this bill. Whilst having a walking and cycling champion is welcome, the reality is that it is a role simply added as a duty to another civil servant. If we were to get real about making the modal shift, we need to have an independent, sustainable and active travel champion. Mr Speaker, we all know what needs to be done to avert climate catastrophe, and we know that it can be done while growing our economy and creating a fairer and more equitable society. We support this bill today at second stage because it is a key part of the process of making that vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And it has been said that we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. And today, the second stage reading is a historic moment for Northern Ireland. And I'm not going to go into much detail of the bill's clauses. The co-sponsors have done this already. But it is a historic moment that we need to consider and to demonstrate our commitment to protecting our children's future and the generations to come. Year after year, glaciers retreat and polar ice caps melt at a faster rate. Global temperatures keep rising. The science is there, and we all know the importance of listening to the science, especially in this last year. So why have we not been listening to the science that has been staring us in the face for so long? We see more and more extreme weather events, wildfires that destroy everything in their path, and we need to rebalance. And a change in climate is not something that is far off in the future, something that is not affecting us or something that we are avoiding. It's happening right now. It's already affecting energy prices, crop yields, food and water supplies across the globe, which results in higher prices and food shortages in poorer countries, leading to political instability, conflict and the mass movement of people. Changing climates are already changing our food systems in the, most, in the more common extreme events come. The change in rain patterns and land exploitation, the riskier our food security becomes, having a detrimental impact on those on the lowest incomes. There is nothing just about this, and the direction of travel only further divides 
and it shows inequalities. But it doesn't have to be this way. If we show the right leadership today, we can prevent further catastrophe. The next century will be dominated by necessary, ambitious climate mitigation and adaptation. And this climate bill gives Northern Ireland the tools to operate in that changing world. It will bring about the governments, the plans, the targets, the budgets, the expertise, the audits, the reviews and the duties and the commitments that have been missing for far too long. The climate emergency transcends party politics. The climate emergency does not differentiate between political viewpoints. It is something that should unite us all to do something and do everything that we can to mitigate against the worst effects. Ms Bergwigan earlier said that he wasn't designated as an eco-warrior, but I am, in the very book that we all signed when we became MLAs. And so I'm glad to see that the cross-party support on this bill from all designations. So members, don't be fooled by the cynicism of those who have no desire to change or do things better because it will not, it will, will for those to, stick, to continue to stick their heads in the sand. Vested interests and denial will not save us from rising sea levels and extreme weather. Genuine partnership and cooperation between scientists, businesses, economic sectors and people will. This is what democracy and good politics looks like, and we must use effective partnerships to secure climate justice, and this is exactly what this bill does. There are many voices who will urge us not to do anything too radical. You know the usual lines we've all heard before. We need a little more time to consider things. One mustn't rock the boat too much. Why spend money on cutting emissions when we're only a tiny part of a huge global economy? Or the old favourite, Mr Speaker, um, especially within Northern Ireland, the point in the fingers. Sure, what about China? The waterboutery continu continues. We've got more pressing things on at the moment. Let others do the hard work and we can follow later. Or we're just doing fine. Well, apart from the moral bankruptcy of those arguments and the fact that we are not doing just fine, if we do not invest in a low carbon just economy now, we will be left behind and in pretty short order. We must adjust and rethink how we treat our environment and our land and support the agricultural sector, which has been the subject of much of today's focus in the debate, but also in other sectors too. And this is why the principles of the just transition are included in the bill through the sectoral plans, which must support jobs and the growth of jobs that are climate resilient and environmentally and socially sustainable, support net zero carbon investment in infrastructure, create high value, fair and sustainable work, reduce inequality and reduce with a view to eliminating poverty and social deprivation. For workers in any sector, this should provide reassurance that they will be supported and brought along in the switch to a low carbon economy. But with no carbon tar car targets and incredibly poor environmental regulation, Northern Ireland will realise too late that we can no longer compete in the green economy. And that will not be their fault, but ours, for failing to provide the leadership that it is needed now. And I want to commend and thank everyone who has played their part in getting the bill here to the second stage today, to the coalition, to the co-signatures, and especially to my party leader and colleague, Claire Bailey, MLA. There has been an incredible amount of hard work put into this, hardly ill-considered, as some have suggested, and there is much more work to do. But I, too, have a few short words for our children and young people, like other have, others have done. This bill is for you. To all those young activists out there fighting for your future, demanding better and demanding action rather than just words or politicians paying lip service to your concerns and greenwashing. So I say well done and thank you for protesting. Thank you for lobbying your elected reps. You may not have the ability to vote yet, but you can raise your voice loud and clear and you are engaging with democracy and you are certainly being heard by us. We are listening and we too are fighting hard so that the world you inherit will be more secure and prosperous, where the air is cleaner, where the land is less polluted and you have happier, healthier lifestyles and live in happier and healthier communities and where you are living in a more just world and a more equal world. The time is now for this Assembly to speak with one unified voice, that we understand the impact of climate breakdown and we are doing something about it. For the sake of those that will inherit the earth long after we are gone, this is not just about commitments made in past political agreements, this is about our shared future. A very wise man once said, you can't fix the roof when it's raining, and this climate bill will give Northern Ireland the tools to ensure that we are watertight. Join us and fight for your children's future and vote, vote in favour of this bill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I feel a bit um, incompetent almost following that really great speech by, by Ms. Woods. Um, 
I rise to support this historic second stage of the Climate Bill. I also rise to acknowledge the concerns because I believe that too is our responsibility. This is primary legislation. It is not prescriptive. It provides legislative bases, a mandate to build uh, climate policy. It is a process, not an event. A process which I hope will enable stakeholders from all sides of this debate to contribute and shape this policy. Clause 1 provides for a declaration of climate emergency from the date of royal assent. It is, a, it is an acknowledgement that climate change exists and fully supports government to address the single biggest issue of our time, one that has transcended generations and one that will outlive each of us. We owe it to future generations to do what we can to prevent further decline of our environment and give children and young people and those yet to be born a fighting chance of climate recovery. Clause 2 relates to the creation of climate action plans, plans with details that will be taken to address the challenges of climate change in Northern Ireland. It must be laid within the Assembly within three years of enactment and every five years thereafter, a clear path of action. These plans must be approved by the Assembly and must achieve the overriding climate objective, which is net zero carbon. Scrutiny is, is the key to democracy. And it's not there to undermine, it's there to improve and strengthen. Clauses 5 to 10, schedules 1 to 2, creates the, uh, establishes the Northern Ireland Climate Office and the Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner. It's interesting that this will be appointed by the Crown on nomination by this Assembly to allow maximum independence from government. I think this is important because it means politics then can't come into this and it means that someone is dedicated in taking forward the, the climate needs of our society. And again, all of this demonstrates the Assembly's commitment to addressing climate change. Mr Speaker, I represent a rural constituency in East Londonderry, and a number of farmers, a considerable number of farmers in the area, have contacted me to share their concerns. And whether unfounded or not, there is genuine fear within the agricultural sector that they will be disproportionately impacted by this bill, primarily because they say that Northern Ireland is a livestock region. They tell me this is due to our climate, poor weather, and our, our countryside not being conducive to arable farming because it's hilly and stony. Farmers say that much of our land is only good for grazing animals. To be honest, I really don't know, and I'm not sure about this. But I will certainly not claim to know more than farming uh, um, and land than farmers do. So I do think it is important that we listen to all these stakeholders, if not only to reassure them. I have spent much time these past weeks, like other members, speaking with farmers and groups such as uh, Ulster Farmers Unions, and they have expressed many concerns. But in fairness, they also acknowledge the need for climate change legislation and would, urge, uh, and would argue that they are indeed ahead of trying to find solutions for the climate problems. For example, a farmer within my constituency collects tyres to be re uh, reused and processed into mattresses. He tells me that the majority of tyres in Northern Ireland, however, will either end up on bonfires or a very big bonfire across the world as the main method of disposal. Huge ships collect this waste from Belfast and take the problem elsewhere, despite a local business offering a local environmental solution. But when presenting this idea to statutory agencies, it was dismissed. In another part of my constituency, a farmer is growing acres of hemp the wonder crop for sustainable environment. It loves Northern Ireland's wet climate, literally grows as if it's a weed. It improves soils, has no emissions, indeed will offset carbon from elsewhere and other industries. Even the licence to grow it here is free. But trying to encourage Northern Ireland government and its various agencies to see what's good for them, what's good for Northern Ireland and what's good for the environment is incredibly frustrating. Mr Speaker, I say all of this to demonstrate why farmers are nervous about this radical change. As a co-sponsor, I believe this change is good. I want to convey why this change is good, but I am very sympathetic to those who fear this change. So I suggest that maybe the issue here is not one of climate action, but rather government inaction. Indeed, this is why it has taken a private member's bill and very little time left in the mandate to actually do something, because our government has not. And I appreciate the department is developing its own legislation, and I genuinely welcome this. But if this private member's bill serves only to force the government to do their job, then I am grateful to all involved. But it shouldn't be this way. 
government needs to get a grip on this issue now. I know it, most members of this House know it, and the public knows it. And if they cannot do it on their own, then this legislation will support the government in doing it. So to come back to our stakeholders, and it is again important to acknowledge their concerns as part of this process, if only to reassure them, and in the hope that we can actually strengthen this bill and, if necessary, shape it to meet the core objective of, of, of addressing climate change. It is not the spirit of this bill to diminish livelihoods, to de decimate an economy, to undermine security of food supply or to remove the heart of rural communities, but rather it seeks to encourage collective responsibility for future generations. I want farmers to contribute to this conversation so that we don't get it wrong and create unintended consequences. I want them to be part of the solution as they tell me they already are. Can they offset carbon emissions through better countryside management schemes? For example, replacing all fences with hedgerows, growing out unused land, exploring new crops that are suited to NI's climate so that the net zero target is less challenging to meet than they expect. If we genuinely care about this planet in its entirety, rather than just our very small corner of it, maybe we stop exporting our waste, because shipping the issue on a big boat does not remove the issue, it sends it elsewhere. And this leads me into an interesting concern raised by farmers. By reducing our food production coming from livestock, are we reducing our supply despite static or growing demand? And if demand remains consistent, where is the food coming from if not locally? Are we adding to the carbon footprint if we are using airplanes and other, air, other transport to bring it in? Again, I am not sure of the weight of this argument, especially as intensive farming increases and more food is being exported out of Northern Ireland, but it is worth exploring, and I hope this process, this legislative process, will address this to reassure the significant section within our economy. It makes up uh, agriculture in, in Northern Ireland is a significant part of our economy, and I think it's only fair that we listen to their concerns, if not to reassure them. Ireland is well known for its grass-fed beef and dairy, rather than the grain-fed cattle in other parts of the world, which I understand adds to the issue. This type of farming replenishes the land, which can help with carbon emissions. If agri-food uh, will continue to farm livestock in some uh, medium, perhaps there are better ways of doing it, and maybe the model is already on these islands, and, much, and people can learn from, uh, from our model here. Carbon emissions also seem to be a problem for industrial farming, yet we have encouraged large industrial farms across Northern Ireland, despite concerns raised over many years, where the only benefit to farmers is, is, is the, the rent of the land. The consequences of overproduction of manure byproduct, which our lands can no longer take, are polluting our environment. These issues sit uh, sits alongside driving down farm gate prices as industrial farm, far, uh, farming um, increases supply um, with de uh, declining demand. If we want to support rural communities, protecting farming families, ensure that produce locally stays locally to ensure security of food supply so farmers can feed themselves and their families, as well as creating a sustainable and fair livelihood, maybe this bill needs to look at, at tackling industrial farming. Mr Speaker, I will leave it there, but I think it is important, as I have said a number of times in my contributions, that we do listen to these concerns, not to reject this bill, but to try and shape it and improve it and ensure that we get the, the, the backing from all within Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Justin McNulty. Just remind the member that the minister will be called no later than seven o'clock. One can see from space how the human race has changed the earth. Nearly all of the available land has been cleared of forest and is now used for agriculture or urban development. The polar ice caps are shrinking, and the desert areas are increasing. At night. The earth is no longer dark, but, but large areas are lit up. All of this is evidence that human exploitation of the planet is reaching a critical limit. But human demands and expectations are ever increasing. We cannot continue to pollute the atmosphere, poison the ocean and exhaust the land. There isn't any more available. Not my words, but the words of the late Dr. Stephen Hawking. These are profound words. They send a chill down my spine and they lay down a challenge to, us, to those of us across the globe elected to public office to do something about it. Concola, I rise to support the second stage of the Climate Change Bill and thank Mrs Bailey for her work on this issue. 
The planet is hotter now than it has been for at least 12,000 years, a period spanning the entire development of human civilization, according to research, and it hasn't just happened by a force of nature. We, the human race, have caused this, and we, the human race, have a responsibility to change course. It's not too late, and in the words of Greta Thunberg, I have learned you are never too small to make a difference. Cam Corla, I am off the land and from the land. I was born and reared in rural South Armagh. I am a culture and proud. I love and cherish the beauty of our natural heritage, our mountains and our landscape, our waterways and our environment. I was reared farming my uncle Patsy on my auntie Roisin's farm. I cannot begin to describe the life lessons I learned from my upbringing on the farm and from my dear uncle, God rest him. I have fond memories of taking in the hay, of milking cows, calving, testing, reseeding, dosing, fencing, feeding, tagging, draining, horning, spreading bag stuff, mowing, counting cattle. Not so fond memories of covering the silage twice a year. I so miss the feeling of closing the bar door when the milking was finished. So I understand and sympathise with farmers who are concerned. They are concerned that their lives and livelihoods will be impacted. But farmers want to play their part. Farmers and every other stakeholder and sector must be involved in shaping the bill as it progresses, and they must be informed and incentivised on how they can play their part to not alone protect the environment, but to enhance their roles as custodians and stewards of the land. Rewilding, reforestation and species reintroduction must be incentivised and rewarded alongside traditional farming. That said, the farming piece and the agri-food piece are only two parts of the climate change jigsaw. We all see the carnage and the damage done to our lands, our ecology, our, our ecosystems by the activities of the human race. Yes, part of it relates to the over-intensification of farming, but there is also the industrialisation traffic, over-industrialisation traffic, the pollution of our lands and our waterways by dumping of waste, the plasticification of our daily lives, the dumping of smugglers' fuel waste, the impact of fossil fuels, the exponential growth and the creation of greenhouse grasses. So this bill, as it progresses, must engage and encourage a cross-sectoral approach and a cross-sectoral responsibility. As a new dad, I want my son to have the same love, respect and appreciation for the land that I do, the sea and the delicate planet we live on. In 20 or 30 years' time, if he asks me what I did to protect the environment, I want to be able to tell him I did all I could. Count Corley, I do appreciate that this issue is not without contention and that this debate may not be universally welcomed in every part of our community. As I have said, I do appreciate that there are concerns about lives and livelihoods. I thank all of those who have contacted me on both sides of the argument. My team and I will endeavour to respond to each of you individually. But to me, it is real simple. There is no planet B and we need to do the right thing. We need to work with communities, with business and with industry to change behaviours and practices and policies. We need to be ambitious and we need to build a collaborative process bringing people, stakeholders and society with us. We all need to think and act differently from what we eat to the way we produce foods to the way we package foods and goods to transport and to the way we deal with waste. Pulling up a few wind turbines, using reusable water bottles and more electric charging points for cars, while it's important on their own, will not be enough. I'd like to educate the Alliance member who doesn't know about the FASTA project. Maybe he should get more up to speed on what's going on on the ground. Small token measures will not cut through and will not save our planet. Cam Corley, climate change is, ch is the challenge of our generation. If we are to leave this world in a better place, then we need to start now. Now is the time. In 20 years' time, would have, could have, should have is not going to have saved our environment. I do want to talk about how impressed I am about the way in which this issue has captivated and activated our young people. I am inspired by their activism and their determination and their impatience for change to make this a better place. They rightly see this issue as being far more important than identity, culture or tradition. And they, firmly are challenging us to do more, to protect the environment and to make change happen. Cam Corley, when I think of our planet and our natural world, I think of Sir David Attenborough. So I believe it's appropriate for me to finish with a quote from him. Young people, they care. They know that this is the world that they are going to grow up in. 
that they're going to spend the rest of their lives in. But I think it's more ideal idealistic than that. They actually believe that humanity, human species, has no right to destroy and despoil regardless. The biggest threat to the environment is the belief that someone else will save it. I say we all must save it. Thank you. And uh, I want to call the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to respond to the bill. Much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to begin by highlighting once more that I have developed policy proposals for a balanced and evidence-based climate change bill, but I've not been able to discuss these at the executive, despite the fact that I've been seeking to get them on the agenda since the 24th of March. Once these can be tabled at the executive and an agreement is secured to proceed, I can quickly move to introduce the right climate change legislation for Northern Ireland, which delivers on the new decade new approach commitments. I am disappointed that despite the new decade new approach agreement that we would tackle climate change, I have not been able to get my proposals tabled for discussion. Proposals that have went through due process have went through public consultation, which this bill has not done. I would also like to highlight one of the reasons why we did not have a climate change bill before now compared to the rest of the UK. It is because these institutions were collapsed for three years by Sinn Féin, and important work like this was not taken forward. People should not forget that and forget the fact that they put everything else um, on, the, on the slow burner because of their own issues. I have deep concerns about the bill brought before us today. And due to those serious concerns, I cannot support the Member's Bill, as I believe it would be seriously damaging to Northern Ireland. I have a large number of concerns about this bill, but will outline the main ones today, which I feel each and every one of us should take into consideration. My first concern is the extremely important issue of the targets set within the Bill. It is far removed from the independent expert advice and evidence that I cannot support it. Indeed, based on the evidence I have received and shared widely, a net zero by 2045 target would be extremely detrimental to our economy without actually reducing global greenhouse gas emissions, but would rather, would, but rather would simply shift our emissions elsewhere. Ultimately, this would mean shifting our food production to those areas who are responsible for cutting down rainforests, the very lungs of the earth. Is this really the result that you want for the people of Northern Ireland that you represent? I hope that all members of the Assembly will pay heed and give serious consideration to what I have to say now regarding my concerns and what I consider to be a very damaging bill to Northern Ireland. And this is a view which evidence supports. I am not simply asking you to take my word on this. I want you to take into account the lack of evidence being provided by the sponsors and drafters of the bill, the existing and publicly available expert and independent evidence and advice from the UK Climate Change Committee, which we will now refer to as the CCC going forward, and my consideration of responses to a proper consultation that I and my department carried out on climate change bill policy proposals for Northern Ireland, and my consideration of the voices of those who have contacted me, and many of you in recent weeks, who have been most deeply negatively impacted by such an unevidence target of net zero emissions by 2045. I thank the Minister for giving way, and he, he talks about evidence and consultation and his own proposals. Can I ask the Minister to confirm that the majority of those who responded to his consultation uh, suggested that 2045 should be the appropriate target for net zero? What, what I can confirm is the science-based evidence that has been provided, independent evidence to my department. Now, if the member wants me to ignore independent scientific advice, stand up and say it. OK, he does not want to. Firstly, the CCC have categorically stated that a net zero target by 2015 for Northern Ireland, covering all greenhouse gases, cannot credibly be set at this time let alone by 2045, as proposed in the Private Member's Bill. 
the CCC have advised on the basis of their evidence and analysis that at least 82 per cent net greenhouse gas emissions reduction target is not appropriate and fair contribution to a balanced pathway to a UK net zero, which aligns with the UK commitment to the Paris Agreement. We, as one country, the United Kingdom, can achieve 100 per cent net zero. Northern Ireland, as a major provider of protein for people's food intake in the United Kingdom, does not have to meet the same as the rest of the United Kingdom because it is doing that. And whilst we can do significant, uh, uh, or go forward significantly on transport, on energy, because of the high production rate in agri-food in Northern Ireland, it is much more challenging. So for Northern Ireland to reach at least 82 per cent net emissions reduction target, a percentage reduction greater than is required in the rest of the UK to reach net zero. So by way of example, Scotland are almost halfway to net zero emissions, having a 45 per cent reduction at 2018, while Northern Ireland are under a quarter of the way to reaching, uh, re reaching that. So at least 82 per cent reduction, with only a 20 per cent reduction achieved at 2018. So at least 82 per cent reduction is in no way lacking ambition. And I'd have to say it is easier to move up towards 100 than to be locked into 100 per cent unable to move anywhere. And there's the outcome of that will be to devastate our rural communities. And I look at members across the room representing Mid Ulster, South Antrim, North Antrim, West Rhodome, East Londonderry, South Down, and other areas. And is that what you really want? A devastated rural community where tens of thousands of households lose their source of income, the food that goes on their table, the roof that goes over their head. They don't have a source of income to do it because their jobs have been removed from them. Is that what you want, Mr McGuigan? I thank the Minister for giving way. I, mean, I think it is important to put on record that the private member's bill has been brought forward in response to the lack of inaction by the Minister. And I also think it is important to put on record that it is not appropriate for the Minister to scaremonger in this chamber today. He is well aware that the area committee will be calling experts to give evidence, including the CCC, that he puts so much stock involved in. And he also is clearly aware that the carbon action plans will have to be agreed by all the members in this assembly. Well, you see, I have to deal with the uh, misleading information that the, that the member has, has, has just spoken, because he says a, a lack of action. Yet our department has went through a full consultation process, a public consultation process, which this bill has not, and engaged with the public and went through processes right. So whenever I was asked to produce this bill in three months, and I said it was impossible. It was impossible for my department to do that because you normally give at least eight or 12 weeks for public consultation. So what was being asked of me last year was not achievable. I indicated that it was not achievable. And there is always a saying that rushed le legislation is bad legislation. And that is what we are dealing with today. We are dealing with rushed legislation, which has not properly consulted the public and has therefore just written off the rural community. I stand here as a defender of the rural community. I stand here as a defender of the hill farmers and the sparrows and the Antrim Plateau, which Sinn Féin do not seem to care about anymore. And contrary to what the proposer of the bill suggested, I will. Um, the Minister, there's a couple of points I just want to pick up on there. The Minister uh, is citing the UK CCC comments you know, as the only evidence there is to do with here. Now, one of the things which, which I, I can't genuinely get my head around is that we are on the same island as the south of Ireland. We are one country. The south of Ireland, the emissions from uh, agriculture is a, is a third. We are 27 per cent. Why is it in the south of Ireland you have experts in the south of Ireland through Chagas who, who are not making those dairy predictions? And how, why is it that the president of the Irish Farmers Association in the south of Ireland has said it is pure nonsense? to suggest there's going to be hard cuts to achieve uh, GHG uh, emissions. And I want to uh, cut, and I want to just pick up one thing as well. Um, 
uh, Claire Bailey, when I was out of the room, I actually heard Claire Bailey on the, on the um, television. And she made the point that th th this, this is the beginning of a process. This isn't an event. We are going to spend the next six months, our, our committee, our area committee, is going to spend the next six months scrupulous, scrupulously analysing this bill. We're getting experts in, we're getting roundtable events, we're having public consultation exercises, we're getting experts from across the water in Britain and from here in Ireland and, of course, uh, other parts of the world as well to help us reach a firm conclusion. But this is a process, this is not an event. Maybe uh, the member should tell his Sinn Féin colleague, Matt Carty, about, about w w what his views are, because he says we're importing from countries of more intensive production, such as those in South America. This is not climate action. This is hypocrisy. That's what your own colleague says about what you're pressing today. I've listened to government representatives all throughout the debate talking about just transition and fairness for rural communities, and none of them have specified what that means in reality. I've listened to the same today. I would agree with your Sinn Féin colleague, Mr Carty, who recognises the damage that you're doing to rural communities, the damage that you're doing to hill farmers in particular, because it is those in marginalised lands who, who will face the harshest cuts as a consequence of what you are backing today, of what you're going into the lobby behind me to support today. Contrary to what the proposal of the bill suggested at a recent briefing to the ERA committee, the CCC are clear that there is no credible pathway at this time for net zero by 2050 in Northern Ireland, and they cannot recommend such a target for Northern Ireland. They have advised that reaching net zero in 2050 would require one or both of the following. A substantial reduction in output from Northern Ireland's livestock farming sector, which even, where even a reduction of more than 50 per cent in livestock numbers would not get us to net zero, without a corresponding reduction in consumption of such produce. This would simply shift emissions overseas for no overall benefit. And I might add that if we are shifting it to South America, the estimate that it will take twice as much carbon per kilogram of beef produced for that beef than the beef that's produced in Northern Ireland. So why do you want to devastate our rural landscape? Why do you want to devastate our rural fabric? Why do you want to devastate our rural communities? and then import beef from an area which is producing it at twice as much carbon going into the atmosphere as we are doing here in Northern Ireland. And I will give way to anybody who wishes to, 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 to answer that. The Minister has been quoting Lord Devon and the UKCCC as the experts, and I don't take away from the fact that they are experts. Does he also accept Lord Devon's uh, message to us that if we don't sign up to le climate legislation, that we will be punished by the rest of the world? And does he not accept the fact that, given the fact that a lot of our agri-food is produced across the island of Ireland, that we are sending the wrong message to the rest of the world, that the North isn't committed to climate change leg legislation within the Paris uh, Agreement, whereas the South of Ireland is? And that's exactly why we are signing up to legislation. That's why I have been waiting for six weeks, near, almost seven weeks now, for that legislation to be allowed through uh, the executive. And your own colleagues are holding it back. So let's, let's get it out there and let's debate it. And let's have the legislation put in front of you that was publicly consulted upon and ensure that we do drive this forward. Not every part of the United Kingdom will achieve 100 per cent. Some will have sinks which will achieve greater and other areas won't. And we happen to be one of those areas that actually are engaged in producing high levels of food for uh, the United Kingdom and, and beyond, around 10 per cent of the United Kingdom's uh, food uh, in terms of proteins. And that is something which we have exported very successfully, and we are doing extremely well with a low carbon footprint for the amount of kilograms of beef produced and litres of milk produced. And a much greater than equitable share of all UK greenhouse gas removal technologies being located in Northern Ireland compared to the size of Northern Ireland's current emissions, population, land area or economy, which would both be costly and suboptimal. That is a further quote from the Climate Change Committee. They have identified that costs of reaching net zero by 2050 would be higher than those of their recommended 82 per cent reduction target by up to £900 million per year by 2050. So, Ms Bailey didn't give any figures. 
But there is figures there. Now, I pose a question. Where does the £900 million come from? Does it come from health, education, DFI? Which department are you going to take this additional funding come from? Because we are going to have to invest heavily in the first instance, and this is a further additional £900 million per annum that you are going to walk through the lobbies for very shortly. So, whenever, before you do it, I ask a question. Where is that money coming from? What department do you want to take it from? What service do you want to take it from? Because it's important. Reaching net zero by 2045 would have even greater cost implications. And we have no evidence from this private member's bill as to what costs might be, as they have not provided any sort of economic impact assessment. In fact, I see no evidence of any impact assessments such as economic needs or indeed rural needs, having been carried out in relation to this bill today. Whilst it may not be possible to fully identify the cost implications of reaching net zero by 2045, there is enough independent expert evidence of likely significant impacts of such a target, and in particular respect of the agriculture sector. For example, even based on the at least 82 per cent net emissions reduction by 2050, the CCC have indicated significant investments are required, such as low carbon capital investment, needing to scale up to nearly one to one and a half billion pounds per year by 2030 in Northern Ireland. And your proposal is to put another 900 million pounds per year on top of that. That's the sort of figures that we are talking about. So close to two and a half billion pounds per annum to be found out of the Northern Ireland uh, block budget. Yes. The member experience of this building, and he knows we're only at the initial stages of this. Remember, use the microphone. Sorry. Sorry. Just, thank you. Uh, most people can hear me, Mr. Speaker, but uh, most people don't want to hear me. It wouldn't be hand started if you don't speak to him. <laughs> what I would say is he has vast experience of this building, and we are only at the initial stage of this process. He knows from his experience it is going to go through the committee, where Mr McAleer and his team will dissect it line by line. It will come back here, probably in a very different form, after that process, and there will be a whole series of amendments. So This is only today accepting the concept and the principle of a climate change bill. It does not accept we have to have one. And secondly, would we be discussing this bill at all? Would we, he be suggesting at all a climate change bill if the private members' bill hadn't arrived on the scene? Uh, absolutely, because the, the work was being done on it. So we, we, we were doing the work to go out to public consultation uh, before the private members' bill uh, was actually brought forward. And I think that the, the wise thing to do is to ensure that the bill does go through the executive and does go out to the Northern Ireland public so that we can have something which has been um, done properly in that we have went through the public consultation process uh, so neatly ignored um, by the, the, the sponsors of this bill. Sorry, yes. Mr Forgivenway, the Minister is talking much about matters in relation to public consultation. Can the Minister confirm that he does not support any private members' bills introduced in this House without that particular type of consultation prior to introduction? Well, the members asked the question. I have raised the issue of public consultation. This is something which is going to affect every single person in Northern Ireland, given the costs associated with it and given the impact of it. And it is particularly going to affect the rural community. Therefore, the appropriateness of bringing forward a piece of legislation without any consultation with that community, um, I, I find challenging. Maybe the member does not think that the, the rural community do not count. Maybe the member does not think that the rural community do not matter. I happen to do, and I will defend the rural community, um, irrespective of the member's views. So, to go back to an earlier point, on the basis of the CCC, I am not getting very on, on very well with this, this speech, Mr. Speaker. Look, but could, it also, could, it, could it take this opportunity to remind you that you have confirmed that you would finish your remarks at 7.30? OK. Right. I need to get on with it and stop taking, to stop taking uh, interventions in. So, to go back to an earlier point, the basis of CCC's evidence aimed for net zero 
in the Northern Ireland by 2050. It would mean every sector doing more than they have projected in their balanced pathway projections to UK net zero. And on top of that, even a further reduction of 50 per cent of Northern Ireland's livestock will not get uh, Northern Ireland to net zero. So, to put it simply, to actually get to net zero by 2045, as proposed by the Bill, the livestock sector would have to shrink dramatically to a basically non-existent level, which is unacceptable. Northern Ireland play, plays an important food production role for the UK, with nearly 50 per cent of Northern Ireland's agri-food production being consumed in the rest of the UK. The target in the Bill today disregards and threatens that important role we play. And the CC have, have said going beyond our recommendations of at least 82 per cent target of a net zero 2045 target will most simply move agri-food productions elsewhere for no overall global benefit. And that has to be accepted tonight. No overall global benefit. The sponsor of the bill, when briefing the area committee, indicated that in terms of dairy, any reduction in what is produced in Northern Ireland for the purposes of reducing our emissions could be compensated by increasing production in Western Europe or New Zealand, simply exporting the problem. I am struggling to see how this could have a positive impact either on our dairy sector or on global emissions, given that the high quality standards that we have in Northern Ireland in terms of food production. It should be noted that 65 per cent of the farmland is best suited for growing grass for animals. We are well placed to deliver sustainable food. I ask again, why would we export production when greenhouse gas emissions from UK beef are about half the global average? I reiterate again the CCC have made it clear that one of the main risks of Northern Ireland pushing towards a more ambitious target than they have recommended, though making a substantial reduction in output from our livestock sector, is that without a corresponding reduction in consumption of such produce, that we would simply shift emissions overseas, not reduce emissions globally. Climate change is a global challenge, not just a local one, and we all need to recognise that. My role is to try and protect and enhance our environment in a sustainable way and ensure that we have a thriving agriculture sector and what say are custodians of the environment, and this should be the aim of every member of this Assembly. We should therefore not be promoting actions and passing legislation which would prevent us from fulfilling that responsibility. The CCC have also stated the risk at present, a net zero target for Northern Ireland set for 2050 or earlier, rather than contributing to extra overall reductions in UK greenhouse gas emissions, could simply shift a greater share of UK wide costs of reaching net zero to Northern Ireland. And I ask all of you who is going to pay these extra costs? What Northern Ireland will have to bear? And also, are there not better activities that we could spend this money on? while the UK still reaches the net zero target. The potential additional costs and impacts in achieving net zero emissions reduction targets by 2045 in Northern Ireland, as opposed to the at least 82 per cent by 2050 target the CCC have recommended, could therefore be extensively more significant. The economic impact on sectors would also be much more substantial than in comparison to the rest of the UK. Some may be of the opinion that as a result of the agriculture sector in Northern Ireland, we cannot achieve net zero. However, I want to dispel that rhetoric that a target of at least 82 per cent given by the committee is there just to protect agriculture. The CCC's advice is that even if agriculture methane emissions were removed from a supplementary target, the Northern Ireland 2050 target would still only be a 93 per cent reduction in emissions, while there are a range of other reasons uh, also. One of them is the numbers of people who live in rural communities who rely on either oil or coal heating, and that is something which seems to be again ignored by members uh, across the House here who uh, allegedly represent rural communities. The memorandum accompanying the private members' bill includes a reference to just transition types, principles and objectives, which sectoral plans within the bill should deliver, and this was also highlighted at committee briefing by the bill sponsor as something which would provide protection and support for sectors. On the independent expert advice, evidence and advice that I have received from CCC, it is not clear how such a net zero by 2045 target would nor indeed could deliver a just transition in Northern Ireland for sectors, including the agriculture sector and indeed the rural community. As I have stated before, advise what is his budget that has been spoken about for the just transition. Well, there is no, no budget coming from uh, the proposers of the bill, but I have indicated um, that the advice that we are receiving is that it will cost up to £2.5 billion per annum. As I have stated before, the CCC have made it clear that a 2045 net zero target would not represent a balanced pathway for Northern Ireland to reduce emissions. 
in addition to very significant reductions in our agricultural output, there could potentially be perverse outcomes if Northern Ireland attempts to go too fast in reducing emissions, such as going beyond the natural rate of stock turnover, would lead to premature scrappage of assets. This may be costly, risks undermining popular support for transition, and the CCC have said that this could cause increased embedded emissions and unfair distributional impacts, particularly if Northern Ireland targets are out of line with HCM Treasury actions to support a just transition to the UK target. The member who sponsored the bill, when briefing the area committee, indicated that the bill will compensate farmers and agri-industry. I see nothing in the bill today which would specifically and effectively deliver on this. Yet another bland and blank promise with no uh, evidence to support it. The member in question recent evidence provided to the area committee indicated that the bill does not set specific targets and sectors or dates and deadlines. It is a framework bill and there is nothing in the bill that will harm the agriculture sector, motherhood and apple pie. While the bill contains elements setting out a framework in terms of developing plans and the scrutiny of them, the inclusion of a net zero target effectively means that all sectors, including the agriculture sector, will have to aim for close to net zero emissions by 2045. This will obviously have a significant impact on all sectors, and as I have stated before, in particular the agricultural sector. So this is clearly not just a framework bill that is trying to be sold by some as uh, this is, doesn't really mean what, 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 what the, the, all of the agricultural body said means. Let, let's call it for what it is. So the suggestion that the bill will not harm the agricultural sector is plainly wrong. It's not backed up by evidence and advice from CCC. It is not a view shared by the companies and the people who work in the agricultural sector, many of whom have been writing to me and indeed yourselves, expressing concerns about the impact of the bill. The sponsor of the bill in giving evidence to the area committee indicated that she hopes that in several years' time, when the first climate action plan under the bill is being implemented, that we can start to create baselines and get the real information on the full extent of what we need to be grappling with in Northern Ireland. And this further highlights that the target in the bill is not based on any actual evidence, rather than a blind ambition. I share the desire to strive for environmental excellence and sustainability and to tackle issues of climate change head on, but targets should be ambitious, realistic, based on the most relevant high quality independent advice, which takes account of the specific factors relevant to Northern Ireland. There is also a restriction in the bill which prevents the headline 2045 zero emissions target of being amended to a date beyond 2045. This does not allow for flexibility to take on board emerging issues that Mr McAleer referred to, changing understanding of the evidence and the science, and is not consistent with climate change legislation elsewhere. The proposals in this private member's bill are in contrast to the proposals which I have made to my executive colleagues, which they are currently considering, and which result in legislation which sets an ambitious, evidence-based targets, and that is forward-thinking and providing flexibility and scope to amend this target as a result of emerging evidence and understanding new advice for new technology and other advancements. 82 per cent is a minimum. It is not a target, and it is something that is achievable, um, unlike uh, what is being put to us at the minute. Despite previous claims by the sponsors of the bill regarding consultation, there has not been the credible, credible evidence presented of a proper consultation having been un undertaken with respect to the bill. While it is permissible, it is a serious oversight. It would appear on the basis of what has been provided and communicated views were limited only to those members and supporters of the organisations responsible for developing and bringing the bill forward. And that is not a substitute for proper consultation and giving everyone, including those who will be heavily impacted, the right to comment on proposals before legislation is tabled and debated and rushed through. It is highly unacceptable. Climate change affects everyone, and everyone in Northern Ireland should have their say on what climate change legislation should look like. And it is clear to me that, despite what the bill's sponsor has indicated near the committee, there is little or no support for this bill amongst the agriculture sector. The agri-food sector is fully behind the need to address global warming and reduce emissions and is already uh, making serious advances. However, it cannot support a bill uh, for net zero by 2045 because it is not evidence-based, has not been properly consulted or assessed in terms of its impact, does not recognise the importance of our agri-food sector or the people who work in it as a net producer of high-quality foods, 
Many companies and people who work in the agriculture sector have been writing to me and other MLAs expressing their concerns about the impact of this bill, and have also written to my executive colleagues, urging them to support the bill which I have proposed, the proposals for which um, wait for approval. The sponsors and drafters of the bill have indicated that they have plans to advance their consultation activities as the bill progresses, and they hope that the consultation process for the bill can take place during the committee stage. I do not think that is acceptable or appropriate way to reduce legislation. The approach of early and, in and inclusive consultation is more likely to lead to better outcomes and greater acceptance in the community. And Mr Wells um, asked me about this, particularly amongst stakeholders who may be adversely affected by the policy. The handling of this bill before us today has not afforded everyone a fair opportunity to have the say in a timely manner. And as I said, rushed legislation is generally poor legislation. I go as far uh, as to say, con say confidently, on the basis of the information and evidence I have received, that the bill before us today does not consider real-world impacts. I would question whether the sponsor member and the co-sponsors of the bill even know or understand the real-world impacts of the bill that they have brought before us today. This is on the basis of their complete disregard of the UK's CCC's expert independent advice and advice of what is an effective, appropriate and achievable emissions reduction target for Northern Ireland. Also, I base the assertion on their lack of proper consultation, their failure to produce or attempt to produce any sort of impact assessments, regulatory, economic, rural or human rights. Put simply and in summary, the 2045 net zero target before us today uh, is not based on any evidence or analysis or feasibility. It goes against the principles of making good sound legislation. We have independent scientific advice which delivers ambitious targets, yet we disregard the evidence. And given the lack of detail and evidence in this bill, I feel it is very much style over substance, but to be fair, the bill has neither. I am supportive of climate change action. I have a bill which is waiting on executive approval. This private member's bill will have negative impacts on all Northern Ireland businesses. But as I have highlighted, agriculture is disproportionately impacted. And in contrast, my department consulted on policy options in terms of climate change legislation for Northern Ireland and has been using this in the expert advice provided um, to strike the right balance between ambition and realism. I also want to raise another concern about the bill, which is the duties and functions placed in various departments and other bodies in the bill. For example, the role envisaged in the bill for the Executive Office does not appear to fall within the current functions. It is also not clear whether adequate resources within the department undertake the range of functions uh, envisaged or whether any consultation has taken place with the Executive Office on the potential role it will have. I ask a member, um, has she or her co-sponsors, consulted and engaged to you on this? Have they <coughs> asked can these duties be fulfilled under the current structures? Indeed, are there the resources and expert expertise? Does the bill not place any duties in my department or any other Northern Ireland department to provide input to the Executive Office to enable to fill its duties? And ask the bill sponsor as to what level of engagement she has had with CCC in respect of the new functions which the bill places in them and whether they are able to be resourced to carry these out. The CCC's advice is considered as an essential element under the bill, yet the bill completely ignores the advice from CCC. Can I ask the Minister to rewind his remarks, please. Thank you. In respect to the key aspect, which is the long term greenhouse gas emissions target. So, is the spirit of this bill before us just to cherry pick what advice and evidence it suits, disregard any sound or impartial evidence that is given to it? I, I could say more, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I, I respect your, your, your call. Um, but I oppose uh, the bill as is currently proposed. Thank, thank you, Minister, for that. And I call Claire Bailey to conclude the and wind on the debate. And you will have to eight o'clock. The latest. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, firstly, I would like to thank all members for their engagement today on the climate change bill. And there have been many interesting issues that have been raised. And as the bill moves through its legislative stages in the Assembly. I hope that that engagement can continue to be constructive so as we can strengthen and enhance this bill, as many have acknowledged. I'm also more than willing to continue to work across this House to get this bill passed. The pantomime of plenary politics is of much less interest to me than getting the actual work done. But I would also like to speak to some of the common themes that arose in this debate. And I'm pleased, firstly, to see that there is general consensus on the need for sustainable decarbonisation for Northern Ireland. 
and the need for continued democratic oversight and robust independent auditing of that process. I believe that this bill provides that. And while some of the discussion naturally veered into areas of policy, I would restate that the bill is a framework bill and it will mandate action across all sectors and departments, but it is not prescriptive and does not dictate policy. All future policy will be for ministers and the executive to bring forward in their climate action plans, and that would, of course, be the perfect place for economic stability policy, for example, for our hill farmers to be produced, as one example raised by the minister. Now, when we look at the net zero target, the target of 2045 reflects a general legislative trend towards stronger climate le legislation with the proven context that we are living in an interconnected climate and ecological emergency and urgent action is needed to limit global temperature increases and prevent runaway climate change. At the UK and the international levels too, we need strong targets to allow us to keep pace with constantly moving goalposts. Northern Ireland cannot afford to be a laggard in the UK. If and when the UK decides to accelerate its targets and its ambition, just as we saw last month when Prime Minister Boris Johnson increased the UK's emissions reduction target to 78% by 2035, that's almost in line with the UUP manifesto, then we will be on the wrong path to adapt to this. The CC letter, CCC's letter to Minister Putz on the setting of net zero targets also says, and I've heard many quotes, as new evidence on climate science, behaviours or low carbon technologies particularly in low carbon farming measures emerges and or the UK's international climate commitments change, it may be prudent to tighten a 2050 target in Northern Ireland. They also say Northern Ireland's climate legislation should also allow emission reductions to go beyond our current assessment by requiring at least an 82% reduction and should contain clear provisions to tighten the target if there's evidence to support such a decision. We have already seen similar provisions used, so it's a still quoting them, this is not my words. We have already seen similar provisions used to increase climate ambition for the UK, Scotland and Wales since 2019. And in recent communications with the Minister on the economic implications of setting and delivering a 2050 emissions target for Northern Ireland, they are abundantly clear when they state business models that are not compatible with net zero futures are increasingly risky. Now, the CCC's report also acknowledges this 50% herd size reduction, which is not in our bill. This is in the CCC's um, report, but with that 50% herd reduction, they also recommend um, that this is based on evidence available, but there are other ways to reduce emissions without reducing herd sizes, and that's what we want to explore. So when we're watching the rest of the UK and our neighbours in the Republic forge ahead with net zero climate targets and hoping that we can just opt out and keep our heads down. It's not a viable strategy for Northern Ireland and it will cause us problems in the future. The EU, the Republic of Ireland and even the US will set net zero targets. Most developed countries in the world have set a net zero target. A recent court ruling in Germany saw it increase its ambition from 2050 to 2045. Wales has set a net zero target that goes beyond the CCC's recommendation 
of 95% by 2050. Is Northern Ireland really the only place that cannot do it? And if we are to set ourselves a limit and a lower bar, then who is it that we are requiring to do even more than their fair share in order for the UK to be net zero? Are we asking England to pick up our missing slack? Are we asking Scotland? Are we asking Wales? What have they said in response? Can they do it? And when the Republic worked to a net zero target and we don't, then what will be the transboundary impacts? Will there be legal implications? Now, the Committee on Climate Change is a respected committee of experts, and we look forward to working closely with them on this bill. When they gave the Minister this 82% target, it had been based on current economic models, but not as a stopping point, but as the point where it is an absolute target that we can no longer argue that we cannot achieve. And then they continue to encourage us to just go that little bit further and be that little bit more ambitious. However, there are questions about the modelling for agriculture that has been proposed. And there are concerns that they haven't explored very many pathways for low carbon farming. The CCC's six carbon budget acknowledges that greenhouse gas impacts of less intensive farming or agroecology methods are not included in their scenarios. And they state that that is due to the lack of robust evidence. And that's already been stated by Philip McGuigan earlier in this debate. So how would any credible expert predict pathways without robust evidence. There is evidence, though, to show that less intensive farming has potential to be extremely beneficial to the achievement of our target without the large-scale output cuts modelled by the CCC. So I look forward to the committee stage as an opportunity to explore these issues in more detail. And the committee has already heard from nature-friendly farmers on this matter, and they've even identified the lack of finance currently available to them for even their wider sustainability measures. So there's other issues to further explore. Certainly. We're forgiving way, but you also note uh, the concern raised by Unite and other people who represent. Uh, farmers and food produ uh, producers, the concern that the scrapping of the Agricultural Wages Board uh, places people in precarious situations already in further danger of low pay. The Minister is proposing to do that, whilst he is uh, claiming fake and full concern about people in that sector. Would you agree with that? Thank the Minister for the intervention. Indeed, I have met with the Union on that issue as well, and will continue to engage with them. But yes, um, it does cause alarm. When we look at our agriculture and the, the lobby from the, the UFU. And Mr Wales, um, just for one, was very eloquent when he outlined that the lobby, no doubt, um, that we have all had over the past few days has been um, from the, UU, or sorry, the UFU emails. And of course, we are listening to them, and we will continue to listen to them. So I do want to reiterate that there is nothing in this bill that will ha harm agriculture. Agriculture is listed, along with all other sectors, as an area that needs to see reductions in emissions. That's not this bill saying this. That's the world that we're living in. Nothing in this bill mandates any immediate changes to the sector. The way that the climate action plans are designed with a carbon budget over five years, but with no specific reduction targets given to individual sectors, 
means that those sectors who are ready to move immediately can do the heavy lifting over the first few years with a more gradual transition for other sectors. And members should note as well that support for this bill has been received from many sectors and indeed we have also been criticised by some for not being ambitious enough. So as we begin to roll out climate action plans, as we begin to learn how to measure and collect robust evidence, and as that is overseen by independent outside commissioners and offices that will be reported to this assembly for debate and scrutiny, I can't see how we'd be in the same place in five years' time, never mind 25 years' time, when we do get to 2045. This bill ensures that there will be fairness built into any measures that are introduced. Sectoral plans will have to create high value, fair work, reduce poverty and reduce inequality. So job creation strategies will also be an essential component of any climate action plans. However, we do need to look at the social and environmental sustainability of farming in Northern Ireland. Not all farmers are opposed to this bill. And it is surprising that any MLA would cite climate action as the biggest threat to farmers, when in fact departmental policies that are in place right now are seeing farm numbers falling year on year, bargaining power being given over to supermarkets, and the position of farmers in the value chain being constantly eroded. I have to wonder whether concerns are really about farming families or about agri-corporations. We need a new deal for Northern Ireland farmers one which encourages young people to take up farming and ensures a profitable and sustainable industry for them in the decades ahead, where they are actually paid for sustainable and climate-friendly practice. It is not our position that we want to see less farmers. We would like to see all sizes of farms, the small, the medium and the large, survive and thrive. It is not this bill that is a threat to farmers, but business as usual under current departmental policy that is the real threat. So it's time for a Green New Deal and to build back better for everyone. When we look at the costs associated with this bill, the immediate costs are the setting up of the Northern Ireland Climate Office, including the Climate Commissioner and staff. And this, will mainly, and this will be mainly in terms of salaries and pensions. The powers and remit of the Climate Commissioner are modelled on those of the Public Services Ombudsman, including Clause 6-8 that Mr Alistair was speaking to. And that Commissioner and that office are working pretty well in my opinion. I'm actually meeting with them very soon and looking forward to it. Certainly. I think many, many members were taken by the uh, evidence given by Mr Alistair on the pay and status of the Commissioner and the lack of accountability since they were appointed by the Assembly Commission rather than by any particular department. Is she prepared to meet those concerns halfway during the consultation stage with the Committee? Or is she wedded to the structure that she has articulated? Thank the member for his intervention. Um, and I am wedding, wedded, sorry, I would never be wedding. I am wedded, sorry, to uh, full independence for the Commissioner and for the Office. And I'm happy to continue talking and looking at other models. Um, and we have looked at the provisions uh, and how the establishment of the Public Services Ombudsman in particular was set up and we've modelled um, what's contained in this bill on that. Um, so I'm more than happy to keep talking to the member on this if he has anything more that he wants to bring forward to me. 
but we've also sought the Finance Minister's recommendation for the setting up of the Commissioner, and we're engaging with the fi Finance Minister on that issue. It is important that the funding for this comes out of the Consolidated Fund, as the Climate Commissioner is intended to be a permanent position. And we thank the Minister thus far for his engagement. More broadly, the Climate Action Plans will have financial implications, but they go beyond the immediate remit of this Bill. Achieving net zero will involve significant investment, and it's foolish to consider uh, even an 82 per cent reduction, as is preferred by the Minister, would not be a significant investment, but also significant change. And there are huge economic opportunities involved in unlocking green investment and green jobs. For example, the National Grid has said that the UK will need to recruit over 400,000 jobs to build the net zero energy workforce, and almost 14,000 of those will be here in Northern Ireland. And I want to just refer again to the CCC's letter to the Minister, where they again stress in their response that the greatest risks are associated with failing to act quickly enough. Delays to action are likely to increase global climate risk, increase uncertainty for businesses and households, lead to unnecessary costs in future, and could lead to Northern Ireland missing out on the benefits of climate investment that takes place elsewhere in the UK. We must also consider the cost of inaction. Damages avoided by climate action must be compared with the cost of meeting targets. And the cost of action has been estimated at 1 to 2 per cent of GDP. Inaction, on the other hand, could lead to a reduction in global GDP of 10 per cent by 2050 and 25 per cent by the end of the century. I want to now look at the issue of consultation that has been raised. Some members raised the issue of consultation on this bill. But of course, I hope actually members will be aware of the legislative process around private members' bills and that there is no requirement to consult at this stage. Also remind members, maybe those opposing this bill, that had the minister brought forward this legislation as he was supposed to, it would not be necessary to bring this forward as a private member's bill. But this bill has adhered to exactly the same process as all other private member bills that have been brought through this House and all other private members' bills currently waiting. And to reinforce the issue of consultation, though, what we do know from the DERA consultation, and as was brought up by Philip McGuigan again, that the majority of respondents to the DERA consultation recently were actually in favour of a net zero target by 2045. And those numbers were discounted in the department's response. And maybe that would be an advisable approach that we should all employ. Maybe all the co-sponsors of this bill should employ that approach going forward with the email campaigns and lobbying that we're getting. But I can't imagine that any one of us would agree that that would be a fair way forward. However, I look forward to committee stages as an opportunity to gather further evidence and to engage with wide-ranging stakeholders so that this bill can be strengthened as it advances. We are determined that this will be a collaborative pr process. And we have met with groups from many sectors, including energy sector, transport sector, infrastructure sector, agriculture sector, rural communities, 
and most, not all, have been broadly very supportive. And we will continue to engage. By way of reassurance, I should point out that every climate action plan will have a rural needs impact assessment carried out as provided for under the Rural Needs Act 2016. And what rural communities are telling me that they need now is clean air, for example, instead of the ammonia-laden air that they have been breathing for years. They want clean waterways and an end to the constant and repeated pollution. They want jobs, they want transport, and they want sustainable futures. And I'll give you a quote from one email from one organisation in a rural area that I received today. And when they say that climate change represents the most complex challenge of our time, that they believe that they want their children and grandchildren to have the opportunity to live their lives in vibrant, sustainable rural communities. And the responsibility is on us all now to take action. And the last line of their email today is, there is nothing to fear from being ambitious and proactively building a better future. So I'm pleased to see a majority consensus in this chamber with the principles of this bill and also for the need for urgent climate action. The IPCC says that global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 52 if we continue to emit greenhouse gases at the current rate. We will reach the, the point of catastrophic change by 2070. The multi-organisation report, United in Science, stresses that current emission trends are not compatible with limiting temperature increases to 1.5 degrees, or certainly not well below 2 degrees. The last decade of political failure and inaction on climate change has cost us dearly, shrinking the window for action by two-thirds. The 10 years are key. Wherever you stand on targets or approaches, one thing is undeniable. We must start now. And speaker, I want to thank the co-sponsors of this bill. I'm very well aware that co-sponsors are not recognized in assembly processes, but the fact that they are here and they are signed up shows that efforts have been made to do things differently with this bill. So if I may, I want to thank Philip McGuigan, I want to thank Mark Durkin, I want to thank Steve Aiken, I want to thank John Blair, I want to thank Jerry Carroll, I want to thank Claire Sugden, and I want to thank Trevor Lunn. I want to thank you all for stepping up, for being brave, and for the support so far. And I also know that Jim Wells has been engaging with the Climate Coalition, and I thank you also, Mr. Wells, for that. I hope that we can vote the second stage of the Climate Change Bill for Northern Ireland 2021 through. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. And the question is, that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't we know? No. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. Can I remind members just to be mindful of your uh, social distancing obligations while pursuing this vote?
Order members. Order members. Resume your seats, please. Thank you. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Country no. no. Do we have tellers? And again, our men and members, please uh, be careful around the social distancing obligations we all have to adhere to. Okay, members. Order, members. Order. Thank you. Order, members. Tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Rachel Woods and Jerry Carroll. Tellers for the nose are Paul Given and Harry Harvey. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors, please.
Okay. Uh, the clerk, please read the result. 87 members voted, 58 members voted aye, 29 members voted no. The motion is carried. Second stage is agreed. Uh, that concludes the second stage of a climate change bill. Bill sounds referred to the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Thank you. And item five on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the adjour Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary.